chapter one of the negro this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the negro by w e b du bois africa the sphinx is africa the bond of silence is upon her old and white with tombs and rent and shorn with raiment wet with tears and torn and trampled on yet all untamed miller africa is at once the most romantic and the most tragic of continents its very names reveal its mystery and wide-reaching influence it is the ethiopia of the greek the kush and punt of the egyptian and the arabian land of the blacks to modern europe it is the dark continent and land of contrasts in literature it is the seat of the sphinx and the lotus-eaters the home of the dwarfs gnomes and pixies and the refuge of the gods in commerce it is the slave mart and the source of ivory ebony rubber gold and diamonds what other continent can rival in interest this ancient of days there are those nevertheless who would write universal history and leave out africa but how asks ratzel can one leave out the land of egypt and carthage and frobenius declares that in future africa must more and more be regarded as an integral part of the great movement of world history yet it is true that the history of africa is unusual and its strangeness is due in no small degree to the physical peculiarities of the continent with three times the area of europe it has a coast line a fifth shorter like europe it is a peninsula of asia curving southwestward around the indian sea it has few gulfs bays capes or islands even the rivers though large and long are not means of communication with the outer world because from the central high plateau they plunge in rapids and cataracts to the narrow coastlands and the sea the general physical contour of africa has been likened to an inverted plate with one or more rows of mountains at the edge and a low coastal belt in the south the central plateau is three thousand or more feet above the sea while in the north it is a little over one thousand feet thus two main divisions of the continent are easily distinguished the broad northern rectangle reaching down as far as the gulf of guinea and cape guardafui with seven million square miles and the peninsula which tapers toward the south with five million square miles four great rivers and many lesser streams water the continent the greatest is the congo in the centre with its vast curving and endless estuaries then the nile draining the cluster of the great lakes and flowing northward like some grave mighty thought threading a dream the niger in the northwest watering the sudan below the sahara and finally the zambezi with its greater niagara in the southeast even these waters leave room for deserts both south and north but the greater ones are the three million square miles of sand wastes in the north more than any other land africa lies in the tropics with a warm dry climate save in the central congo region where rain at all seasons brings tropical luxuriance the flora is rich but now white in variety including the gum acacia ebony several dye woods the kola nut and probably tobacco and millet to these many plants have been added in historic times the fauna is rich in mammals and here too many from other continents have been widely introduced and used primarily africa is the land of the blacks the world has always been familiar with black men who represent one of the most ancient of human stocks of the ancient world gathered about the mediterranean they formed a part and were viewed with no surprise or dislike because this world saw them come and go and play their part with other men was clitus the brother-in-law of alexander the great less to be honoured because he happened to be black was terence less famous the medieval european world developing under the favourable physical conditions of the north temperate zone knew the black man chiefly as a legend or occasional curiosity but still as a fellow-man 
an othello or a prester john or an antar the modern world in contrast knows the negro chiefly as a bond slave in the west indies and america add to this the fact that the darker races in other parts of the world had in the last four centuries lagged behind the flying and even feverish footsteps of europe and we face to-day a widespread assumption throughout the dominant world that colour is a mark of inferiority the result is that in writing of this one of the most ancient persistent and widespread stocks of mankind one faces astounding prejudice that which may be assumed as true of white men must be proven beyond peradventure if it relates to negroes one who writes of the development of the negro race must continually insist that he is writing of a normal human stock and that whatever it is fair to predicate of the mass of human beings may be predicated of the negro it is the silent refusal to do this which has led to so much false writing on africa and of its inhabitants take for instance the answer to the apparently simple question what is a negro we find the most extraordinary confusion of thought and difference of opinion there is a certain type in the minds of most people which as david livingston said can be found only in caricature and not in real life when scientists have tried to find an extreme type of black ugly and woolly-haired negro they have been compelled more and more to limit his home even in africa at least nine-tenths of the african people do not at all conform to this type and the typical negro after being denied a dwelling-place in the soudan along the nile in east central africa and in south africa was finally given a very small country between the senegal and the niger and even there was found to give trace of many stocks as winwood reed says the typical negro is a rare variety even among negroes as a matter of fact we cannot take such extreme and largely fanciful stock as typifying that which we may fairly call the negro race in the case of no other race is so narrow a definition attempted a white man may be of any color size or facial conformation and have endless variety of cranial measurement and physical characteristics a yellow man is perhaps an even vaguer conception in fact it is generally recognized to-day that no scientific definition of race is possible differences and striking differences there are between men and groups of men but they fade into each other so insensibly that we can only indicate the main divisions of men in broad outlines as von luchon says the question of the number of human races has quite lost its raison d'etre as it has become a subject rather of philosophic speculation than of scientific research it is of no more importance now to know how many human races there are than to know how many angels can dance on the point of a needle our aim is now to find out how ancient and primitive races developed from others and how races changed or evolved through migration and interbreeding the mulatto using the term loosely to indicate either an intermediate type between white and black or a mingling of the two is as typically african as the black man and cannot logically be included in the white race especially when american usage includes the mulatto in the negro race it is reasonable according to fact and historic usage to include under the word negro the darker peoples of africa characterized by brown skin curled or frizzled hair full and sometimes averted lips a tendency to a development of the maxillary parts of the face and a dolicocephalic head this type is not fixed or definite the colour varies widely it is never black or bluish as some say and it becomes often light brown or yellow the hair varies from curly to a wool-like mass and the facial angle and the cranial form show wide variation it is as impossible in africa as elsewhere to fix with any certainty the limits of racial variation due to climate and the variation due to intermingling in the past when scientists assumed one unvarying negro type every variation from that type was interpreted as meaning mixture of blood to-day we recognize a broader normal african type which as palgrave says may best be studied among the statues of the egyptian rooms of the british museum the larger gentle eye the full but not over protruding lips the rounder contour and the good-natured easy sensuous expression this is a genuine african model to this race africa in the main and parts of asia have belonged since prehistoric times 
the colour of this variety of men as the colour of other varieties is due to climate conditions of heat cold and moisture working for thousands of years through the skin and other organs have given men their differences of colour this colour pigment is a protection against sunlight and consequently varies with the intensity of the sunlight thus in africa we find the blackest men in the fierce sunlight of the desert red pygmies in the forest and yellow bushmen on the cooler southern plateau next to the colour the hair is the most distinguishing characteristic of the negro but the two characteristics do not vary with each other some of the blackest of the negroes have curly rather than woolly hair while the crispest most closely curled hair is found among the yellow hottentots and bushmen the difference between the hair of the lighter and darker races is a difference of degree not of kind and can be easily measured if the hair follicles of a chinaman a european and a negro are cut across transversely it will be found that the diameter of the first is one hundred by seventy seven to eighty five the second one hundred by sixty two to seventy two while that of the negro is one hundred by forty to sixty this elliptical form of the negro's hair causes it to curl more and less tightly there have been repeated efforts to discover by measurements of various kinds further and more decisive differences which would serve as really scientific determinants of race gradually these efforts have been given up to-day we realize that there are no hard and fast racial types among men race is a dynamic and not a static conception and the typical races are continually changing and developing amalgamating and differentiating in this little book then we are studying the history of the darker part of the human family which is separated from the rest of mankind by no absolute physical line but which nevertheless forms as a mass a social group distinct in history appearance and to some extent in spiritual gift we cannot study africa without however noting some of the other races concerned in its history particularly the asiatic semites the intercourse of africa with arabia and other parts of asia has been so close and long continued that it is impossible to-day to disentangle the blood relationships negro blood certainly appears in strong strain among the semites and the obvious mulatto groups in africa arising from ancient and modern mingling of semite and negro has given rise to the term hamite under cover of which millions of negroids have been characteristically transferred to the white race by some eager scientists the earliest semites came to africa across the red sea the phoenicians came along the northern coasts a thousand years before christ and began settlements which culminated in carthage and extended down the atlantic shores of north africa nearly to the gulf of guinea from the earliest times the greeks have been in contact with africa as visitors traders and colonists and the persian influence came with cambyses and others roman africa was bounded by the desert but at times came into contact with the blacks across the sahara and in the valley of the nile after the breaking up of the roman empire the greek and latin christians filtered through africa followed finally by a germanic invasion in four twenty nine a d in the seventh century the all mother asia claimed africa again for her own and blew a cloud of semitic mohammedanism all across north africa veiling the dark continent from europe for a thousand years and converting vast masses of the blacks to islam the portuguese began to raise the veil in the fifteenth century sailing down the atlantic coast and initiating the modern slave trade the spanish french dutch and english followed them but as traders in men rather than explorers the portuguese explored the coasts of the gulf of guinea visiting the interior kingdoms and then passing by the mouth of the congo proceeded southward eventually they rounded the cape of good hope and pursued their explorations as far as the mountains of abyssinia this began the modern exploration of africa which is a curious fairy tale and recalls to us the great names of livingstone burton speak stanley barth Sveinfurth, and many others in this way africa has been made known to the modern world the difficulty of this modern lifting of the veil of centuries emphasizes two physical facts that underlie all african history the peculiar inaccessibility of the continent to peoples from without which made it so easily possible for the great human drama played here to hide itself from the ears of other worlds and on the other hand the absence of interior barriers the great stretch of that central plateau which placed practically every budding centre of culture at the mercy of barbarism sweeping a thousand miles with no alps or himalayas or appalachians to hinder with this peculiarly 
an inviting coastline and the difficulties in interior segregation must be considered the climate of africa while there is much diversity in many salubrious tracts along with vast barren wastes yet as sir harry johnston well remarks africa is the chief stronghold of the real devil the reactionary forces of nature hostile to the uprise of humanity here beelzebub king of the flies marshals his vermiform and anthropod hosts insects ticks and nematode worms which more than in other continents excepting negro asia convey to the skin veins intestines and spinal marrow of men and other vertebrates the microorganisms which cause deadly disfiguring or debilitating diseases or themselves create the morbid condition of the persecuted human being beast bird or reptile frog or fish the inhabitants of this land have a sheer fight for physical survival comparable with that in no other great continent and this must not be forgotten when we consider their history End of chapter one Chapter Two of The Negro by W. E. B. Du Bois. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Coming of Black Men. The movements of prehistoric man can be seen as yet but dimly in the uncertain mists of time. This is the story that today seems most probable. From some center in southern Asia, primitive human beings began to differentiate in two directions toward the south appeared the primitive negro long-headed and with flattened hair follicle he spread along southern asia and passed over into africa where he survives to-day as the reddish dwarfs of the centre and the bushmen of south africa northward and eastward primitive man became broader headed and straight haired and spread over eastern asia forming the mongolian type either through the intermingling of these two types or as some prefer to think by the direct prolongation of the original primitive man a third intermediate type of human being appeared with hair and cranial measurement intermediate between the primitive negro and mongolian all these three types of men intermingled their blood freely and developed variations according to climate and environment other and older theories and legends of the origin and spread of mankind are of interest now only because so many human beings have believed them in the past the biblical story of shem ham and japheth retains the interest of a primitive myth with its measure of allegorical truth but has of course no historic basis the older aryan theory assumed the migration into europe of one dominant asiatic race of civilized conquerors to whose blood and influence all modern culture was due to this white race semitic asia a large part of black africa and all europe was supposed to belong this aryan theory has been practically abandoned in the light of recent research and it seems probable now that from the primitive negroid stock evolved in asia the semites either by local variation or intermingling with other stocks later there developed the mediterranean race with negroid characteristics in the modern negroes the blue-eyed light-haired germanic people may have arisen as a modern variation of the mixed peoples produced by the mingling of asiatic and african elements the last word on this development has not yet been said and there is still much to learn and explain but it is certainly proved to-day beyond doubt that the so-called hamites of africa the brown and black curly and frizzly haired inhabitants of north and eastern africa are not white men if we draw the line between white and black in any logical way the primitive negroid race of men developed in asia wandered eastward as well as westward they entered on the one hand burma and the south sea islands and on the other hand they came through mesopotamia and gave curly hair and a negroid type of jew syrian and assyrian ancient statues of indian divinities show the negro type with black face and close curled hair and early babylonian culture was negroid in arabia the negroes may have divided and one stream perhaps wandered into europe by way of syria traces of these negroes are manifest not only in skeletons but in the brunette type of all south europe 
the other branch proceeded to egypt and tropical africa another but perhaps less probable theory is that ancient negroes may have entered africa from europe since the most ancient skulls of algeria are negroid the primitive african was not an extreme type one may judge from modern pygmy and bushmen that his colour was reddish or yellow and his skull was sometimes round like the mongolian he entered africa not less than fifty thousand years ago and settled eventually in the broad region between lake chad and the great lakes and remained there long stretches of years after a lapse of perhaps thirty thousand years there entered africa further migration of asiatic people negroid in many characteristics but lighter and straighter haired than the primitive negroes from this mediterranean race was developed the modern inhabitants of the shores of the mediterranean in europe asia and africa and by mingling with the primitive negroes the ancient egyptians and modern negroid races of africa as we near historic times the migrations of men became more frequent from asia and from europe and in africa came movements and minglings which give to the whole of africa a distinct mulatto character the primitive negro stock was mulatto in the sense of being not widely differentiated from the dark original australoid stock as the earlier yellow negro developed in the african tropics to the bigger blacker type he was continually mingling his blood with similar types developed in temperate climes to sallower colour and straighter hair we find therefore in africa to-day every degree of development in negroid stocks and every degree of intermingling of these developments both among african peoples and between africans europeans and asiatics the mistake is continually made of considering these types as transitions between absolute caucasians and absolute negroes no such absolute type ever existed on either side both were slowly differentiated from a common ancestry and continually remingled their blood while the differentiating was progressing from prehistoric times down to to-day africa is in this sense primarily the land of the mulatto so too was earlier europe and asia only in these countries the mulatto was early bleached by the climate while in africa he was darkened it is not easy to summarize the history of these dark african peoples because so little is known and so much is still in dispute yet by avoiding the real controversies and being unafraid of mere questions of definition we may trace a great human movement with considerable definiteness three main negro types early made their appearance the lighter and smaller primitive stock the larger forest negro in the centre and on the west coast and the tall black nilotic negro in the eastern sudan in the earliest times we find the negroes in the valley of the nile pressing downward from the interior here they mingled with semitic types and after a lapse of millenniums there arose from this mingling the culture of ethiopia and egypt probably the first of higher human cultures to the west of the nile the negroes expanded straight across the continent to the atlantic centres of higher culture appeared very early along the gulf of guinea and curling backward met egyptian ethiopian and even european and asiatic influences about lake chad to the southeast near the primitive seats of the earliest african immigrants and open to egyptian and east indian influences the negro culture which culminated at zimbabwe arose and one may trace throughout south africa its wide ramifications all these movements gradually aroused the central tribes to unrest they beat against the barriers north northeast and west but gradually settled into a great south eastward migration calling themselves proudly la bantu the people they grew by agglomeration into a warlike nation speaking one language they eventually conquered all africa south of the gulf of guinea and spread their influence to the northward while these great movements were slowly transforming africa she was also receiving influences from beyond her shores and sending influences out with mulatto egypt black africa was always in closest touch so much so that to some all evidence of negro uplift seemed egyptian in origin the truth is rather that egypt was herself always palpably negroid and from her vantage ground as almost the only african gateway received and transmitted negro ideals 
venetian greek and roman came into touch more or less with black africa carthage that north african city of a million men had a large caravan trade with negro land in ivory metals cloth precious stones and slaves black men served in the carthaginian armies and marched with hannibal on rome in some of the north african kingdoms the infiltration of negro blood was very large and kings like massa nissa and Jugurtha were negroid by way of the atlantic the carthaginians reached the african west coast greek and roman influences came through the desert and the byzantine empire and persia came into communication with negro land by way of the valley of the nile the influence of these trade routes added to those of egypt ethiopia benin and yoruba stimulated centers of culture in the central and western sudan and european and african trade early reached large volume negro soldiers were used largely in the armies that enabled the mohammedans to conquer north africa and spain beginning in the tenth century and slowly creeping across the desert into negro land the new religion found an already existent culture and came not a conqueror but as an adapter and inspirer civilization received new impetus and a wave of mohammedanism swept eastward erecting the great kingdoms of meli the song he bornu and the house estates the older negro culture was not overthrown but like a great wedge pushed upward and inward from yoruba and gave stubborn battle to the newer culture for seven or eight centuries then it was in the fifteenth century that the heart disease of africa developed in its most virulent form there is a modern theory that black men are and always have been naturally slaves nothing is further from the truth in the ancient world africa was no more a slave hunting ground than europe or asia and both greece and rome had much larger numbers of white slaves than of black it was natural that a stream of black slaves should have poured into egypt because the chief line of egyptian conquest and defence lay toward the heart of africa moreover the egyptians themselves of negro descent had not only negro slaves but negroes among their highest nobility and even among their pharaohs mohammedan conquerors enslaved peoples of all colors in europe asia and africa but eventually their empire centered in asia and africa and their slaves came principally from these countries asia submitted to islam except in the far east which was self-protecting negro africa submitted only partially and the remaining heathen were in small states which could not effectively protect themselves against the mohammedan slave trade in this wise the slave trade gradually began to center in africa for religious and political rather than for racial reasons the typical african culture was the culture of family town and small tribe hence domestic slavery easily developed a slave trade through war and commerce only the integrating force of state building could have stopped this slave trade was this failure to develop the great state a racial characteristic this does not seem a fair conclusion in four great centres state building began in africa in ethiopia several large states were built up but they tottered before the onslaughts of egypt persia rome and byzantium on the one hand and finally fell before the turbulent bantu warriors from the interior the second attempt at empire building began in the southeast but the same bantu hordes pressing now slowly now fiercely from the congested centre of the continent gradually overthrew this state and erected on its ruins a series of smaller and more transient kingdoms the third attempt at state building arose on the guinea coast in benin and yoruba it never got much beyond a federation of large industrial cities its expansion toward the congo valley was probably a prime cause of the original bantu movements to the southeast toward the north and northeast on the other hand these city-states met the sudanese armed with the new imperial mohammedan idea just as latin rome gave the imperial idea to the nordic races so islam brought this idea to the sudan in the consequent attempts at imperialism in the western sudan there arose the largest of the african empires two circumstances however militated against this empire building first the fierce resistance of the heathen south made war continuous and slaves one of the articles of systematic commerce secondly the highways of legitimate african commerce had for millenniums lain to the north these were suddenly closed by the moors in the sixteenth century and the negro empires were thrown into the turmoil of internal war it was then that the european slave traders came from the southwest 
they found partially disrupted negro states on the west coast and falling empires in the soudan together with the old unrest of overpopulation and migration in the valley of the congo they not only offered a demand for the usual slave trade but they increased it to an enormous degree until their demand added to the demand of the mohammedan in africa and asia made human beings the highest priced article of commerce in africa under such circumstances there could be but one end the virtual uprooting of ancient african culture leaving only misty reminders of the ruin in the customs and work of the people to complete this disaster came the partition of the continent among european nations and the modern attempt to exploit the country and the natives for the economic benefit of the white world together with the transplanting of black nations to the new western world and their rise in self-assertion there End of chapter 2chapter three of the negro by w e b du bois this librivox recording is in the public domain ethiopia and egypt having viewed now the land and movements of african people in main outline let us scan more narrowly the history of five main centres of activity and culture namely the valleys of the nile and of the congo the borders of the great gulf of guinea the soudan and south africa these divisions do not cover all of negro africa but they take in the main areas and the main lines in development first we turn to the valley of the nile perhaps the most ancient of known seats of civilization in the world and certainly the oldest in africa with a culture reaching back six or eight thousand years like all civilizations it drew largely from without and undoubtedly arose in the valley of the nile because that valley was so easily made a centre for the meeting of men of all types and from all parts of the world at the same time egyptian civilization seems to have been african in its beginnings and in its main line of development despite strong influences from all parts of asia of what race then were the egyptians they certainly were not white in any sense of the modern use of that word neither in color nor physical measurement in hair nor countenance in language nor social customs they stood in relationship nearest the negro race in earliest times and then gradually through the infiltration of mediterranean and semitic elements became what would be described in america as a light mulatto stock of octoroons or quadroons this stock was buried continually now by new infiltration of negro blood from the south now by negroid and semitic blood from the east now by berber types from the north and west egyptian monuments show distinctly negro and mulatto faces herodotus in an incontrovertible passage alludes to the egyptians as black and curly-haired a peculiarly significant statement from one used to the brunette mediterranean type in another passage concerning the fable of the dodonian oracle he again alludes to the swarthy color of the egyptians as exceedingly dark and even black aeschylus mentioning a boat seen from the shore declares that its crew are egyptians because of their black complexions modern measurements with all their admitted limitations show that in the Thebaid, from one-seventh to one-third of the egyptian population were negroes and that of the pre-dynastic egyptians less than half could be classed as non-negroed judging from measurements in the tombs of nobles as late as the eighteenth dynasty negroes form at least one-sixth of the higher class such measurements are by no means conclusive but they are apt to be under rather than over statements of the prevalence of negro blood head measurements of negro americans would probably place most of them in the category of whites the evidence of language also connects egypt with africa and the negro race rather than with asia well religious ceremonies and social customs all go to strengthen this evidence the ethnic history of northeast africa would seem therefore to have been this pre-dynastic egypt was settled by negroes from ethiopia they were a very type the broad-nosed woolly-haired type to which the word negro is sometimes confined 
the black curly-haired sharper featured type which must be considered an equally negroid variation these negroes met and mingled with the invading mediterranean race from north africa and asia thus the blood of the sallower race spread south and that of the darker race north black priests appear in crete three thousand years before christ and arabia is to this day thoroughly permeated with negro blood perhaps as chamberlain says one of the prime reasons why no civilization of the type of that of the nile arose in other parts of the continent if such a thing were at all possible was that egypt acted as a sort of channel by which the genius of negro land was drafted off into the service of mediterranean and asiatic culture to one familiar with the striking and beautiful types arising from the mingling of negro with latin and germanic types in america the puzzle of the egyptian type is easily solved it was unlike any of its neighbors and a unique type until one views the modern mulatto then the faces of rehotep and nefert of kafra and amenahat the first of amas and nefertari and even of the great rameses the second become curiously familiar the history of egypt is a science in itself before the reign of the first recorded king five thousand years or more before christ there had already existed in egypt a culture and art arising by long evolution from the days of paleolithic man among a distinctly negroid people about four thousand seven hundred and seventy seven b c ahamena began the first of three successive egyptian empires this lasted two thousand years with many pharaohs like kafra of the fourth dynasty of a strongly negroid cast of countenance at the end of the period the empire fell apart into egyptian and ethiopian halves and a silence of three centuries ensued it is quite possible that an incursion of conquering black men from the south poured over the land in these years and dotted egypt in the next centuries with monuments on which the full-blooded negro type is strongly and triumphantly impressed the great sphinx at giza so familiar to all the world the sphinxes of tanis the statue from the fayum the statue of the esquiline at rome and the colossi of bubastis all represent black full-blooded negroes and are described by petrie as having high cheekbones flat cheeks both in one plane a massive nose firm projecting lips and thick hair with an austere and almost savage expression of power blyden the great modern black leader of west africa said of the sphinx at giza her features are decidedly of the african or negro type with expanded nostrils if then the sphinx was placed here looking out in majestic and mysterious silence over the empty plain where once stood the great city of memphis in all its pride and glory as an emblematic representation of the king is not the inference clear as to the peculiar type or race to which that king belonged the middle empire arose three thousand sixty four b c and lasted nearly twenty four centuries under pharaohs whose negro descent is plainly evident like amenahat the first and third and usur tisen the first the ancient glories of egypt were restored and surpassed at the same time there is strong continuous pressure from the wild and unruly negro tribes of the upper nile valley and we get some idea of the fear which they inspired throughout egypt when we read of the great national rejoicing which followed the triumph of usur to send the third around two thousand six hundred and sixty to twenty two over these hordes he drove them back and attempted to confine them to the edge of the nubian desert above the second cataract hemmed in here they set up a state about this time and founded nepata notwithstanding this repulse of black men less than one hundred years later a full-blooded negro from the south ra nahesi was seated on the throne of the pharaohs and was called the king's eldest son this may mean that an incursion from the far south had placed a black conqueror on the throne at any rate the whole empire was in some way shaken and two hundred years later the invasion of the hyksos began the domination of hyksos kings who may have been negroids from asia lasted for five hundred years the redemption of egypt from these barbarians came from upper egypt led by the mulatto amas he founded in seventeen o three b c the new empire which lasted fifteen hundred years his queen nefertari the most venerated figure of egyptian history was a negress of great beauty strong personality and of unusual administrative force 
she was for many years joint ruler with her son amenhotep i who succeeded his father the new empire was a period of foreign conquest and internal splendor and finally of religious dispute and overthrow syria was conquered in these reigns and asiatic civilization and influences poured in upon egypt the great tahmes the third whose reign was one of the grandest and most eventful in egyptian history had a strong negro countenance as had also queen hatshepsut who sent the celebrated expedition to reopen ancient trade with the hottentots of punt a new strain of negro blood came to the royal line through queen meta mua about fourteen twenty b c whose son amenhotep the third built a great temple at luxor and the colossi at memnon the whole of the period in a sense culminated in the great ramsu the second the oppressor of the hebrews who with his egyptian libyan and negro armies fought half the world his reign however was the beginning of decline and foes began to press egypt from the white north and the black south the priests transferred their power at thebes while the assyrians under nimrod overran lower egypt the centre of interest is now transferred to ethiopia and we pass to the more shadowy history of that land the most perfect example of egyptian poetry left to us is a celebration of the prowess of usertesen the third in confining the turbulent negro tribes to the territory below the second cataract of the nile the egyptians called this territory cush and the farthest confines of cush lay punt the cradle of their race to the ancient mediterranean world ethiopia that is the land of the black-faced was a region of gods and fairies Zeus and poseidon feasted each year among the blameless ethiopians and black memnon king of ethiopia was one of the greatest of heroes the ethiopians conceived themselves says theodorus siculus to be of greater antiquity than any other nation and it is probable that born under the sun's path its warmth may have ripened them earlier than other men they supposed themselves also to be the inventors of divine worship of festivals of solemn assemblies of sacrifices and every religious practice they affirm that the egyptians are one of their colonies the egyptians themselves in later days affirmed that they and their civilization came from the south and from the black tribes of punt and certainly at the earliest period in which human remains have been recovered egypt and lower nubia appear to have formed culturally and racially one land the forging ahead of egypt in culture was mainly from economic causes ethiopia living in a much poorer land with limited agricultural facilities held to the old arts and customs and at the same time lost the best elements of its population to egypt absorbing meantime the oncoming and wilder negro tribes from the south and west under the old empire therefore ethiopia remained in comparative poverty except as some of its tribes invaded egypt with their handicrafts as soon as the civilization below the second cataract reached a height noticeably above that of ethiopia there was continued effort to protect that civilization against the incursion of barbarians hundreds of campaigns through thousands of years repeatedly subdued or checked the blacks and brought them in as captives to mingle their blood with the egyptian nation but the egyptian frontier was not advanced a separate and independent ethiopian culture finally began to arise during the middle empire of egypt and centred at napata and mero widespread trade in gold ivory precious stones skins wood and works of handicraft arose the negro began to figure as the great trader of egypt this new wealth of ethiopia excited the cupidity of the pharaohs and led to aggression and larger intercourse until at last when the dread hyksos appeared ethiopia became both a physical and cultural refuge for conquered egypt the legitimate pharaohs moved to thebes nearer the boundaries of ethiopia and from here under negroid rulers lower egypt was redeemed the ensuing new empire witnessed the gradual incorporation of ethiopia into egypt although the darker kingdom continued to resist both mulatto pharaohs amens and amenhotep the first sent expeditions into ethiopia and in the latter days sons of the reigning pharaoh began to assume the title of royal son of cush in some such way as the son of the king of england becomes the prince of wales 
trade relations were renewed with punt under circumstances which lead us to place that land in the region of the african lakes the sudanese tribes were aroused by these and other incursions until the revolts became formidable in the fourteenth century before christ egyptian culture however gradually conquered ethiopia where armies could not and egyptian religion and civil rule began to centre in the darker kingdom when therefore Shesing, the first the libyan or usurped the throne of the pharaohs in the tenth century b c the egyptian legitimate dynasty went to napata as king priests and established a theocratic monarchy gathering strength the ethiopian kingdom under this dynasty expanded north about seven fifty b c and for a century ruled all egypt the first king panki was egyptian bred and not noticeably negroid but his successors showed more and more evidence of negro blood kashta the kushite shabaka tarharka and tanutaman during the century of ethiopian rule a royal son was appointed to rule egypt just as formerly a royal egyptian had ruled cush in many ways this ethiopian kingdom showed its negro peculiarities first in its worship of distinctly sudanese gods secondly in the rigid custom of female succession in the kingdom and thirdly by the election of kings from the various royal claimants to the throne it was the heyday of the negro for the greater part of the century egypt itself was subject to the blacks just as in the new empire the sudan had been subject to egypt egypt now began to fall into the hands of asia and was conquered first by the assyrians and then by the persians but the ethiopian kings kept their independence aspaluta whose mother and sister are represented as full-blooded negroes ruled from six thirty to six hundred b c who five sixty to five twenty five b c made nine expeditions against the warlike tribes south of mero and his successor nasto senen five twenty five to five hundred b c was the one who repelled cambyses he also removed the capital from napata to mero although napata continued to be the religious capital and the ethiopian kings were still crowned on its golden throne from the fifth to the second century b c we find the wild sudanese tribes pressing in from the west and greek culture penetrating from the east king arg amen erga menes showed strong greek influences and at the same time began to employ the ethiopian speech and writing and used a new ethiopian alphabet while the ethiopian kings were still crowned at napata mero gradually became the real capital and supported at one time four thousand artisans and two hundred thousand soldiers it was here that the famous candaces reigned as queens pliny tells us that one candace of the time of nero had had forty-four predecessors on the throne while another candace figures in the new testament it was probably this latter candace who warred against rome at the time of augustus and received unusual consideration from her considerable foe the prestige of ethiopia at this time was considerable throughout the world pseudo calisthenes tells an evidently fabulous story of the visit of alexander the great to candace queen of Moro, which nevertheless illustrates her fame candace will not let him enter ethiopia and says he is not to scorn her people because they are black for they are whiter in soul than his white folk she sent him gold maidens parrots sphinxes and a crown of emeralds and pearls she ruled eighty tribes who were ready to punish those who attacked her the romans continued to have so much trouble with their ethiopian frontier that finally when semitic mulattoes appeared in the east the emperor diocletian invited the wild sudanese tribe of nubians nobody from the west to repel them these nubians eventually embraced christianity and northern ethiopia came to be known in time as nubia the semitic mulattoes from the east came from the highlands bordering the red sea in asia on both sides of this sea negro blood is strongly in evidence predominant in africa and influential in asia dodolphus writing in the seventeenth century says that the abyssinians are generally black which color they most admire trade and war united the two shores and merchants have passed to and fro for thirty centuries in this way arabian jewish egyptian greek and roman influences spread slowly upon the negro foundation early legendary history declares that a queen makeda or nicola of sheba 
a state of central abyssinia visited solomon in ten fifty b c and had her son menelik educated in jerusalem this was the supposed beginning of the Aksumite kingdom the capital of which Aksum, was a flourishing centre of trade ptolemy evergetes and his successors did much to open Ab abyssinia to the world but most of the population of that day was nomadic in the fourth century byzantine influences began to be felt and in three thirty saint athanasius of alexandria consecrated fromentius as bishop of ethiopia he tutored the heir to the abyssinian kingdom and began its gradual christianization by the early part of the sixth century abyssinia was trading with india and, and byzantium and was so far recognized as a christian country that the emperor justinian appealed to king caleb to protect the christians in southwestern arabia caleb conquered yemen in 525 and held it fifty years eventually a jewish princess judith usurped the Aksumite throne the abyssinians were expelled from arabia and a long period begins when as gibbon says encompassed by the enemies of their religion the ethiopians slept for nearly a thousand years forgetful of the world by whom they were forgotten throughout the middle ages however the legend of a great christian kingdom hidden away in africa persisted and the search for prester john became one of the world's quests it was the expanding power of abyssinia that led rome to call in the nubians from the western desert the nubians had formed a strong league of tribes and as the ancient kingdom of ethiopia declined they drove back the abyssinians who had already established themselves at Moreau. in the sixth century the nubians were converted to christianity by a byzantine priest and they immediately began to develop a new capital dongola replaced napata and Moreau, and by the twelfth century churches and brick dwellings had appeared as the mohammedan flood pressed up the nile valley it was the nubians that held it back for two centuries farther south other wild tribes pushed out of the soudan and began a similar development chief among these were the fung who fixed their capital at senar at the junction of the white and blue nile when the mohammedan flood finally passed over nubia the fung diverted it by declaring themselves muslims this left the fung as the dominant power in the fifteenth century from the three cataracts to fazogli and from the red sea at suakan to the white nile islam then swept on south in a great circle skirted the great lakes and then curled back to somaliland completely isolating abyssinia between the thirteenth and sixteenth centuries the egyptian soudan became a congeries of mohammedan kingdoms with arab mulatto and negro kings far to the west near lake chad arose in fifteen twenty the sultanate of bag Hermi, which reached its highest power in the seventh century this dynasty was overthrown by the negro mabas who established wadai to the eastward about sixteen forty south of wadai lay the heathen and cannibals of the congo valley against which islam never prevailed east of wadai and nearer the nile lay the kindred state of darfur a nubian nation whose sultans reigned over two hundred years and which reached great prosperity in the early seventeenth century under solomon solon before the mohammedan power reached abyssinia the portuguese pioneers had entered the country from the east and begun to open the country again to european knowledge without doubt in the centuries of silence a civilization of some height had flourished in abyssinia but all authentic records were destroyed by fire in the tenth century when the portuguese came the older Aksumite kingdom had fallen and had been succeeded by a number of petty states the sudanese kingdoms of the soudan resisted the power of the mameluke bays in egypt and later the power of the turks until the nineteenth century when the soudan was made nominally a part of egypt continuous upheaval war and conquest had by this time done their work and little of ancient ethiopia and culture survived except the slave trade the entrance of england into egypt after the building of the suez canal stirred up eventually revolt in the soudan for political economic and religious reasons led by a soudanese negro mohammed ahmed who claimed to be the messiah mahdi the soudan arose in revolt in eighteen eighty one determined to resist a hated religion foreign rule and interference with their chief commerce the trade in slaves the soudan was soon aflame and the able mulatto general osman digna aided by revolt among the heathen dinka drove egypt and england out of the soudan for sixteen years it was not until eighteen ninety eight that england re-entered the soudan and in petty revenge desecrated the bones of the brave even if misguided prophet meantime this 
modest revolt had delayed england's designs on abyssinia uh, and the italians replacing her attempted a protectorate menelik of shoah one of the smaller kingdoms of abyssinia was a shrewd man of predominantly negro blood and had been induced to make a treaty with the italians after king john had been killed by the modest the exact terms of the treaty were disputed but undoubtedly the italians tried by this means to reduce menelik to vassalage menelik stoutly resisted and at the great battle of adjua one of the decisive battles of the modern world the abyssinians on march the first eighteen ninety six inflicted a crushing defeat on the italians killing four thousand of them and capturing two thousand prisoners the empress Thea, too, a full-blooded negress led some of the charges by this battle abyssinia became independent such in vague and general outline is the strange story of the valley of the nile of egypt the motherland of human culture and that starred ethiop queen that strove to set her beauty's praise above the sea nymphs end of chapter three chapter four of the negro by w e b du bois this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Niger and Islam The Arabian expression, Bil Lad es Sudan, Land of the Blacks, was applied to the whole region south of the Sahara, from the Atlantic to the Nile. It is a territory some 3,500 miles by 600 miles, containing 2 million square miles, and has today a population of perhaps 80 million. It is thus two-thirds the size of the United States, and quite as thickly settled. In the western Sudan, the Niger plays the same role as the Nile. In the east, in this chapter, we follow the history of the Niger. The history of this part of Africa was probably something as follows. Primitive man, entering Africa from Arabia, found the Great Lakes spread in the Nile Valley, and wandered westward to the Niger. Herodotus tells of certain youths who penetrated the desert to the Niger and found there a city of black dwarfs. Succeeding migrations of Negroes and Negroids pushed the dwarfs gradually into the inhospitable forests and occupied the Sudan, pushing on to the Atlantic. Here the newcomers, curling northward, met the Mediterranean race coming down across the western desert while to the southward the Negro came to the Gulf of Guinea and the thick forests of the Congo Valley. Indigenous civilizations arose on the west coast in Yoruba and Benin, and contact of these with the Mediterranean race in the desert and with Egyptian and Arab from the east gave rise to centers of Negro culture in the Sudan, at Ghana and Meli, and in Songhay, Noop, the House of States and Bornu. The history of the Sudan thus leads us back again to Ethiopia, that strange and ancient center of world civilization, whose inhabitants in the ancient world were considered to be the most pious and the oldest of men. From this center, the black originators of African culture, and to a large degree of world culture, wandered not simply down the Nile, but also westward. These Negroes developed the original substratum of culture, which later influences modified but never displaced. We know that Egyptian pharaohs in several cases ventured into the western Sudan, and that Egyptian influences are distinctly traceable. Greek and Byzantine culture and Phoenician and Carthaginian trade also penetrated, while Islam finally made this whole land her own. Behind all these influences, however, stood from the first an indigenous Negro culture. The stone figures of Sherbro, the megaliths of Gambia, the art and industry of the West Coast are all too deep in original evidences of civilization to be merely importations from abroad. Nor was the Sudan the inert recipient of foreign influence when it came. According to credible legend, the great king at Byzantium imported glass, tin, silver, bronze, cut stones, and other treasure from the Sudan. Embassies were sent in states like Nupa, recognized the suzerainty of the Byzantine emperor. The people of Nupa especially were filled with pride when the Byzantine people learned certain kinds of work in bronze and glass from them, and this intercourse was only interrupted by the Mohammedan conquest. To this ancient culture, modified somewhat by Byzantine and Christian influences, came Islam. 
it approached from the northwest coming stealthily and slowly and being handed on particularly by the mandingo negroes about one thousand to twelve hundred a d the situation was this ghana was on the edge of the desert in the north mandingo land between the niger and the senegal in the south and the western sahara the yolof was in the west on the senegal and the songe on the niger in the centre the mohammedans came chiefly as traders and found a trade already established here and there in the great cities were districts set aside for these new merchants and the mohammedans gave frequent evidence of their respect for these black nations islam did not found new states but modified and united negro states already ancient it did not initiate new commerce but developed a widespread trade already established it is as frobenius says easily proved from chronicles written in arabic that islam was only effective in fact as a fertilizer and stimulant the essential point is the resuscitative and invigorative concentration of negro power in the service of a new era and a moslem propaganda as well as the reaction thereby produced early in the eighth century islam had conquered north africa and converted the berbers aided by black soldiers the moslems crossed into spain in the following century berber and arab marbies crossed the west end of the sahara and came to negro land later in the eleventh century arabs penetrated the soudan and central africa from the east filtering through the negro tribes of darfur canem and neighboring regions the Arabs were too nearly akin to Negroes to draw an absolute color line. Antar, one of the great pre-Islamic poets of Arabia, was the son of a black woman, and one of the great poets at the court of Harun al-Rashid was black. In the 12th century, a learned Negro poet resided at Seville and Sid Yilmesa, the last town in lower Morocco toward the desert, was founded in 757 by a Negro who ruled over the Berber inhabitants indeed many towns in the soudan and the desert were thus ruled and felt no incongruity in this arrangement they say to be sure that the moors destroyed odd hog house because it paid tribute to the black town of ghana but this was because the town was heathen and not because it was black on the other hand there is a story that a berber king overthrew one of the cities of the soudan and all the black women committed suicide being too proud to allow themselves to fall into the hands of white men in the west the moslems first came into touch with the negro kingdom of ghana here large quantities of gold were gathered in early days and we have names of seventy-four rulers before three hundred a d running through twenty-one generations this would take us back approximately a thousand years to seven hundred b c or about the time that pharaoh necho of egypt sent out the phoenician expedition which circumnavigated africa and possibly before the time when hanno the carthaginian explored the west coast of africa by the middle of the eleventh century ghana was the principal kingdom in the western soudan already the town had a native and a mussulman quarter and was built of wood and stone with surrounding gardens the king had an army of two hundred thousand and the wealth of the country was great a century later the king had become mohammedan in faith and had a palace with sculptures and glass windows the great reason for this development was the desert trade gold skins ivory cola nuts gums honey wheat and cotton were exported and the whole mediterranean coast traded in the soudan other and lesser black kingdoms like tekro silu and messina surrounded ghana in the early part of the thirteenth century the prestige of ghana began to fall before the rising mandingan kingdom to the west meli as it was called was founded in twelve thirty five and formed an open door for moslem and moorish traders the new kingdom helped by its expanding trade began to grow and islam slowly surrounded the older negro culture west north and east however a great mass of the older heathen culture pushing itself upward from the guinea coast stood firmly against islam down to the nineteenth century steadily mohammedanism triumphed in the growing states which almost encircled the protagonists of ancient atlantic culture mending and Meli eventually supplanted ghana in prestige and power after ghana had been overthrown by the heathen susu from the south the territory of Meli lay southeast of ghana and some five hundred miles north of the gulf of guinea its kings were known by the title of mansa and from the middle of the thirteenth century to the middle of the fourteenth the melistim as its dominion was called was the leading power in the land of the blacks its greatest king mari jalak 
mansa musa made his pilgrimage to mecca in thirteen twenty four with a caravan of sixty thousand persons including twelve thousand young slaves gowned in figured cotton and persian silk he took eighty camel loads of gold dust worth about five million dollars to defray his expenses and greatly impressed the people of the east with his magnificence on his return he found that timbuktu had been sacked by the Masi, but he rebuilt the town and filled the new mosque with learned blacks from the university of fez mansa musa reigned twenty-five years and was distinguished by his ability and by the holiness of his life the justice of his administration was such that the memory of it still lives the melestine preserved its preeminence until the beginning of the sixteenth century when the rod of sudanese empire passed to songhe the largest and most famous of the black empires the known history of songhe covers a thousand years and three dynasties and centers in the great bend of the niger there were thirty kings of the first dynasty reigning from seven hundred to thirteen thirty five during the reign of one of these the sangay kingdom became the vassal kingdom of meli then at the height of its glory in addition to this the masi crossed the valley plundered timbuktu in thirteen thirty nine and separated jenny the original seat of the sangay from the main empire the sixteenth king was converted to mohammedanism in ten o nine and after that all the songhe princes were mohammedans mansa musa took two young songhe princes to the court of belly to be educated in thirteen twenty six these boys when grown ran away and founded a new dynasty in songhe that of the sanis in thirteen fifty five seventeen of these kings reigned the last and greatest being sani ali who ascended the throne in fourteen sixty four meli was at this time declining other cities like jenny with its seven thousand villages were rising and the tuaregs berbers with negro blood had captured timbuktu sani ali was a soldier and began his career with the conquest of timbuktu in fourteen sixty nine he also succeeded in capturing jenny and attacked the masi and other enemies on all sides finally he concentrated his forces for the destruction of meli and subdued nearly the whole empire on the west bend of the niger in summing up sani ali's military career the chronicle says of him he surpassed all his predecessors in the numbers and valor of his soldiery his conquests were many and his renown extended from the rising to the setting of the sun if it is the will of god he will be long spoken of sunny ali was a songhe negro whose father was a berber he was succeeded by a full-blooded black mohammed abu becker who had been his prime minister mohammed was hailed as askia usurper and is best known as mohammed askia he was strictly orthodox where ali was rather a scoffer and an organizer where ali was a warrior on his pilgrimage to mecca in fourteen ninety five there was nothing of the barbaric splendor of mansa musa but a brilliant group of scholars and holy men with a small escort of fifteen hundred soldiers and nine hundred thousand dollars in gold he stopped and consulted with scholars and politicians and studied matters of taxation weights and measures trade religious tolerance and manners in cairo where he was invested by the reigning caliph of egypt he may have heard of the struggle of europe for the trade of the indies and perhaps of the parceling of the new world between portugal and spain he returned to the soudan in fourteen ninety seven instituted a standing army of slaves undertook a holy war against the indomitable masi and finally marched against the hausa he subdued these cities and even imposed the rule of black men on the berber town of Vagadis, a rich city of merchants and artificers with stately mansions in fine askia during his reign conquered and consolidated an empire two thousand miles long by one thousand wide at its greatest diameters a territory as large as all europe the territory was divided into four vice royalties and the system of meli with its semi-independent native dynasties was carried out his empire extended from the atlantic to lake chad and from the salt mines of tagassa and the town of Algila in the north to the tenth degree of north latitude toward the south it was a six months journey across the empire and it is said he was obeyed with as much docility in the farthest limits of the empire as he was in his own palace and there reigned everywhere great plenty and absolute peace the university of sankor became a centre of learning in correspondence with egypt and north africa and had a swarm of black sudanese students law literature grammar geography surgery were studied askia the great 
reigned thirty-six years and his dynasty continued on the throne until after the moorish conquest in fifteen ninety one meanwhile to the eastward two powerful states appeared they never disputed the military supremacy of Songhe, but their industrial development was marvellous the house of states were formed by seven original cities of which kanu was the oldest and katsena the most famous their greatest leaders mohammed rimpa and ammadu kosoki arose in the fifteenth and early sixteenth centuries the land was subject to the song hey but the cities became industrious centres of smelting weaving and dyeing Cassina, especially in the middle of the sixteenth century is described as a place thirteen or fourteen miles in circumference divided into quarters for strangers for visitors from various other states and for the different trades and industries as saddlers shoemakers dyers etc beyond the house estates and boarding on lake chad was bornu the people of bornu had a large infiltration of berber blood but were predominantly negro berber mulattoes had been kings in early days but they were soon replaced by black men under the early kings who can be traced back to the third century these people had ruled nearly all the territory between the nile and lake chad the country was known as kanem and the pagan dynasty of dugu reigned there from the middle of the ninth to the end of the eleventh century mohammedanism was introduced from egypt at the end of the eleventh century and under the mohammedan kings kanem became one of the first powers of the soudan by the end of the twelfth century the armies of kanem were very powerful and its rulers were known as kings of kanem and lords of bornu in the thirteenth century the kings even dared to invade the southern country down toward the valley of the congo meantime great things were happening in the world beyond the desert the ocean and the nile arabian mohammedanism had succumbed to the wild fanaticism of sel yunkian turks these new conquerors were not only firmly planted at the gates of vienna but had swept the shores of the mediterranean and sent all europe scouring the seas for their lost trade connections with the riches of india religious zeal fear of conquest and commercial greed inflamed europe against the mohammedan and led to the discovery of a new world the riches of which poured first on spain oppression of the moors followed and in fifteen o two they were driven back into africa despoiled and humbled here the spaniards followed and harassed them and here the turks fighting the christians captured the mediterranean ports and cut the moors off permanently from europe in the slow years that followed huddled in northwest africa they became a decadent people and finally cast their eyes toward negroland the moors in morocco had come to look upon the soudan as a gold mine and knew that the soudan was especially dependent upon salt in fifteen forty five morocco claimed the principal salt mines at the Gaza, but the reigning askia refused to recognize the claim when the sultan el mansour came to the throne of morocco he increased the efficiency of his army by supplying it with firearms and cannon el mansour determined to attack the soudan and sent four hundred men under pasha de Jouder, who left morocco in fifteen ninety the Songhe with their bows and arrows were helpless against powder and shot and they were defeated at ten kadibu april twelfth fifteen ninety one Askia Isak, the king offered terms and de Jouder Basha referred them to Morocco. The Sultan, angry with his general's delay, deposed him and sent another who crushed and treacherously murdered the king and set up a puppet. Thereafter there were two Askias, one under the Moors at Timbuktu, one who maintained himself in the house estates which the Moors could not subdue. Anarchy reigned in Songhe. The Moors tried to put down disorder with a high hand, drove out and murdered the distinguished men of Timbuktu, and as a result let loose a riot of robbery and decadence throughout the Sudan. Pasha had now succeeded Pasha with revolt and misrule until, in 1612, the soldiers elected their own Pasha and deliberately shut themselves up in the Sudan by cutting off approach from the north hausaland and bornu were still open to turkish and mohammedan influence from the east and the gulf of guinea to the slave trade from the south but the face of the finest negro civilization the modern world had ever produced was veiled from europe and given to the defilement of wild moorish soldiers in sixteen twenty three it is written excesses of every kind are now committed unchecked by the soldiery and the country is profoundly convulsed and oppressed the tuaregs marched down from the desert and deprived the moors of many of the principal towns the rest of the empire of the sangay was by the end of the eighteenth century divided among separate moorish chiefs who bought 
supplies from the negro peasantry and were at once the vainest proudest and perhaps the most bigoted ferocious and intolerant of all the nations of the south they lived a nomadic life plundering the negroes to such depths did the mighty Songhe fall as the Songhe declined a new power arose in the nineteenth century the fula the fulu who vary in race from berber mulattoes to full-blooded negroes may be the result of a westward migration of some people like the luco ethiopi of pliny or they may have arisen from the migration of berber mulattoes in the western oases driven south by romans and arabs these wandering herdsmen lived on the senegal river and the ocean in very early times and were not heard of until the nineteenth century by this time they had changed to a negro or dark mulatto people and lived scattered in small communities between the atlantic and darfur they were without political union or national sentiment but were all mohammedans then came a sudden change and led by a religious fanatic these despised and persecuted people became masters of the central sudan they were the ones who at last broke down that great wedge of resisting atlantic culture after it had been undermined and disintegrated by the american slave trade thus islam finally triumphed in the sudan and the ancient culture combined with the new in the sudan to-day one may find evidences of the union of two classes of people the representatives of the older civilization dwell as peasants in small communities carrying on industries and speaking a large number of different languages with them or above them is the ruling mohammedan caste speaking four main languages mandingo house of fula and arabic these latter form the state builders negro blood predominates among both classes but naturally there is more berber blood among the mohammedan invaders europe during the middle ages had some knowledge of these movements in the sudan and africa meli and songhe appear on medieval maps in literature we have many allusions the mulatto king fire fees was one of wolfram von eschenbach's heroes prester john furnished endless lore otello the warrior and the black king represented by mediaeval art as among the three wise men and the various black virgin marys all show legendary knowledge of what african civilization was at that time doing it is a curious commentary on modern prejudice that most of this splendid history of civilization and uplift is unknown to-day and men confidently assert that negroes have no history End of chapter four Chapter Five of the Negro by W. E. B. Du Bois. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Guinea and Congo. One of the great cities of the Sudan was Jenny. The chronicle says that its markets are held every day of the week, and its populations are very enormous. Its seven thousand villages are so near to one another that the chief of Jenny has no need of messengers. If he wishes to send a note to Lake Daibo, for instance, it is cried from the gate of the town and repeated from village to village by which means it reaches its destination almost instantly. From the name of this city we get the modern name Guinea, which is used today to designate the country contiguous to the great gulf of that name a territory often referred to in general as west africa here reaching from the mouth of the gambia to the mouth of the niger is a coast of six hundred miles where a marvellous drama of world history has been enacted the coast and its hinterland comprehends many well-known names first comes ancient guinea then modern sierra leone and liberia then follow the various coasts of ancient traffic the grain ivory gold and slave coasts with the adjoining territories of ashanti dahomey lagos and benin and farther back such tribal and territorial names as those of the mandingos yorubas the masi nupa borgu and others recent investigation makes it certain that an ancient civilization existed on this coast which may have gone back as far as three thousand years before christ frobenius perhaps fancifully identified this african coast with the atlantis of the greeks and as part of that great western movement in human culture beyond the pillars of hercules which thirteen centuries before christ strove with egypt and the east 
it is at any rate clear that ancient commerce reached down the west coast the phoenicians six hundred b c and the carthaginians a century or more later record voyages and these may have been attempted revivals of still more ancient intercourse these coasts at some unknown prehistoric period were peopled from the niger plateau toward the north and west by the black west african type of negro while along the west end of the desert these negroes mingled with the berbers forming various negroid races movement and migration is evident along this coast in ancient and modern times the yoruba Malim, the homi peoples were among the earliest arrivals with their remarkable art and industry which places them in some lines of technique abreast with the modern world behind them came the masi from the north and many other peoples in recent days have filtered through like the limba and temni of sierra leone and the agni ashanti who moved from Orgu, some two thousand years ago to the gold and ivory coasts we have already noted in the main the history of black men along the wonderful niger and seen how pushing up from the gulf of guinea a powerful wedge of ancient culture held back islam for a thousand years now victorious now stubbornly disputing every inch of retreat the centre of this culture lay probably in oldest times above the bight of benin along the slave coast and reached east west and north we trace it to-day not only in the remarkable tradition of the natives but in stone monuments architecture industrial and social organization and works of art in bronze glass and terracotta benin art has been practised without interruption for centuries and von luchon says that it is of extraordinary significance that by the sixteenth and seventeenth centuries a local and monumental art had been learned in benin which in many respects equalled european art and developed a technique of the very highest accomplishment summing up yoruban civilization frobenius concluded that the technical summit of that civilization was reached in the terracotta industry and that the most important achievements in art were not expressed in stone but in fine clay baked in the furnace that hollow casting was thoroughly known to and practised by these people that iron was mainly used for decoration that whatever their purpose they kept their glass beads in stoneware urns within their own locality and that they manufactured both earthen and glassware that the art of weaving was highly developed among them that the stone monuments it is true show some dexterity in handling and are so far instructive that but in other respects evidence a cultural condition insufficiently matured to grasp the utility of stone monumental material and above all that the then great and significant idea of the universe as imaged in the templum was current in those days effort has naturally been made to ascribe this civilization to white people first it was ascribed to portuguese influence but much of it is evidently older than the portuguese discovery egypt and india have been evoked and greece and carthage but all these explanations are far-fetched if ever a people exhibited unanswerable evidence of indigenous civilization it is the west coast africans undoubtedly they adapted much that came to them utilized new ideas and grew from contact but their art and culture is negro through and through yoruba forms one of the three city groups of west africa another is around timbuktu and a third in the house of states the timbuktu cities have from five to fifteen hundred towns while the yoruba cities have one hundred and fifty thousand inhabitants and more the house of cities are many of them important but few are as large as the yoruba cities and they lie farther apart a h three centers however are connected with the niger and the group nearest the coast that is the yoruba cities has the greatest number of towns the most developed till architectural styles and the oldest institutions the yoruba cities are not only different from the sudanese in population but in their social relations the sudanese cities were influenced from the desert and the mediterranean and form nuclei of larger surrounding monarchical states the yoruba cities on the other hand remained comparatively autonomous organizations down to modern times and their relative importance changed from time to time without developing an imperialistic idea or subordinating the group to one overpowering city 
this social and industrial state of the yorubas formerly spread and wielded great influence we find yoruba reaching out and subduing states like nupe toward the northward but the industrial democracy and city autonomy of yoruba lent itself indifferently to conquest and the state fell eventually a victim to the fanatical fula mohammedans and was made a part of the modern sultanate of gando west of yoruba on the lower courses of the niger is benin an ancient state which in eighteen ninety seven traced its twenty-three kings back one thousand years some legends even named a line of sixty kings it seems probable that benin developed the imperial idea and once extended its rule into the congo valley later and also to the west of the yoruba came two states showing a fiercer and ruder culture dahomey and ashanti the state of dahomey was founded by takandomi early in the seventeenth century and developed into a fierce and bloody tyranny with wholesale murder the king had a body of two thousand to five thousand amazons renowned for their bravery and armed with rifles the kingdom was overthrown by the french in eighteen ninety two to ninety three under sai tutu ashanti arose to power in the seventeenth century a military aristocracy with cruel blood sacrifices was formed by eighteen sixteen the king had at his disposal two hundred thousand soldiers the ashanti power was crushed by the english in the war of eighteen seventy three to seventy four in these states and in later years in benin the whole character of west coast culture seems to change in place of the yoruban culture with its city democracy its elevated religious ideas its finely organized industry and its noble art came ashanti and dahomey what was it that changed the character of the west coast from this to the orgies of war and blood sacrifice which we read of later in these lands there can but be one answer the slave trade not simply the sale of men but an organized traffic of such proportions and widely organized ramifications as to turn the attention and energies of men from nearly all other industries encourage war and all the cruelest passions of war and concentrate this traffic in precisely that part of africa farthest from the ancient mediterranean lines of trade we need not assume that the cultural change was sudden or absolute ancient Aruba had the cruelty of a semi-civilized land but it was not dominant or tyrannical modern benin and dahomey showed traces of skill culture and industry along with inexplicable cruelty and bloodthirstiness but it was the slave trade that turned the balance and set these lands backward dahomey was the last word in a series of human disasters which began with the defeat of the ascaius at tenka debu from the middle of the fifteenth century to the last half of the nineteenth centuries the american slave trade centred in guinea and devastated the coast morally socially and physically european rum and firearms were traded for human beings and it was not until seventeen eighty seven that any measures were taken to counteract this terrible scourge in that year the idea arose of repatriating stolen negroes on that coast and establishing civilized centers to supplant the slave trade about four hundred negroes from england were sent to sierra leone to whom the promoters considerately added sixty white prostitutes as wives the climate on the low coast however was so deadly that new recruits were soon needed an american negro thomas peters who had served as sergeant under sir henry clinton in the british army in america went to england seeking an allotment of land for his fellows the sierra leone company welcomed him and offered free passage and land in sierra leone to the negroes of nova scotia as a result fifteen vessels sailed with eleven hundred and ninety negroes in seventeen ninety two arriving in africa they found the chief white man in control there so drunk that he soon died of delirium tremens john clarkson however brother of thomas clarkson the abolitionist eventually took the lead founded freetown and the colony began its checkered career in eighteen ninety six the colony was saved from insurrection by the exiled maroon negroes from jamaica after eighteen thirty three when emancipation in english colonies took place severe measures against the slave trade was possible and the colony began to grow Today, its own ports and exports amount to fifteen million dollars a year liberia was a similar american experiment in eighteen sixteen american philanthropists decided that slavery was bound to die out but that the problem lay in getting rid of the freed negroes of which there were then two hundred thousand in the united states 
accordingly the american colonization society was proposed this year and founded january one eighteen seventeen with bushrod washington as president it was first thought to encourage migration to sierra leone and eighty-eight negroes were sent but they were not welcomed as a result territory was bought in the present confines of liberia december fifteenth eighteen twenty one and colonists began to arrive a little later an african depot for recaptured slaves taken in the contraband slave trade provided for in the act of eighteen nineteen was established and an agent was sent to africa to form a settlement gradually the settlement was merged with the settlement of the colonization society and from this union liberia was finally evolved the last white governor of liberia died in eighteen forty one and was succeeded by the first colored governor joseph j roberts of virginian the total population in eighteen forty three was about twenty seven hundred and ninety and with this as a beginning in eighteen forty seven governor roberts declared the independence of the state the recognition of liberian independence by all countries except the united states followed in eighteen forty nine the united states not wishing to receive a negro minister did not recognize liberia until eighteen sixty two no sooner was the independence of liberia announced than england and france began a long series of aggressions to limit her territory and sovereignty considerable territory was lost by treaty and in the effort to get capital to develop the rest liberia was saddled with a debt of four hundred thousand dollars of which she received less than one hundred thousand dollars in actual cash finally the liberians turned to the united states for capital and protection as a result the liberian customs have been put under international control and major charles young the ranking negro officer in the united states army with several colored assistants has been put in charge of the making of roads and drilling a constabulary to keep order in the interior today liberia has an area of forty thousand square miles about three hundred and fifty miles of coastline and an estimated total population of two million of which fifty thousand are civilized the revenue amounted in nineteen thirteen to five hundred and thirty one thousand five hundred dollars the imports in nineteen twelve were one million six hundred and sixty seven thousand eight hundred and fifty seven dollars and the exports one million one hundred and ninety nine thousand one hundred and fifty one dollars the latter consisted chiefly of rubber palm oil and kernels coffee puyasava fiber ivory ginger camward and arnato perhaps liberia's greatest citizen was the late edward wilmot blyden who migrated in early life from the danish west indies and became a prophet of the renaissance of the negro race turning now from guinea we passed down the west coast in fourteen eighty two diego cam of portugal sailing this coast set a stone in the mouth of a great river which he called the mighty but which eventually came to be known by the name of the powerful negro kingdom through which it flowed the congo we must think of the valley of the congo with its intricate interlacing of water routes and jungle of forests as a vast cauldron shut away at first from the african world by known and unknown physical hindrances then it was penetrated by the tiny red dwarfs and afterward horde after horde of tall black men swirled into the valley like a maelstrom moving usually from north to east and from south to west the congo valley became therefore the centre of the making of what we know to-day as the bantu nations they are not unified people but a congeries of tribes of considerable physical diversity united by the compelling bond of language and other customs imposed on the conquered by invading conquerors the history of these invasions we must to-day largely imagine between two and three thousand years ago the wilder tribes of negroes began to move out of the region south or southeast of lake chad this was always a land of shadows and legends where fearful cannibals dwelt and where no egyptian or ethiopian or sudanese armies dared to go it is possible however that pressure from the civilization in the nile valley and rising culture around lake chad was at this time reinforced by expansion of the yoruba benin culture on the west coast perhaps too developing culture around the great lakes in the east beckoned or the riotous fertility of the congo valleys became known at any rate the movement commenced now by slow stages now in wild forays there may have been a preliminary movement from east to west to the gulf of guinea the main movement however was eastward skirting the congo forests and passing down by the victoria nyanza and lake 
tanganyika here two paths beckoned the lakes and the sea to the east the congo to the west a great stream of men swept toward the ocean and dividing turned northward and fought its way down the nile valley and into the abyssinian highlands another branch turned south and approached the zambezi where we shall meet it again another horde of invaders turned westward and entered the valley of the congo in three columns the northern column moved along the lua laba and congo rivers to the cameroons the second column became the industrial and state-building luba and lunda peoples in the southern congo valley and angola while the third column moved into damara land and mingled with bushman and hottentot in the congo valley the invaders settled in village and plain absorbed such indigenous inhabitants as they found or drove them deeper into the forest and immediately began to develop industry and political organization they became skilled agriculturalists raising in some localities a profusion of cereals fruit and vegetables such as manioc maize yams sweet potatoes ground nuts sorghum gourds beans peas bananas and plantains everywhere they showed skill in mining and the welding of iron copper and other metals they made weapons of wire and ingots cloth and pottery and a widespread system of trade arose some tribes extracted rubber from the talamba root others had remarkable breeds of fowl and cattle and still others divided their people by crafts into farmers smiths boat builders warriors cabinet makers armorers and speakers women here and there took part in public assemblies and were rulers in some cases large towns were built some of which required hours to traverse from end to end many tribes developed intelligence of a higher order wisman called the baluba a nation of thinkers bateman found them thoroughly and unimpeachably honest brave to foolhardiness and faithful to each other and to their superiors one of their kings columba a really princely prince bateman says would amongst any people be a remarkable and indeed in many respects a magnificent man these beginnings of human culture were however peculiarly vulnerable to invading hosts of later comers there were no natural protecting barriers like the narrow nile valley or the kong mountains or the forest below lake chad once the pathways to the valley were open and for hundreds of years new the newcomers kept arriving especially from the welter of tribes south of the sedan and west of the nile which rising culture beyond kept in unrest and turmoil against these intruders there was but one defence the state state building was thus forced on the congo valley how early it started we cannot say but when the portuguese arrived in the fifteenth century there had existed for centuries a large state among the ba congo with its capital at the city now known as san salvador the negro mafuma or emperor was eventually induced to accept christianity his sons and many young negroes of high birth were taken to portugal to be educated there several were raised to the catholic priesthood and one became bishop others distinguished themselves at the universities thus suddenly there arose a catholic kingdom south of the valley of the congo which lasted three centuries but was partially overthrown by invading barbarians from the interior in the seventeenth century a king of congo still reigns as pensioner of portugal and on the coast to-day are the remains of the kingdom and the civilized blacks and mulattoes who are intelligent traders and boat builders meantime the lubalunda people to the eastward founded Cantanga and other states and in the sixteenth century the larger and more ambitious realm of the mawata yambo the last of the fourteen rulers of this line was feudal lord of about three hundred chiefs who paid him tribute in ivory skins corn cloth and salt his territory included about one hundred thousand square miles and two million or more inhabitants eventually this state became torn by internal strife and revolt especially by attacks from the south across the congo sambezi divide farther north among the ba lolo and the ba sango the village policy persisted and the cannibals of the northeast pressed down on the more settled tribes the result was a curious blending of war and industry artistic tastes and savage customs the organized slave trade of the arabs penetrated the congo valley in the sixteenth century and soon was aiding all the forces of unrest and turmoil industry was deranged and many tribes forced to take refuge in caves and other hiding places here as on the west coast disintegration and retrogression followed for as the american traffic lessened the arabian traffic increased 
when therefore stanley opened the congo valley to modern knowledge leopold the second of belgium conceived the idea of founding here a free international state which was to bring civilization to the heart of africa consequently there was formed in eighteen seventy eight an international committee to study the region stanley was finally commissioned to inquire as to the best way of introducing european trade and culture i am charged he said to open and keep open if possible all such districts and countries as i may explore for the benefit of the commercial world the mission is supported by a philanthropic society which numbers noble-minded men of several nations it is not a religious society but my instructions are entirely of that spirit no violence must be used and wherever rejected the mission must withdraw to seek another field the beulah matadi or stone-breaker as the natives called stanley threw himself energetically into the work and had by eighteen eighty one built a road past the falls to the plateau where thousands of miles of river navigation were thus opened stations were established and by eighteen eighty four stanley returned armed with four hundred and fifty treaties with the native chiefs and the new state appealed to the world for recognition the united states first recognized the congo free state which was at last made a sovereign power under international guarantees by the congress of berlin in the year eighteen eighty five and leopold the second was chosen its king the state had an area of about nine hundred thousand square miles with a population of about thirty million one of the first tasks before the new state was to check the arab slave traders the arabs had hitherto acted as traders and middlemen along the upper congo and when the english and congo state overthrew mazidi the reigning king in the Kantanga country a general revolt of the arabs and mulattoes took place for a time eighteen ninety two to ninety three the whites were driven out but in a year or two the arabs and their allies were subdued humanity and commerce however did not replace the arab slave traders rather european greed and serfdom were substituted the land was confiscated by the state and farmed out to private belgian corporations the wilder cannibal tribes were formed into a militia to prey on the industrious who were taxed with specific amounts of ivory and rubber and scourged and mutilated if they failed to pay harris declares that king leopold's regime meant the death of twelve million natives europe was staggered at the leopoldian atrocities and they were terrible indeed but what we who were behind the scenes felt most keenly was the fact that the real catastrophe in the congo was the desolation and murder in the larger sense the invasion of family life the ruthless destruction of every social barrier the shattering of every tribal law the introduction of criminal practices which struck the chiefs of the people dumb with horror in a word a veritable avalanche of filth and immorality overwhelmed the congo tribes so notorious did the exploitation and misrule become that leopold was forced to take measures toward reform and finally in nineteen o nine the free state became a belgian colony some reforms have been inaugurated and others may follow but the valley of the congo will long stand as a monument of shame to christianity and european civilization End of chapter five chapter six of the negro by w e b du bois this librivox recording is in the public domain the great lakes and zimbabwe we have already seen how a branch of the conquering bantus turned eastward by the great lakes and thus reached the sea and eventually both the nile and south africa this brought them into the ancient and mysterious land far up the nile south of ethiopia here lay the ancient punt of the egyptians whether we place it in somala land or as seems far more likely around the great lakes and here as the egyptians thought their civilization began the earliest inhabitants of the land were apparently of the bushman or hottentot type of negro these were gradually pushed southward and westward by the intrusion of the nilotic negroes five thousand years before christ the mulatto egyptians were in the nile valley below the first cataract the negroes were in the nile valley down as far as the second cataract and between the first and second cataracts were negroes into whose veins semitic blood had penetrated more or less these mixed elements became the ancestors of the modern somali gala 
bishari and beja and spread negro blood into arabia beyond the red sea the nilotic negroes to the south early became great traders in ivory gold leopard skins gums beasts birds and slaves and they opened up systematic trade between egypt and the great lakes the result was endless movement and migration both in ancient and modern days which makes the cultural history of the great lakes region very difficult to understand three great elements are however clear first the egyptian element by the northward migration of the negro ancestors of pre-dynastic egypt and the southern conquests and trade of dynastic egypt second the semitic influence from arabia and persia third the negro influences from western and central africa the migration of the bantu is the first clearly defined movement of modern times as we have shown they began to move southward at least a thousand years before christ skirting the congo forests and wandering along the great lakes and down to the zambezi what did they find in this land we do not know certainly but from what we do know we may reconstruct the situation in this way the primitive culture of the hottentots of punt had been further developed by them and by other stronger negro stocks until it reached a highly developed culture widespread agriculture and mining of gold silver and precious stones started a trade that penetrated to asia and north africa this may have been the source of the gold of the ophir the state that thus arose became in time strongly organized it employed slave labor in crushing the hard quartz sinking pits and carrying underground galleries it carried out a system of irrigation and built stone buildings and fortifications there exist to-day many remains of these building operations in the kalahari desert and in northern rhodesia five hundred groups covering over an area of one hundred and fifty thousand square miles lie between the limpopo and zambezi rivers mining operations have been carried on in these plains for generations and one estimate is that at least three hundred and seventy five million dollars worth of gold had been extracted some have thought that the older workings must date back to one or even three thousand years before the christian era there are other mines writes de Barros, in the seventeenth century in a district called teroa which is otherwise known as the kingdom of butua whose ruler is a prince by name burro a vassal of enomotapa this land is near the other which we said consisted of extensive plains and those ruins are the oldest that are known in that region they are all in a plain in the middle of which stands a square fortress all of dressed stones within and without well wrought and of marvellous size without any lime showing the joinings the walls of which are over twenty-five hands thick but the height is not so great compared to the thickness and above the gateway of that edifice is an inscription which some moorish arab traders who were there could not read nor say what writing it was all these structures the people of this country call zimboe zimbabwe which with them means a court for every place where benemo tapa stays is so called later investigation has shown that these buildings were in many cases carefully planned and built fortifications at neakirk for instance nine or ten hills are fortified on concentric walls thirty to fifty feet in number with a place for the village at the top the buildings are forts miniature citadels and also workshops and cattle crails iron implements and handsome pottery were found there and close to the zambezi there are extraordinary fortifications farther south at inyanga there is less strong defence and at umtali there are no fortifications showing that builders feared invasion from the north these people worked in gold silver tin copper and bronze and made beautiful pottery there is evidence of religious significance in the buildings and what is called the temple was the royal residence and served as a sort of acropolis the surrounding residences in the valley were evidently occupied by wealthy traders and were not fortified here the gold was received from surrounding districts and bartered with traders as usual there have been repeated attempts to find an external and especially an asiatic origin for this culture so far however archaeological research seems to confirm its african origin the implements weapons and art 
are characteristically african and there is no evident connection with outside sources how far back this civilization dates it is difficult to say a great deal depending upon the dating of the iron age in south africa if it was the same as in the mediterranean regions the earliest limit was the one thousand b c it might however have been much earlier especially if as seems probable the use of iron originated in africa on the other hand the culmination of this culture has been placed by some as late as the modern middle ages what was it that overthrew this civilization undoubtedly the same sort of raids of barbarous warriors that we have known in our day for instance in fifteen seventy there came upon the country of mozambique farther up the coast such an inundation of pagans that they could not be numbered they came from that part of mona ma tapa where is the great lake from which spring these great rivers they left no other signs of the towns they passed but the heaps of ruins and the bones of inhabitants so too it is told how the zimbas came a strange people never before seen there who leaving their own country traversed a great part of this ethiopia like a scourge of god destroying every living thing they came across they were twenty thousand strong and marched without children or women just as four hundred years later the zulu impi marched again in sixteen o two a horde of people came from the interior called the cambiris or cannibals they entered the kingdom of menna motapa and the reigning king being weak was in great terror thus gradually the monopotapa fell and its power was scattered until the kafir zulu raids of our day the arab writer makoudi in the tenth century visited the east african coast somewhere north of the equator he found the indian sea at that time frequented by arab and persian vessels but there were no asiatic settlements on the african shore the bantu or as he calls them zenji inhabited the country as far south as safala where they bordered upon the bushmen these bantus were under a ruler with the dynastic title of walklimi he was paramount over all the other tribes of the north and could put three hundred thousand men in the field they used oxen as beasts of burden and the country produced gold in abundance while panther skin was largely used for clothing ivory was sold to asia and the bantu used iron for personal adornment instead of gold or silver they rode on their oxen which ran with great speed and they ate millet and honey and the flesh of animals inland among the bantu arose later the line of rulers called the monomotapa among the gifted makalenga their state was very extensive ranging from the coast far in through the interior and from mozambique down to the limpopo it was strongly organized with feudatory allied states and carried on an extensive commerce by means of the traders on the coast the kings were converted to nominal christianity by the portuguese there are indications of trade between nupa in west africa and sofala on the east coast and certainly trade between asia and east africa is earlier than the beginning of the christian era the asiatic traders settled on the coast and by means of mulatto and negro merchants brought central africa into contact with arabia india china and malaysia the coming of the asiatics was in this wise zaida great-grandson of ali nephew and son-in-law of mohammed was banished from arabia as a heretic he passed over to africa and formed temporary settlements his people mingled with the blacks and the resulting mulatto traders known as the emo zadi seemed to have wandered as far south as the equator soon other arabian families came over on account of oppression and founded the towns of magadosho and brava both not far north of the equator the first town became a place of importance and other settlements were made the emo zadi whom the later immigrants regarded as heretics were driven inland and became the interpreting traders between the coast and the bantu some wanderers from magadosho came into the port of safala and there learned that gold could be obtained this led to a small arab settlement at that place seventy years later and about fifty years before the norman conquest of england certain persians settled at kilwa in east africa led by ali who had been despised in his land because he was the son of a black abyssinian slave mother kilwa because of this eventually became the most important commercial station on the east african coast and in this and all these settlements a very large mulatto population grew up so that very soon the whole settlement was indistinguishable in color from the bantu 
in thirteen thirty ivan batuta visited kilwa he found an abundance of ivory and some gold and heard that the inhabitants of kilwa had gained victories over the zenji or bantu kilwa had at that time three hundred mosques and was built of handsome houses of stone and lime and very lofty with their windows like those of the christians in the same way it has streets and these houses have got terraces and the woodwork is with the masonry with plenty of gardens in which there are many fruit trees and much water kilwa after a time captured safala seizing it from magadosho eventually kilwa became mistress of the island of zanzibar of mozambique and of much other territory the forty-third ruler of kilwa after ali was named abraham and he was ruling when the portuguese arrived the latter reported that these people cultivated rice and cocoa built ships and had considerable commerce with asia all the people of whatever color were mohammedans and the richer were clothed in gorgeous robes of silk and velvet they traded with the inland bantus and met numerous tribes receiving gold ivory millet rice cattle poultry and honey on the islands the asiatics were independent but on the mainlands south of kilwa the sheikhs ruled only their own people under the overlordship of the bantus to whom they were compelled to pay large tribute each year vasco da gama doubled the cape of good hope in fourteen ninety seven and went north on the east coast as far as india in the next ten years the portuguese had occupied more than six different points on that coast including sofala thus civilization waxed and waned in east africa among prehistoric negroes arab and persian mulattoes on the coast and in the zend or zing empire of bantu negroes and later in the bantu rule of the Manamotapa and thus too among later throngs of the fiercer warlike bantu the ancient culture of the land largely died yet something survived and in the modern bantu state language and industry can be found clear links that establish the essential identity of the absorbed peoples with the builders of zimbabwe so far we have traced the history of the lands into which the southward stream of invading bantus turned and have followed them to the limpopo river we turn now to the lands north from lake nyasa the aboriginal negroes sustained in prehistoric time invasions from the northeast by negroes of a type like the ancient egyptians and like the modern gallus masai and somalis to these migrations were added attacks from the nile negroes to the north and the bantu invaders from the south this has led to great differences among the groups of the population and in their customs some are fierce mountaineers occupying hilly plateaus six thousand feet above the sea level others like the wa swahili are traders on the coast there are the masai chocolate-colored and frizzy-haired organized for war and cattle lifting and negroes like the gallus who blending with the bantus have produced the race of modern uganda it was in this region that the kingdom of kitwara was founded by the gala chief kintu about the beginning of the nineteenth century the empire was dismembered the largest share falling to uganda the ensuing history of uganda is of great interest when king mutesa came to the throne in eighteen sixty two he found mohammedan influences in his land and was induced to admit english protestants and french catholics uganda thereupon became an extraordinary religious battlefield between these three beliefs mutesa's successor mwanga caused an english bishop to be killed in eighteen eighty five believing as has since proven quite true that the religion he offered would be used as a cloak for conquest the final result was that after open war between the religions uganda was made an english protectorate in eighteen ninety four the negroes of uganda are an intelligent people who had organized a complex feudal state at the head stood the king and under him twelve feudal lords the present king doughty chua is the young grandson of mutesa and rules under the overlordship of england many things show the connection between egypt and this part of africa the same glass beads are found in uganda and upper egypt and similar canoes are built harps and other instruments bear great resemblance finally the bahima as the gala invaders are called are startlingly egyptian in type at the same time they are undoubtedly negro in hair and color perhaps we have here the best racial picture of what ancient egyptian and upper nile regions were in pre-dynastic times and later 
thus in outline was seen the mission of the people labantu as they called themselves they migrated they settled they tore down and they learned and they in turn were often overthrown by succeeding tribes of their own folk they rule with their tongue and their power all africa south of the equator save where the europeans have entered they have never been conquered although the gold and diamond traders have sought to debauch them and the ivory and rubber capitalists have cruelly wronged their weaker groups they are the africans with whom the world of to-morrow must reckon just as the world of yesterday knew them to its cost End of chapter six chapter seven of the negro by w e b du bois this librivox recording is in the public domain the war of races at land's end primitive man in africa is found in the interior jungles and down at land's end in south africa the pygmy people in the jungles represent to-day a small survival from the past but a survival of curious interest pushed aside by the torrent of conquest also pushed on by these waves of bantu conquest move the ancient abatwa or bushmen they are small in stature yellow in colour with crisp curled hair the traditions of the bushmen say that they came southward from the regions of the great lakes and indeed the king and queen of punt as depicted by the egyptians were bushmen or hottentots their tribes may be divided in accordance with their noticeable artistic talents into the painters and the sculptors the sculptors entered south africa by moving southward through the more central portions of the country crossing the zambezi and coming down to the cape the painters on the other hand came through demaraland on the west coast when they came to the great mountain regions they turned eastward and can be traced as far as the mountains opposite delagoa bay the mass of them settled down in the lower part of the cape and in the kalahari desert the painters were true cave dwellers but the sculptors lived in large communities on the stony hills which they marked with their carvings these bushmen believed in an ancient race of people who preceded them in south africa they attributed magic power to these unknown folk and said that some of them had been translated as stars to the sky before their groups were dispersed the bushmen had regular government tribes with their chiefs occupied well-defined tracts of country and were subdivided into branch tribes under subsidiary chiefs the great cave represented the dignity and glory of the entire tribe the bushmen suffered most cruelly in the succeeding migrations and conquests of south africa they fought desperately in self-defence they saw their women and children carried into bondage and they themselves hunted like wild beasts both savage and civilized men appropriated their land still they were brave people in this struggle for existence their bitterest enemies of whatever shade of color they might be were forced to make an unqualified acknowledgment of the courage and daring they so invariably exhibited here to a remote corner of the world where as one of their numbers said they had supposed that the only beings in the world were bushmen and lions came a series of invaders it was the outer ripples of civilization starting far away the indigenous and external civilizations of africa beating with great impulse among the ethiopians and the egyptian mulattoes and sudanese negroes and yorubans and driving the bantu race southward the bantus crowded more and more upon the primitive bushmen and probably a mingling of the bushmen and the bantus gave rise to the hottentots the hottentots or as they called themselves koi coin men of men were physically a stronger race than the abatwa and gave many evidences of degeneration from a high culture especially in the phenomenal perfection of a language which is so highly developed both in its rich phonetic system as represented by a very delicately graduated series of vowels and diphthongs and in its varied grammatical structure that lepsius sought for its affinities in the egyptian at the other end of the continent when south africa was first discovered there were two distinct types of hottentot the more savage hottentots were simply large strong bushmen using weapons superior to the bushmen without domestic cattle or sheep other tribes nearer the centre of south africa were handsomer in appearance and raised an egyptian breed of cattle which they rode 
in general the hottentots were yellow with close curled hair high cheekbones and somewhat oblique eyes their migration commenced about the end of the fourteenth century and was as is usual in such cases a scattered straggling movement the traditions of the hottentots point to the lake country of central africa as their place of origin whence they were driven by the Bukuwana tribes of the bantu they fled westward to the ocean and then turned south and came upon the bushmen whom they had only partially subdued when the dutch arrived as settlers in sixteen fifty two the dutch boers began by purchasing land from the hottentots and then as they grew more powerful they dispossessed the dark men and tried to enslave them there grew up a large dutch hottentot class indeed the filtration of negro blood noticeable in modern boers accounts for much curious history soon after the advent of the dutch some of the hottentots of whom there were not more than thirty or forty thousand led by the korana clans began slowly to retreat northward followed by the invading dutch and fighting the dutch each other and the wretched bushmen in the latter part of the eighteenth century the hottentots had reached the great interior plain and met the oncoming outposts of the bantu nations the bechuana whom the hottentots first met were the most advanced of the negro tribes of central africa they had crossed the zambezi in the fourteenth or fifteenth century their government was a sort of feudal system with hereditary chiefs and vassals they were careful agriculturalists laid out large towns with great regularity and were the most skilled of smiths they used stone in building carved on wood and many of them too were keen traders these tribes coming southward occupied the east central part of south of africa comprising modern bakualnalan apparently they had started from the central lake country somewhere late in the fifteenth century and by the middle of the eighteenth century one of their great chiefs tau met the oncoming hottentots the hottentots compelled tau to retreat but the mulatto Griquas, arrived from the south allying themselves with the bukwana stopped the rout the griquas sprang from and took their name from an old hottentot tribe they were led by cock and barens and by adding other elements they became partly through their own efforts and partly through the efforts of the missionaries a community of fairly well civilized people in greek while land west the mulatto griquas under their chiefs cock and water bore lived until the discovery of diamonds the Griquas and bequana tribes were thus gradually checking the hottentots when in the third nineteenth century there came two new developments first the english took possession of cape colony and the dutch began to move in larger numbers toward the interior secondly a newer and fiercer element of the bantu tribes the zulu kafirs appeared the kafirs or as they called themselves the amazosis claimed descent from zuida a great chief of the fifteenth century in the lake country they are among the tallest people in the world averaging five feet ten inches and are slim well proportioned and muscular the more warlike tribes were usually clothed in leopard or ox skins cattle formed their chief wealth stock breeding and hunting and fighting their main pursuits mentally they were men of tact and intelligence with a national religion based upon ancestor worship while their government was a patriarchal monarchy limited by an aristocracy and almost feudal in character the common law which had grown up from the decisions of the chiefs made the head of the family responsible for the conduct of its branches a village for all its residents and the clan for all its villages finally there was a paramount chief who was the civil and military father of his people these people laid waste to the coast regions and in seventeen seventy nine came in contact with the dutch a series of dutch kaffir wars ensued between seventeen seventy nine and seventeen ninety five in which the dutch were hard pressed in eighteen o six the english took final possession of cape colony at that time there were twenty five thousand boers twenty five thousand pure and mixed hottentots and twenty five thousand slaves secured from the east coast between eighteen eleven and eighteen seventy seven there were six kaffir english wars one of these in eighteen eighteen grew out of the ignorant interference of the english with the kaffir tribal system then there came a terrible war between eighteen thirty four and eighteen thirty five followed by the annexation of all the country as far as the kai river the war of the axe eighteen forty six to forty eight led to further annexation by the british hostilities broke out again in eighteen fifty six and eighteen sixty three in the former year despairing of resistance to invading england a prophet arose who advised the wholesale destruction of all kaffir property except weapons in order that this faith might bring back their dead heroes 
the result was that almost a third of the nation perished from hunger fresh troubles occurred in eighteen seventy seven when the amazosa confederacy was finally broken up and to-day gradually these tribes are passing from independence to a state of mild vassalage to the british meantime the more formidable part of the zulu kaffirs had been united under the terrible chief chaka he had organized a military system not a new one by any means but one of which we hear rumors back in the lake regions in the fourteenth and fifteenth centuries macdonald says there has probably never been a more perfect system of discipline than that by which chaka ruled his army and kingdom at a review an order might be given in the most unexpected manner which meant death to hundreds if the regiment hesitated or dared to remonstrate so perfect was the discipline and so great the jealousy that another was ready to cut them down a warrior returning from battle without his arms was put to death without trial a general returning unsuccessful in the main purpose of his expedition shared the same fate whoever displeased the king was immediately executed the traditional courts practically ceased to exist so far as the will and action of the tyrant was concerned with this army chaka fell on tribe after tribe the Bakuana fled before him and some tribes of them were entirely destroyed the hottentots suffered severely and one of his rival zulu tribes under umsilikatsi fled into matabeleland pushing back the bukuana by the time the english came to port natal chaka was ruling over the whole southeastern seaboard from the limpopo river to cape colony including the orange and transvaal states and the whole of natal chaka was killed in eighteen twenty eight and was eventually succeeded by his brother dingan who reigned twelve years it was during dingan's reign that england tried to abolish slavery in cape colony but did not pay promptly for the slaves as she had promised the result was the so-called great trek about eighteen thirty four when thousands of boers went into the interior across the orange and val rivers dingan and these boers were soon engaged in a death struggle in which the zulus were repulsed and dingan replaced by panda under this chief there was something like repose for sixteen years but in eighteen fifty six civil war broke out between his sons one of whom setaweo succeeded his father in eighteen eighty two he fell into border disputes with the english and the result was one of the fiercest clashes of europe and africa in modern days the zulus fought desperately annihilating at one time a whole detachment and killing the young prince napoleon but after all it was assagais against machine guns and the zulus were finally defeated at ulundi july fourth eighteen seventy nine thereupon zululand was divided among thirteen semi-independent chiefs and became a british protectorate since then the best lands have been gradually reoccupied by a large number of tribes kaffirs from the south and zulus from the north the tribal organization without being actually broken up has been deprived of its dangerous features by appointing paid village headmen and transforming the hereditary chief into a british government official in natal there are about one hundred and seventy tribal chiefs and nearly half of these have been appointed by the governor um who had been driven into matabilaland by the terrible chaka in eighteen twenty eight and defeated by the dutch in eighteen thirty seven had finally re-established his headquarters in rhodesia in eighteen thirty eight here he introduced the zulu military system and terrorized the peaceful and industrious bekuana populations lobengula succeeded umsilikatsi in eighteen seventy and realizing that his power was waning began to retreat northward toward the zambezi he was finally defeated by the british and native forces in eighteen ninety three and the land was incorporated into south central africa the result of all these movements was to break the inhabitants of bekuana land into numerous fragments there were small numbers of mulatto Greeks in the southwest and similar bastards in the northwest the hottentots and bushmen were dispersed into groups and seemed doomed to extinction the last hottentot chief being deposed in eighteen ten and replaced by an english magistrate partially civilized hottentots still lived grouped together in their quails and are members of christian churches the bekuana hold their own in several centers one is in basutaland west of natal where a number of tribes were welded together under the far-sided moshes into a modern fairly well-civilized nation in the north part of bekuana land are the self-governing bamangawato and the Batwana, the former ruled by kama one of the canis of modern rulers in africa
meantime in portuguese territory south of the zambezi there arose gaza a contemporary and rival of chaka his son manicus was deputed by dingan chaka's successor to drive out the portuguese this manicus failed to do and to escape vengeance he migrated north of the limpopo here he established his military cradle in a district thirty six hundred and fifty feet above the sea and one hundred and twenty miles inland from Safala from this place his soldiery nearly succeeded in driving the portuguese out of east africa he was succeeded by his son umzilla and umzilla's brother gazana better known as gungunyana who exercised for a time joint authority gungunyana was finally overthrown in november eighteen ninety five captured and removed to the azores north of the zambezi in british territory the chief role in recent times has been played by the bukowana the first of the bantu to return northward after the south african migration livingstone found there the makolo who with other tribes had moved northward on account of the pressure of the dutch and zulus below and by conquering various tribes in the zambezi region had established a strong power this kingdom was nearly overthrown by the rebellion of the Barotse, and in eighteen seventy five the Barotse kingdom comprised a large territory to-day their king lawanika rules directly and indirectly fifty thousand square miles with a population between one and two and a half million they are under a protectorate of the british in southwest africa hottentot mulattoes crossing from the cape caused widespread change they were strong men and daring fighters and soon became dominant in what is now german southwest africa where they fought fiercely with the band to over heroes armed with firearms these namaqua hottentots threatened portuguese west africa but germany intervened ostensibly to protect missionaries by spending millions of dollars and thousands of soldiers germany has nearly exterminated these brave men thus we have between the years fourteen hundred and nineteen hundred a great period of migration up to seventeen fifty when bushmen hottentot bantu and dutch appeared in succession at land's end the, in the latter part of the eighteenth century we have the clash of the hottentots and bekawana followed in the nineteenth century by the terrible wars of chaka the kaffirs and matabili finally in the latter half of the nineteenth century we see the gradual subjection of the kaffir zulus and the bekawana under the english and the final conquest of the dutch the resulting racial problem in south africa is one of great intricacy to the racial problem has been added the tremendous problem of modern capital brought by the discovery of gold and diamond mines so that the future of the negro race is peculiarly bound up in developments here at land's end where the ship of the flying dutchman beats back and forth on its endless quest End of chapter seven chapter eight part one of the negro by w e b du bois this librivox recording is in the public domain african culture we have followed the history of mankind in africa down the valley of the nile past ethiopia to egypt we have seen kingdoms arise along the great bend of the niger and strive with the ancient culture at its mouth we have seen the remnants of mankind at land's end the ancient culture at punt and zimbabwe and followed the invading bantu east south and west to their greatest centre in the vast jungle of the congo valleys we must now gather these threads together and ask what manner of men these were and how far and in what way they progressed on the road of human culture that negro peoples were the beginners of civilization along the ganges the euphrates and the nile seems proven early babylon was founded by a negroid race hammurabi's code the most ancient known says anna and bell called me hammurabi the exalted prince the worshipper of the gods to cause justice to prevail in the land to destroy the wicked to prevent the strong from oppressing the weak to go forth like the sun over the black head race to enlighten the land and to further the welfare of the people the Assyrians show a distinct Negroid strain, and early Egypt was predominantly Negro. These earliest of cultures were crude and primitive, but they represented the highest attainment of mankind after tens of thousands of years in unawakened savagery. 
it has often been assumed that the negro is physically inferior to other races and markedly distinguishable from them modern science gives no authority for such an assumption the supposed inferiority cannot rest on color for that is due to the combined influences of a great number of factors of environment working through physiological processes and however marked the contrast may be there is no corresponding difference in anatomical structure discoverable so too difference in texture of hair is a matter of degree not kind and is caused by heat moisture exposure and the like the bony skeleton presents no distinctly racial lines of variation prognathism presents too many individual varieties to be taken as a distinctive character of race difference in physical measurements does not show the negro to be a more primitive evolutionary form comparative ethnology to-day affords no support to the view which sees in the so-called lower races of mankind a transition stage from beast to man much has been made of the supposed smaller brain of the negro race but this is as yet an unproved assumption based on the uncritical measurement of less than a thousand negro brains as compared with eleven thousand or more european brains even if future measurement prove the average negro brain lighter the vast majority of negro brain weights fall within the same limits as the whites and finally neither size nor weight of the brain seems to be of importance as an index of mental capacity we may therefore say with ratzel there is only one species of man the variations are numerous but do not go deep to this we may add the word of the secretary of the first races congress we are then under the necessity of concluding that an impartial investigator would be inclined to look upon the various important peoples of the world as to all intents and purposes essentially equal in intellect enterprise morality and physique if these conclusions are true we should expect to see in africa the human drama play itself out much as in other lands and such has actually been the fact at the same time we must expect peculiarities arising from the physiography of the land its climate its rainfall its deserts and the peculiar inaccessibility of the coast three principal zones of habitation appear first the steppes and deserts around the sahara in the north and the kalahari desert in the south secondly the grassy highlands bordering the great lakes and connecting these two regions thirdly the forests and rivers of central and west africa in the deserts are the nomads and the pygmies are in the forest fastnesses herdsmen and their cattle cover the steppes and highlands save where the tsetse fly prevents in the open forests and grassy highland are the agriculturalists among the forest farmers the village is the centre of life while in the open steppes political life tends to spread into larger political units political integration is however hindered by an ease of internal communication almost as great as the difficulty of reaching outer worlds beyond the continent the narrow nile valley alone presented physical barriers formidable enough to keep back the invading barbarians of the south and even then with difficulty elsewhere communication was all too easy for a while the congo force fended away the restless but this only temporarily on the whole africa from the sahara to the cape offered no great physical barrier to the invader and we continually have whirlwinds of invading hosts rushing now southward now northward from the interior to the coast and from the coast inland and hurling their force against states kingdoms and cities some resisted for generations some for centuries some but a few years it is then this sudden change and the fear of it that marks african culture particularly in its political aspects and which makes it so difficult to trace this changing past nevertheless beneath all change rests the strong substructure of custom religion industry and art well worth the attention of students starting with agriculture we learn that among all the great groups of the natural races the negroes are the best and keenest tillers of the ground a minority despise agriculture and breed cattle many combine both occupations among the genuine tillers the whole life of the family is taken up in agriculture and hence months are by preference called after the operations which they demand constant clearings change forest to fields 
and the ground is manured with the ashes of the burnt thicket in the middle of the fields rise the light watch-towers from which a watchman scares grain-eating birds and other thieves an african cultivated landscape is incomplete without barns the rapidity with which when newly imported the most various forms of cultivation spread in africa says much for the attention which is devoted to this branch of economy industries again which may be called agricultural like the preparation of meal from millet and other crops also from cassava the fabrication of fermented drinks from grain or the manufacture of cotton are widely known and sedulously fostered Bootcher reminds us of the deep impression made upon travellers when they sight suddenly the well-attended fields of the natives on emerging from the primeval forests in the more thickly populated parts of africa these fields often stretch for many a mile and the assiduous care of the negro women shines in all the brighter light when we consider the insecurity of life the constant feuds and pillages in which no one knows whether he will in the end be able to harvest what he has sown livingstone gives somewhere a graphic description of the devastations wrought by slave hunts the people were lying about slain the dwellings were demolished in the fields however the grain was ripening and there was none to harvest it sheep goat and chickens are domestic animals all over africa and von franzius considers africa the home of the house cattle and the negro as the original tamer northeastern africa especially is noted for agriculture cattle raising and fruit culture in the eastern Sudan, and among the great Bantu tribes extending from the Sudan down toward the south, cattle are evidences of wealth, one tribe, for instance, having so many oxen that each village had ten or twelve thousand head. Lentz, 1884, Bue, William, Mez, 1848, Heckard, 1854, Bosman, 1805, and Baker, 1868, all bear witness to this and Svein Firth, 1878, tells us of great cattle parks with two to three thousand head, and of numerous agricultural and cattle-raising tribes. Von der Decken, 1859-61, described the paradise of the dwellers about Kilimanjaro. The bananas, fruits, beans and peas, cattle raising with stall feed, the fertilizing of the fields, and irrigation the negroid gallus have seven or eight cattle to each inhabitant livingstone bears witness to the busy cattle raising of the bantus and kaffirs hulub eighteen eighty one and chapman eighteen sixty eight tell of agriculture and fruit raising in south africa shut eighteen eighty four found the tribes in the southwestern basin of the congo with sheep swine goats and cattle on this agricultural and cattle-raising economic foundation has arisen the organized industry of the artisan the trader and the manufacturer while the pygmies still living in the age of wood make no iron or stone implements they seem to know how to make bark cloth and fibre baskets and simple outfits for hunting and fishing among the bushmen the art of making weapons and working in hides is quite common the hottentots are further advanced in the industrial arts being well versed in the manufacture of clothing weapons and utensils in the dressing of skins and furs as well as in the plaiting of cords and the weaving of mats we find evidences of their workmanship in addition they are good workers in iron and copper using the sheepskin bellows for this purpose the ashantis of the gold coast know how to make cotton fabrics turning glaze earthenware forge iron fabricate instruments and arms embroider rugs and carpets and set gold and precious stones among the people of the banana zone we find rough basket work coarse pottery grass cloth and spoons made of wood and ivory the people of the millet zone because of uncertain agricultural resources quite generally turn to manufacturing charcoal is prepared by the smiths iron is smelted and numerous implements are manufactured among them we find axes hatchets hoes knives nails scythes and other hardware cloaks shoes sandals shields and water and oil vessels are made from leather which the natives have dressed soap is manufactured in the bauchi district glasses made formed and colored by the people of nupaland and in almost every city cotton is spun and woven and dyed barth tells us that the weaving of cotton was known in the sudan as early as the eleventh century there is also extensive manufacture of woodenware tools implements and utensils 
in describing particular tribes baker and falcon tell of smiths of wonderful adroitness goatskins prepared better than a european tanner could do drinking cups and kegs of remarkable symmetry and polished clay floors schweinfurt says the arrow and the spear heads are of the finest and most artistic work their bristle-like barbs and points are baffling when one knows how few tools these smiths have excellent wood carving is found among the bongo ovambo and makololo pottery and basketry and careful hut building distinguish many tribes cameron eighteen seventy seven tells of villages so clean with huts so artistic that save in book knowledge the people occupied no lone plain of civilization the mangbatu worked both iron and copper the masterpieces of the mambuto mangbatu smiths are the fine chains worn as ornaments and which in perfection of form and fineness compare well with our best steel chains Shu boats in 1911 called the Mangbetu, a highly cultivated people in architecture and handicraft. Barth found copper exported from Central Africa in competition with European copper at Kano. Nor is the iron industry confined to the Sudan. About the Great Lakes and other parts of Central Africa, it is widely distributed. Thornton says this iron industry proves that the East Africans stand by no means on so low a plane of culture as many travelers would have us think. It is unnecessary to be reminded what a people without instruction and with the rudest tools to do such skilled work could do if furnished with steel tools. Arrows made east of Lake Nyanza were found to be nearly as good as the best swedish iron in birmingham from egypt to cape livingstone assures us that the mortar and pestle the long-handled axe the goatskin bellows etc have the same form size etc pointing to a migration southwestward holub eighteen seventy nine on the zambezi found fine workers in iron and bronze the bantu huts contained spoons wooden dishes milk pails calabashes handmills and axes kaffirs and zulus in the extreme south are good smiths and the latter melt copper and tin together and draw wire from it according to grants eighteen eighty west of the great lakes stanley eighteen seventy eight found wonderful examples of smith work figures worked out of brass and much work in copper cameron eighteen seventy eight saw vases made near lake tanganyika which reminded him of the amphorae in the villa of diomedes pompey horn eighteen eighty two praises tribes here for iron and copper work livingstone eighteen seventy one passed thirty smelting houses on one journey and cameron came across bellows with valves and tribes who used knives in eating he found tribes which no europeans had ever visited who made ingots of copper in the form of the st andrew's cross which circulated even to the coast in the southern congo basin iron and copper are worked also wood and ivory carving and pottery making are pursued in equatorial west africa lentz and du chailu eighteen sixty one found iron workers with charcoal and also carvers of bone and ivory near cape lopez huba schleiden found tribes making ivory needles inlaid with ebony while the arms and dishes of the osaka are found among many tribes even as far as the atlantic ocean wilson eighteen fifty six found natives in west africa who could repair american watches gold coast negroes make gold rings and chains forming the metal into all kinds of forms so yo says the works in relief which natives of lower guinea carve with their own knives out of ivory and hippopotamus teeth are really entitled to be called works of art and many wooden figures of fetishes in the ethnological museum of berlin show some understanding of the proportions of the human body great bassam is called by heckart the fatherland of smiths the mandingo in the north west are remarkable workers in iron silver and gold we are told by mungo park eighteen hundred while there is a mass of testimony as to the work in the northwest of africa in gold tin weaving and dyeing kaya found the negroes in bambana manufacturing gunpowder eighteen twenty four to twenty eight and the house of make soap so too negroes in uganda and other parts have made guns after seeing european models so marked has been the work of negro artisans and traders in the manufacture and exchange of iron implements that a growing number of archaeologists are disposed to-day to consider the negro as the originator of the art of smelting iron gabriel de mortier 
eighteen eighty three declared negroes the only iron users among primitive people some would therefore argue that the negro learned it from other folk but andre declares that the negro developed his own iron kingdom schweinfurth von lucien boaz and others inclined to the belief that the negroes invented the smelting of iron and passed it on to the egyptians and to modern europe boaz says it seems likely at a time when the european was still satisfied with rude stone tools the african had invented or adopted the art of smelting iron consider for a moment what this invention has meant for the advance of the human race as long as the hammer knife saw drill the spade and the hoe had to be chipped out of stone or had to be made of shell or hardwood effective industrial work was not impossible but difficult a great progress was made when copper found in large nuggets was hammered out into tools and later on shaped by smelting and when bronze was introduced but the true advancement of industrial life did not begin until the hard iron was discovered it seems not unlikely that the people who made the marvellous discovery of reducing iron ores by smelting were the african negroes neither ancient europe nor ancient western asia nor ancient china knew the iron and everything points to its introduction from africa at the time of the great Amer african discoveries toward the end of the past century the trade of the blacksmith was found all over africa from north to south and from east to west with his simple bellows and charcoal fire he reduced the ore that is found in many parts of the continent and forged implements of great usefulness and beauty Torday has argued recently i feel convinced by certain arguments that seem to prove to my satisfaction that we are indebted to the negro for the very keystone of our modern civilization and that we owe him the discovery of iron that iron could be discovered by accident in africa seems beyond doubt if this is so in other parts of the world i am not competent to say i will only remind you that schweinfurth and petherick record the fact that in the northern part of east africa smelting furnaces are worked without artificial air current and on the other hand stuhlmann and kohlmann found near victoria i answer that the natives simply mixed powdered or with charcoal and by introduction of air currents obtained the metal these simple processes make it simple that iron should have been discovered in east or central africa no bronze implements have ever been found in black africa had the africans received from iron from the egyptians bronze would have preceded this metal and all traces of it would not have disappeared black africa was for a long time an exporter of iron and even in the twelfth century exports to india and java are recorded by idrisi it is difficult to imagine that Egypt should have obtained it from Europe, where the oldest find in Halstead cannot be of an earlier period than 800 B.C., or from Asia, where iron is not known before 1000 B.C., and where in the times of Ashur Nazir Paul it was still used concurrently with bronze, while iron beads have been only recently discovered by Messrs. G. A. Wainwright and Bush Fox in a pre-dynastic grave, and where a piece of this metal, possibly a tool, was found in the masonry of the great pyramid the negro is a born trader length says our sharpest european merchants even jews and armenians can learn much of the cunning and trade of the negroes we know that the trade between central africa and egypt was in the hands of negroes for thousands of years and in early days the cities of the sudan and north africa grew rich through negro trade leo africanus writing of timbuktu in the sixteenth century said it is a wonder to see what plenty of merchandise is daily brought hither and how costly and sumptuous all things be here are many shops of artificers and merchants and especially of such as weave linen and cloth long before cotton weaving was a british industry west africa and the sudan were supplying a large part of the world with cotton cloth even to-day cities like kuka on the west shore of lake chad and sakota are manufacturing centers where cotton is spun and woven skins tanned and implements and iron ornaments made travellers says boucher have often observed this tribal or local development of industrial technique the native villages relates our belgium observer of the lower congo are often situated in groups their activities are based upon reciprocality 
and they are to a certain extent the complements of one another each group has its more or less strongly defined specialty one carries on fishing another produces palm wine a third devotes itself to trade and is its broker for the others supplying the community with all products from outside another has reserved to itself work in iron and copper making weapons for war and hunting various utensils etc none may however pass beyond the sphere of its own specialty without exposing itself to the risk of being universally proscribed from the loango coast bastion tells of a great number of centres for special products of domestic industry loango excels in mats and fishing baskets while the carving of elephants tusks is especially followed in chilango the so-called mafuka hats with raised patterns are drawn chiefly from the bordering country of kakongo and mayumi in bakanya are made potter's wares which are in great demand in basanza excellent swords in basundi especially beautiful ornamented copper rings on the congo clever wood and tablet carvings in loango ornamented clothes and intricately designed mats in mayumbi clothing of finely woven mat work in kakongo embroidered hats and also burnt clay pitchers and among the bayakas and mantiches stuffs of woven grass a native negro student tells of the development of trade among the ashanti it was a part of the state system of ashanti to encourage trade the king once in every forty days at the adai custom distributed among a number of chiefs various sums of gold dust with the charge to turn the same to good account these chiefs then sent down to the coast caravans of tradesmen some of whom would be their slaves sometimes some or two or three hundred strong to barter ivory for european goods or buy such goods with gold dust which the king obtained from the royal alluvial workings down to eighteen seventy three a constant stream of ashanti traders might be seen daily wending their way to the merchants of the coast and back again yielding more certain wealth and prosperity to the merchants of the gold coast and great britain than may be expected for some time yet to come from the mining industry and railway development put together the trade chiefs would in due time render a faithful account to the king's stewards being allowed to retain a fair portion of the profit in the king's household too he would have special men who directly traded for him important chiefs carried on the same system of trading with the coast as did the king thus every member of the state from the king downward took an active interest in the promotion of trade and in the keeping open of trade routes into the interior the trade thus encouraged and carried on in various parts of west africa reached wide areas from the fish river to kuka and from lagos to zanzibar the markets have become great centres of trade the leading implement to civilization permanent markets are found in places like ujiji and nuangui where everything can be bought and sold from earthenware to wives from the one to three thousand traders flock here how like is the market traffic with all its uproar and sound of human voices to one of our own markets there is the same rivalry in praising the goods the violent brisk movements the expressive gesture the inquiring searching glance the changing looks of depreciation or triumph of apprehension delight approbation so says stanley trade customs are not everywhere alike if when negotiating with the bengalas of angola you do not quickly give them what they want they go away and do not come back then perhaps they try to get possession of the coveted object by means of theft it is otherwise with the sangos and kaiokos who let you deal with them in the usual way to buy even a small article you must go to the market people avoid trading anywhere else if a man says to another sell me this hen or that fruit the answer as a rule will be come to the market-place the crowd gives confidence to individuals and the inviolability of the visitor to the market and of the market itself looks like an idea of justice consecrated by long practice does not this remind us of the old germanic market-place turning now to negro family and social life we find as among all primitive peoples polygamy and marriage by actual or simulated purchase out of the family develops the typical african village organization which is thus described in ashanti by a native gold coast writer the headman as his name implies is the head of a village community a ward in a township or of a family his position is important inasmuch as he is directly to deal with the composite elements of the general bulk of the people it is the duty of the head of a family to bring up the members thereof in the way they should go and by family you must understand the entire lineal descendants of a matter 
familius if i may coin a convenient phrase it is expected to him by the state to bring up his charge in the knowledge of matters political and traditional it is his work to train up his wards in the ways of loyalty and obedience to the powers that be he is held responsible for the freaks of recalcitrant members of his family and he has looked to to keep them within bounds and to insist upon conformity of their party with the customs laws and traditional observances of the community in early times he could send off to exile by sail a troublesome relative who would not observe the laws of the community it is a difficult task that he is set to but in this matter he has all powerful helpers in the female members of the family who will be either the aunts or the sisters or the cousins or the nieces of the head man and as their interests are identical with his in every particular the good women spontaneously train up their children to implicit obedience to the head man whose rule in the family thus becomes a simple and an easy matter what a power for good in the native state system would the mothers of the gold coast and ashanti become by judicious training upon native lines End of chapter eight part one chapter eight part two of the negro by w e b du bois this librivox recording is in the public domain african culture the headman is par excellence the judge of his family reward not only is he called upon to settle domestic squabbles but frequently he sits judge over more serious matters arising between one member of the ward and another and where he is a man of ability and influence men from other wards bring him their disputes to settle when he so settles disputes he is entitled to a hearing fee which however is not so much as would be payable in the regular court of the king or chief the headman is naturally an important member of his company and often is a captain thereof when he combines the two offices of headman and captain he renders to the community a very important service for in times of war where the members of the ward would not serve cordially under a stranger they would in all cases face any danger with their own kinsmen as their leader the headman is always succeeded by his uterine brother cousin or nephew the line of succession that is to say following the customary law we may contrast this picture with the more warlike bantus of southeast africa each tribe lived by itself in a town with from five to fifteen thousand inhabitants surrounded by gardens of millet beads and watermelon beyond these roamed their cattle sheep and goats their religion was ancestor worship with sacrifice to spirits and the dead and some of the tribes made mummies of the corpses and clothed them for burial they wove cloth of cotton and bark they carved wood and built walls of unhewn stone they had a standing military organization and the tribes had their various totems so that they were known as the men of iron the men of the sun the men of the serpents sons of the corn cleaners and the like their system of common law was well conceived and there were organized tribunals of justice in difficult cases precedents were sought and learned antiquaries consulted at the age of fifteen or sixteen the boys were circumcised and formed into guilds the land was owned by the tribe and apportioned to the chief by each family and the main wealth of the tribe was in its cattle in general among the african clans the idea of private property was but imperfectly developed and never included land the main mass of visible wealth belonged to the family and clan rather than to the individual only in the matter of weapons and ornaments was exclusive private ownership generally recognized the government vested in fathers and chiefs varied in different tribes from absolute despotisms to limited monarchies almost republican viewing the basuta a national assembly in south africa lord bryce recently wrote the resemblance to the primary assemblies of the early peoples of europe is close enough to add another to the arguments which discredit the theory that there is any such thing as an aryan type of institutions while women are sold into marriage throughout africa nevertheless their status is far removed from slavery in the first place the tracing of relationships through the female line which is all but universal in africa gives the mother great influence parental affection is very strong and throughout negro africa the mother is the most influential counsellor even in cases of tyrants like chaka or mutesa no mother can love more tenderly or be more deeply beloved than the negro mother robin tells of a slave in martinique who with his savings freed his mother instead of himself 
everywhere in africa writes mungo park i have noticed that no greater affront can be offered a negro than insulting his mother strike me cried a mandingo to his enemy but revile not my mother the hero row swears by my mother's tears the angola negroes have a saying as a mist lingers on the swamps so lingers the love of father and mother black queens have often ruled african tribes among the balolo we are told women take part in public assemblies where all important questions are discussed the system of educating children among such tribes as the yoruba is worthy of emulation by many more civilized peoples close-knit with the family and social organization comes the religious life of the negro the religion of africa is the universal animism or fetishism of primitive peoples rising to polytheism and approaching monotheism chiefly but not wholly as a result of christian and islamic missions of fetishism there is much misapprehension it is not mere senseless degradation it is a philosophy of life among primitive negroes there can be as miss kingsley reminds us no such divorce of religion from practical life as is common in civilized lands religion is life and fetish an expression of the practical recognition of dominant forces in which the negro lives to him all the world is spirit miss kingsley says if you want for example to understand the position of man in nature according to fetish there is as far as i know no clearer statement of it made than in is made by goethe in his superb prometheus fetish is a severely logical way of accounting for the world in terms of good and malignant spirits it is this power of being able logically to account for everything that is i believe at the back of the tremendous permanency of fetish in africa and the cause of many other relapses into it by africans converted to other religions it is also the explanation of the fact that white men who live in the districts where death and danger of everyday affairs under a grim pall of boredom are liable to believe in fetish though ashamed of so doing for the african whose mind has been soaked in fetish during his early and most impressionable years the voice of fetish is almost irresistible when affliction comes to him ellis tells us of the spirit belief of the you people who believe that men and all nature have the indwelling craw which is immortal that the man himself after death may exist as a ghost which is often conceived of as departed from the craw a shadowy continuing of the man bryce speaking of the kaffirs of south africa says to the kaffirs as to the most savage races the world was full of spirits spirits of the rivers the mountains and the woods most important were the ghosts of the dead who had power to injure or help the living and who were therefore propitiated by offerings at stated periods as well as on occasions when their aid was especially desired this kind of worship the worship once more once most generally diffused throughout the world and which held its ground among the greeks the greeks and italians in the most flourishing period of ancient civilization as it does in china and japan to-day was and is virtually the religion of the kaffirs african religion does not however stop with fetish but as in the case of other peoples tends toward polytheism and monotheism among the yoruba for instance frobenius shows that religion and city-state go hand in hand the first experienced glance will here detect the fact that this nation originally possessed a clear and definite organization so duly ordered and so logical that we but seldom meet with its like among all the peoples of the earth and the basic idea of every clan's progeniture is a powerful god legitimate order in which the descendants of a particular clan unite in marriage and to found new families the essential origin of every newborn babe's descent in the founder of its race and its consideration as a part of the god in chief the security with which the newly wedded wife not only may but should minister to her own god in an unfamiliar home the yoruba have a legend of a dying divinity this people give evidence of a generalized system a theocratic scheme a well-conceived perceptible organization reared in rhythmically proportioned manner miss kingsley says the african has a great over-god nassau the missionary declares after more than forty years residence among these tribes fluently using their language conversant with their customs dwelling intimately in their huts associating with them in the various relations of teacher pastor friend master fellow-traveller and guest and in my special office as missionary searching after their religious thought and therefore being allowed a deeper entrance into the arcana of their soul than would be accorded to a passing explorer i am able unhesitatingly to say that among all the multitude of degraded ones with whom i have met i have seen or heard of none whose religious thought was only a superstition 
standing in the village street surrounded by a company whom their chief has courteously summoned at my request when i say to him i have come to speak to your people i do not need to begin by telling them that there is a god looking on that motley assemblage of villagers the bold gaunt cannibal with his armament of gun spear and dagger the artisan with rude adze in hand or hands sword at the antique bellows of the village smithy women who have hasted from their kitchen fire with hands white with the manioc dough or still grasping the partly scaled fish and children checked in their play with tiny bow and arrow or startled from their dusty street pursuit of dog or goat i have yet to be asked who is god the basis of egyptian religion was of a purely nigritian character and in its developed form sudanese tribal gods were invoked and venerated by the priests in upper egypt near the confines of ethiopia paintings repeatedly represent black priests conferring on red egyptian priests the instruments and symbols of priesthood in the sudan to-day frobenius distinguishes four principal religions first earthly ancestor worship next the social cosmogony of the atlantic races third the religion of the bori and fourth islam the bori religion spreads from nubia as far as the hausa and from lake chad in the niger as far as the yoruba it is the religion of possession and has been connected by some with asiatic influences from without have come two great religious influences islam and christianity islam came by conquest trade and proselytism as a conqueror it reached egyptian in the seventh century and had by the end of the fourteenth century firm footing in the egyptian sudan it overran the central sudan by the close of the seventeenth century and at the beginning of the nineteenth century had swept over Sena, gambia and the whole valley of the niger down to the gulf of guinea on the east islam approached as a trader in the eighth century it spread into somaliland and overran nubia in the fourteenth century Today Islam dominates Africa north of 10 degrees north latitude and is strong between 5 and 10 degrees north latitude. In the east it reaches below the Victoria Nyanza. Christianity early entered Africa. Indeed, as Momsen says, it was through Africa that Christianity became the religion of the world. Tertullian and Cyprian were from Carthage, Arnobius from Sicca, Venaria, Lacantantius, and probably in like manner, Menexius felix in spite of their latin names were natives of africa and not less so augustine in africa the church found its most zealous confessors of the faith and its most gifted defenders the africa referred to here however was not negro land but africa above the desert where negro blood was represented in the ancient mediterranean race and by intercourse across the desert on the other hand christianity was early represented in the valley of the nile under the most holy pope and patriarch of the great city of alexandria and of all of the land of egypt of jerusalem the holy city of nubia Abyssinia, and pentapolis and all the preaching of st mark this patriarchate had a hundred bishoprics in the fourth century and included thousands of black christians through it the cross preceded the crescent in some of the remotest parts of black africa all these beginnings were gradually overthrown by islam except among the copts in egypt and in abyssinia the portuguese in the sixteenth century began to replant the christian religion and for a while had great success both on the east and west coasts roman catholic enterprise halted in the eighteenth century and the protestants began to-day the west coast is studied with english and german missions south africa is largely christian through french and english influence and the region about the great lakes is becoming christianized the roman catholics have lately increased their activities and above all the negroes of america have entered with their own churches and with the curiously significant ethiopian movement coming now to other spiritual aspects of the african culture we can speak at present only in fragmentary way roughly speaking africa can be divided into two language zones north of the fifth degree of north latitude is the zone of diversity with at least a hundred groups of widely divergent languages south of the line there is one minor language bushman hottentot spoken by less than fifty thousand people and elsewhere the predominant bantu tongue with its various dialects spoken by at least fifty million the bantu tongue which thus rules all central west and south africa is an agglutinative 
tongue which makes special use of prefixes the hundreds of negro tongues or dialects in the north represent most probably the result of war and migration and the breaking up of ancient centres of culture in abyssinia and the great horn of east africa the influence of semitic tongues is noted despite much effort on the part of students it has been impossible to show any asiatic origin for the egyptian language as sir G maintains everything favors an african origin the most brilliant suggestion of modern days link together the egyptian of north africa and the hottentot and bushman tongues of south africa language was reduced to writing among the egyptians and ethiopians and to some extent elsewhere in africa over one hundred manuscripts of ethiopian and ethiopic arabian literature are extant including a version of the bible and historical chronicles the arabic was used as the written tongue of the sudan and negro land has given us in this tongue many chronicles and other works of black authors the greatest of these the epic of the sudan tariq as sudan deserves to be placed among the classics of all literature in other parts of africa there was no written language but there was on the other hand an unusual perfection of oral tradition through bards and extraordinary efficiency in telegraphy by drum and horn the folklore and proverbs of the african tribes are exceedingly rich some of these have been made familiar to english writers through the work of uncle remus others have been collected by johnson ellison thiel a black bard of our own day has described the onslaught of the matabili in poetry of singular force and beauty they saw the clouds ascend from the plains it was the smoke of burning towns the confusion of the world wind was in the heart of the great chief of the blue-coloured cattle the shout was raised they are friends but they shouted again they are foes till their near approach proclaimed them matabili the men seized their arms and rushed out as if to chase the antelope the answer was as the voice of lightning and their javelins as the shaking of the forest in the autumn storm there can be no doubt of the negro's deep and delicate sense of beauty in form colour and sound soyo says of african industry whoever denies to them independent invention and individual taste in their work either shuts his eyes intentionally before perfectly evident facts or lack of knowledge renders him an incompetent judge m Berteau had lately told us how the negro race brought art and sculpture to prehistoric europe the bones of the european negroes are almost without exception found in company with drawings and sculpture in high and low relief some of their sculptures like the wellendorf venus are unusually well finished for primitive man so too the painting and carving of the bushmen and their forerunners in south africa has drawn the admiration of students the negro has been prolific in the invention of musical instruments and has given a new and original music to the western world Schweinfurth, who has preserved for us much of the industrial art of the negro speaks of their delight in the production of works of art for the embellishment and convenience of life frobenius expressed his astonishment at the originality of the african in the yoruba temple which he visited the lofty veranda was divided from the passageway by fantastically carved and coloured pillars on the pillars were sculptured knights men climbing trees women gods and mythical beings the dark chamber lined beyond showed a splendid red room with stone hatchets wooden figures cowrie beads and jars though a picture of the columns carved in colours in front of the coloured altar the old man sitting in the circle of those who reverenced him the open scaffolding of ninety rafters made a magnificent impression the germans have found in Camarin, towns built castellated and fortified in a manner that reminds one of the prehistoric cities of crete the buildings and fortifications of zimbabwe have already been described and something has been said of the art of benin with its brass and bronze and ivory all the work of benin in bronze and brass was executed by casting and by methods so complicated that it would be no easy task for a modern european craftsman to imitate them perhaps no race has shown in its earlier development a more magnificent art impulse than the negro and the student must not forget how far negro genius entered into the art in the valley of the nile from Aro and napata down to the great temples of egypt frobenius has recently directed the world's attention to art in west africa quartz and granite he found treated with great dexterity but more magnificent than the stone monument is the proof that at some remote era glass was made and moulded in yoruba land and that the people here 
were brilliant in the production of terracotta images the great mass of potsherds lumps of glass heaps of slag etc proves at all events that the glass industry flourished in this locality in ages past it is plain that the glass beads found to have been so very common in africa were not only not imported but were actually manufactured in great quantities at home the terracotta pieces are remains of another ancient and fine type of art and were eloquent of a symmetry a vitality a delicacy of form and practically a reminiscence of the ancient greeks the antique bronze head frobenius describes as a head of marvellous beauty wonderfully cast and almost equal in beauty and at least no less noble in form and as ancient as the terracotta heads in a park of monuments frobenius saw the celebrated forge and hammer a mighty mass of iron like a falling drop in shape and a block of quartz fashioned like a drum frobenius thinks these were relics dating from past ages of culture and when the manipulation of quartz and granite was thoroughly understood and when iron manipulation gave evidence of a skill not met with to-day even when we contemplate such revolting survivals of savagery as cannibalism we cannot jump too quickly at conclusions cannibalism is spread over many parts of negro africa yet the very tribes who practice cannibalism show often other traits of industry and power these cannibal basanga were according to the types we met with one of those rare nations of the african interior which can be classed with the most aesthetic and skilled most discreet and intelligent of all those generally known to us as the so-called natural races before the arabic and european invasion they did not dwell in hamlets but in towns with twenty or thirty thousand inhabitants in towns whose highways were shaded by avenues of splendid palms planted at regular intervals and laid out with the symmetry of colonnades their pottery would be fertile in suggestion to every art craftsman in europe their weapons of iron were so perfectly fashioned that no industrial art from abroad could improve upon their workmanship the iron blades were cunningly ornamented with damas and copper and the hilts artistically inlaid with the same metal moreover they were most industrious and capable of husbandmen whose careful tillage of the suburbs them able competitors of any grand gardener in europe their sexual and parental relations evidenced an amount of tact and delicacy of feelings unsurpassed among ourselves either in the simplicity of the country or the refinements of the town originally their political and municipal system was organized on the lines of a representative republic true it is on record that these well-governed towns often waged an internecine warfare but in spite of this it had been their invariable custom from time immemorial even in times of strife to keep the trade routes open and to allow their own and foreign merchants to go their ways unharmed and the commerce of these nations ebbed and flowed along the road of an unknown age running from itimbiri to batu bengi about six hundred miles in length this highway was destroyed by the missionaries of civilization from arabia only toward the close of the eighteenth century but even in my own time there were still smiths who knew the names of places along that wonderful trade route which had driven through the heart of the impenetrable forests of the congo for every scrap of imported iron was carried over it in disposition the negro is among the most lovable of men practically all the great travellers who have spent any considerable time in africa testify to this and pay deep tribute to the kindness with which they were received one is but to remember the classic story of mungo park the strong expressions of livingstone the words of stanley and hundreds of others to realize this ceremony and courtesy mark negro life livingstone again and again reminds us of true african dignity when ill lefian men or women salute each other be it with a plain and easy curtsy which is here the simplest form adopted or kneeling down or throwing oneself upon the ground or kissing the dust with one's forehead no matter which there is yet a deliberateness a majesty a dignity a devoted earnestness in the manner of its doing which brings to light with every gesture with every fold of clothing the deep significance and essential import of every single action every one may without too greatly straining his attention notice the very striking precision and weight with which the upper and lower native classes observe these niceties of intercourse 
all this does not mean that the african negro is not human with the all too well known foibles of humanity primitive life among them is after all as bare and cruel as among primitive germans or chinese but it is not more so and the more we study the negro the more we realize that we are dealing with a normal human stock which under reasonable conditions has developed and will develop in the same lines as other men why is it then that so much of misinformation and contempt is widespread concerning africa and its people not simply among the unthinking mass but among men of education and knowledge one reason lies undoubtedly in the connotation of the term negro in north america a negro may be seven-eighths white since the term refers to any person of negro descent if we use the term in the same sense concerning the inhabitants of the rest of the world we may say truthfully that negroes have been among the leaders of civilization in every age of the world's history from ancient babylon to modern america that they have contributed wonderful gifts in art industry political organization and religion and that they are doing the same today in all parts of the world in sharp contrast to this usage the term negro in africa has been more and more restricted until some scientists late in the last century declared that the great mass of the black and brown people of africa were not negroes at all and that the real negro dwells in a small space between the niger and the senegal Ratzel says if we ask what justifies so narrow a limitation we find that the hideous negro type which the fancy of observers once saw all over africa but which as livingstone says is really to be seen only as a sign in front of tobacco shops has on closer inspection evaporated from all parts of africa to settle no one knows how in just this region if we understand that an extreme case may have been taken for the genuine and pure form even so we do not comprehend the ground of its geographical limitation and location for wherever dark woolly-haired men dwell this ugly type also crops up we are here in the presence of a refinement of science which to an unprejudiced eye will hardly hold water in this restricted sense the negro has no history culture or ability for the simple fact that such human beings as have history and evidence culture and ability are not negroes between these two extreme definitions with unconscious adroitness the most extraordinary and contradictory conclusions have been reached let it therefore be said once for all that racial inferiority is not the cause of anti-negro prejudice but as the anthropologist says an unbiased estimate of the anthropological evidence so far brought forward does not permit us to countenance the belief in a racial inferiority which would unfit an individual of the negro race to take his part in modern civilization we do not know of any demand made on the human body or mind in modern life that anatomical or ethnological evidence would prove to be beyond the powers of the negro we have every reason to suppose that all races are capable under proper guidance of being fitted into the complex scheme of our modern civilization and the policy of artificially excluding them from its benefits is an as unjustifiable scientifically as it is ethically abhorrent what is then this so-called instinctive modern prejudice against black folk lord bryce says of the intermingling of blacks and whites in south america the ease with which the spaniards have intermingled by marriage with the indian tribes and the portuguese have done the like not only with the indians but with the more physically dissimilar negroes shows that race repugnance is no such constant and permanent factor in human affairs as members of the teutonic peoples are apt to assume instead of being as we teutons suppose the rule in the matter we are rather the exception for in the ancient world there seems to have been little race repulsion in nearly every age and land men of negro descent have distinguished themselves in literature there is terence in rome nasieb and antar in arabia s sadi in the soudan pushkin in russia dumas in france alkanimi in spain heredia in the west indies and dunbar in the united states not to mention the alleged negro strain in aesop and robert browning as rulers and warriors we remember such negroes as queen nefertari and amenhotep the third among many others in egypt candace and erga menes in ethiopia mansa musa sani ali and mohammed askai in the soudan diaz in brazil toussaint l'ouverture in haiti hene valaf in russia saka noya tama ra maro in japan the elder duma in france kanzembe and chaka among the bantu and menelik of abyssinia the numberless black leaders of india and the mulatto strain of alexander hamilton in music and art we recall bridgewater the friend of beethoven and the unexplained complexion of beethoven's own father coleridge taylor in england tanner in america gomez in spain 
ira aldridge the actor and johnson cook and burley who are making the new american syncopated music in the church we know that negro blood coursed in the veins of many of the catholic african fathers if not in certain of the popes and there were in modern days benno benoit of palermo st benedict bishop crowther the mahdi who drove england from the soudan and the americans like allen lot carey and alexander crummel in science discovery and invention the negroes claim lislet jeffrey of the french academy latino and amo well known in european university circles and in america the explorers durantes and henson banneker the almanac maker wood the telephone improver mccoy the inventor of modern lubrication massa leaguer who revolutionized shoemaking here are names representing all degrees of genius and talent from the mediocre to the highest but they are strong human testimony to the ability of this race we must then look for the origin of modern color prejudice not to physical and cultural causes but to historic facts and we shall find the answer in modern negro slavery and the slave trade End of chapter eight Chapter Nine of the Negro by W. E. B. Du Bois. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Trade in Men. Color was never a badge of slavery in the ancient or medieval world, nor has it been in the modern world outside of Christian states. Homer sings of a black man, a reverend herald a visage solemn sad but sable hue short woolly curls or fleeced his bending head eurybiates in whose large soul alone ulysses viewed an image of his own greece and rome had their chief supplies of slaves from europe and asia egypt enslaved races of all colors and if there were more blacks than others among her slaves there were also more blacks among her nobles and pharaohs and both facts are explained by her racial origin and geographical position the fall of rome led to a cessation of the slave trade but after a long interval came the white slave trade of the saracens and moors and finally the modern trade in negroes slavery as it exists universally among primitive people is a system whereby captives in war are put to tasks about the homes and in the fields thus releasing the warriors for systematic fighting and the women for leisure such slavery has been common among all peoples and was widespread in africa the relative number of african slaves under these conditions was small and the labor not hard they were members of the family and might and did often rise to high position in the tribe remembering that in the fifteenth century there was no great disparity between the civilization of negro land and that of europe what made the striking difference in subsequent development european civilization cut off by physical barriers from further incursions of barbaric races settled more and more to systematic industry and to the domination of one religion african culture and industries were threatened by powerful barbarians from the west and central regions of the continent and by the moors in the north and islam had only partially converted the leading peoples when therefore demand for workmen arose in america european exportation was limited by religious ties and economic stability african exportation was encouraged not simply by the christian attitude toward heathen but also by the muslim enmity toward the unconverted negroes two great modern religions therefore agreed at least in the policy of enslaving heathen blacks while the overthrow of black ascaias by the moors at tech Dan de Boe brought that economic chaos among the advanced negro peoples and movement among the more barbarous tribes which proved a prime advantage to the development of a systematic trade in men the modern slave trade began with the mohammedan conquests in africa when either negroes were seized to supply the harems and as soldiers and servants they were bought from the masters and seized in war until the growing wealth and luxury of the conquerors demanded larger numbers then negroes from the egyptian soudan abyssinia and zanzibar began to pass into arabia persia and india in increased numbers 
as negro kingdoms and tribes rose to power they found the slave trade lucrative and natural since the raids in which slaves were captured were ordinary intertribal wars it was not until the eighteenth and nineteenth centuries that the demand for slaves in christian lands made slaves the object and not the incident of african wars in mohammedan countries there were gleams of hope in slavery in fiction and in truth the black slave had a chance once converted to islam he became a brother to the best and the brotherhood of the faith was not the sort of a idle lie that christian slave masters made it in arabia black leaders arose like antar in india black slaves carved out principalities where their descendants still rule some negro slaves were brought to europe by the spaniards in the fourteenth century and a small trade was continued by the portuguese who conquered territory from the tawny moors of north africa in the early fifteenth century later after their severe repulse at alcazar al Cabu, the portuguese began to creep down the west coast in quest of trade they reached the river of gold in fourteen forty one and their story is that their leader seized certain free moors and the next year exchanged them for ten black slaves a target of hide ostrich eggs and some gold dust the trade was easily justified on the ground that the moors were mohammedans and refused to be converted to christianity while even negroes would be better subjects for conversion and stronger laborers in the next few years a small number of negroes continued to be imported into spain and portugal as servants we find for instance in fourteen seventy four that negro slaves were common in seville there is a letter from ferdinand and isabella in the year fourteen seventy four to a celebrated negro juan de valladolid commonly called the negro count el conde negro nominating him to the office of mayor of the negroes in seville the slaves were apparently treated kindly allowed to keep their own dances and festivals and to have their own chief who represented them in the courts as against their own masters and settled their private quarrels between fourteen fifty five and fourteen ninety two little mention is made of slaves in the trade with africa columbus is said to have suggested negroes for america but ferdinand and isabella refused nevertheless by fifteen o one we have the first incidental mention of negroes going to america in a declaration that negro slaves born in the power of christians were to be allowed to pass to the indies and the officers of the royal revenue were to receive the money to be paid for their permits about fifteen o one ovando governor of spanish america was objecting to negro slaves and solicited that no negro slaves should be sent to hispaniola for they fled amongst the indians and taught them bad customs and never could be captured nevertheless a letter from the king to ovando dated segovia the fifteenth of september fifteen o five says i will send more negro slaves as you request i think there may be a hundred at each time a trustworthy person will go with them who may have some share in the gold they may collect and may promise them ease if they work well there is a record of a hundred slaves being sent out this very year and diego columbus was notified of fifty to be sent from seville for the mines in fifteen ten after this time frequent notices show that negroes were common in the new world when pizarro for instance had been slain in peru his body was dragged to the cathedral by two negroes after the battle of anna quito the head of the viceroy was cut off by a negro and during the great earthquake in guatemala a most remarkable figure was a gigantic negro seen in various parts of the city nunez had thirty negroes with him on the top of the sierras and there was rumor of an aboriginal tribe of negroes in south america one of the last acts of king ferdinand was to urge that no more negroes be sent to the west indies but under charles v bishop las casas drew up a plan of assisted migration to america and asked in fifteen seventeen the right for immigrants to import twelve negro slaves in return for which the indians were to be freed las casas writing in his old age owns his error this advice that license should be given to bring negro slaves to these lands the clerigo casas first gave not considering the injustice with which the portuguese take them and make them slaves which advice after he had apprehended the nature of the thing he would not have given for all he had in the world for he always held that they had been made slaves unjustly and tyrannically for the same reason holds good of them as of indians 
as soon as the plan was broached a savoyard lawrence de gomano governor of bressa obtained monopoly of this proposed trade and shrewdly sold it to the genoese for twenty five thousand ducats other monopolies were granted in fifteen twenty three fifteen twenty seven and fifteen twenty eight thus the american trade became established and gradually grew passing successively into the hands of the portuguese the dutch the french and the english at first the trade was of the same kind and volume as that already passing northward over the desert routes soon however the american trade developed a strong unchecked demand for brute labor in the west indies and on the continent of america grew until it culminated in the eighteenth century when negro slaves were crossing the atlantic at the rate of fifty to one hundred thousand a year this call for slave raiding on a scale that drew upon every part of africa upon the west coast the western and egyptian sudan the valley of the congo abyssinia the lake regions the east coast and madagascar not simply the degraded and weaker types of negroes were seized but the strong bantu the mandingo the songay the nubian and nile negroes the fula and even the asiatic malay were represented in the raids there was thus begun in modern days a new slavery and slave trade it was different from that of the past because more and more it came in time to be founded on racial caste and this caste was made the foundation of a new industrial system for four hundred years from fourteen fifty to eighteen fifty european civilization carried on a systematic trade in human beings of such tremendous proportions that the physical economic and moral effects are still plainly to be remarked throughout the world to this must be added the large slave trade of mussulman lands which began with the seventh century and raged almost unchecked until the end of the nineteenth century these were not days of decadence but a period that gave the world shakespeare martin luther and raphael harun al rashid and abraham lincoln it was the day of the greatest expansion of two of the world's most pretentious religions and of the beginnings of the modern organization of industry in the midst of this advance and uplift this slave trade and slavery spread more human misery inculcated more disrespect for and neglect of humanity a greater callousness to suffering and more petty cruel human hatred than can well be calculated we may excuse and palliate it and write history so as to let men forget it it remains the most inexcusable and despicable blot on modern human history the portuguese built the first slave trading fort at elmina on the gold coast in fourteen eighty two and extended their trade down the west coast and up the east coast under them the abominable traffic grew larger and larger until it became far the most important in money value of all the commerce of the zambezi basin there could be no extension of agriculture no mining no progress of any kind where it was so extensively carried on it was the dutch however who launched the oversea slave trade as a regular institution they began their fight for freedom from spain in fifteen seventy nine in fifteen ninety five as a war measure against spain who at that time was dominating portugal they made their first voyage to guinea by sixteen twenty one they had captured portugal's various slave forts on the west coast and they proceeded to open sixteen forts along the coast of the gulf of guinea ships sailed from holland to africa got slaves in exchange for their goods carried the slaves to the west indies or brazil and returned home laden with sugar in sixteen twenty one the private companies trading in the west were all merged into the dutch west india company which sent in four years fifteen thousand four hundred and thirty negroes to brazil carried on war with spain supplied even the english plantations and gradually became the great slave carrier of the day the commercial supremacy of the dutch early excited the envy and emulation of the english the navigation ordinance of sixteen fifty one was aimed at them and two wars were necessary to wrest the slave trade from them and place it in the hands of the english the final terms of peace among other things surrendered new netherlands to england and opened the way for england to become henceforth the world's greatest slave trader the english trade began with sir john hawkins voyages in fifteen sixty two and later in which the jesus our chief ship played a leading part 
desultory trade was kept up by the english until the middle of the seventeenth century when english chartered slave trading companies began to appear in sixteen sixty two the royal adventurers including the king the queen dowager and the duke of york invested in the trade and finally the royal african company which became the world's chief slave trader was formed in sixteen seventy two and carried on a growing trade for a quarter of a century jamaica had finally been captured and held by oliver cromwell in sixteen fifty five and formed a west indian base for the trade in men the chief contract for trade in negroes was the celebrated asiento or agreement of the king of spain to the importation of slaves into spanish domains the pope's bull of or demarcation fourteen ninety three debarred spain from african possessions and compelled her to contract with other nations for slaves this contract was in the hands of the portuguese in sixteen hundred in sixteen forty the dutch received it and in seventeen o one the french the war of the spanish succession brought this monopoly to england this asiento of 1713 was an agreement between England and Spain by which the latter granted the former a monopoly of the Spanish colonial slave trade for 30 years, and England engaged to supply the colonies within that time with at least 144,000 slaves at the rate of 4,800 per year. The English counted this prize as the greatest result of the Treaty of Utrecht, 1713, which ended the mighty struggle against the power of Louis the Fourteenth. The English held the monopoly until the Treaty of Aix-la-Chapelle, 1748, although they had to go to war over it in 1739 from this agreement the slave traders reaped a harvest the trade centred at liverpool and that city's commercial greatness was built largely on this foundation in seventeen o nine it sent out one slaver of thirty tons burden encouraged by parliamentary subsidies which amounted to nearly half a million dollars between seventeen twenty nine and seventeen fifty the trade amounted to fifty three ships in seventeen fifty one eighty six in seventeen sixty five and at the beginning of the nineteenth century one hundred and eighty five which carried forty nine thousand two hundred and thirteen slaves in one year the slave trade thus begun by the portuguese enlarged by the dutch and carried to its culmination by the english centred on the west coast near the seat of perhaps the oldest and most interesting culture of africa it came at a critical time the culture of yoruba benin Mosulan, and nupe had exhausted itself in a desperate attempt to stem the oncoming flood of mohammedan culture it has succeeded in maintaining it its small loosely federated city-state suited to trade industry and art it had developed strong resistance toward the soudan state builders toward the north as in the case of the fighting mosai but behind this warlike resistance lay the peaceful city life which gave industrial ideas to byzantium and shared something of ethiopian and mediterranean culture the first advent of the slave traders increased and encouraged native industry as is evidenced by the bronze work of benin but soon this was pushed into the background for it was not bronze metal but bronze flesh that europe wanted a new tyranny bloodthirsty cruel and built on war forced itself forward in the niger delta the powerful state of dahomey arose early in the eighteenth century and became a devastating tyranny reaching its highest power early in the nineteenth century ashanti a similar kingdom began its conquests in seventeen nineteen and grew with the slave trade thus state building in west africa began to replace the city economy but it was a state built on war and on war supported and encouraged largely for the sake of trade and human flesh the native industries were changed and disorganized family ties and government were weakened for into the heart of africa this devilish disintegration coupled with christian rum and mohammedan raiding penetrated the face of africa was turned south on these slave traders instead of northward toward the mediterranean where for two thousand years and more europe and africa had met in legitimate trade and mutual respect the full significance of the battle of ten ka debu which overthrew the Ascaius, was now clear hereafter in africa for centuries was to appear before the world not as a land of gold and ivory of mansa moose and mero but as a bound and captive slave dumb and degraded the natural desire to avoid a painful subject has led historians to gloss over the details of the slave trade and leave the impression that it was a local west coast phenomenon and confined to a few years it was on the contrary continent-wide and centuries long and an economic social and political catastrophe probably unparalleled in human history 
the exact proportions of the slave trade can be estimated only approximately from sixteen eighty to sixteen eighty eight we know that the english african company alone sent two hundred and forty nine ships of to africa shipped their sixty thousand seven hundred and eighty three negro slaves and after losing fourteen thousand three hundred and eighty seven on the middle passage delivered forty six thousand three hundred and ninety six in america it seems probable that twenty five thousand negroes a year arrived in america between sixteen ninety eight and seventeen o seven after the ascentio of seventeen thirteen this number rose to thirty thousand annually and before the revolutionary war it had reached at least forty thousand and perhaps hundred thousand slaves a year the total number of slaves imported is not known dunbar estimates that nearly nine hundred thousand came to america in the sixteenth century two million seven hundred and fifty thousand in the seventeenth seven million in the eighteenth and over four million in the nineteenth perhaps fifteen million in all certainly it seems that at least ten million negroes were expatriated probably every slave imported represented on the average five corpses in africa or on the high seas the american slave trade therefore meant the elimination of at least sixty million negroes from their fatherland the mohammedan slave trade meant the expatriation or forcible migration in africa of nearly as many more it would be conservative then to say that the slave trade cost negro africa one hundred million souls and yet people ask to-day the cause of the stagnation of culture in that land since sixteen hundred such a large number of slaves could be supplied only by organized slave raiding in every corner of africa the african continent gradually became revolutionized whole regions were depopulated whole tribes disappeared villages were built in caves and on hills or in forest fastnesses the character of peoples like those of benin developed their worst excesses of cruelty instead of the already flourishing arts of peace the dark irresistible grasp of fetish took firmer hold on men's minds further advances towards civilization became impossible not only was there the immense demand for slaves which had its outlet on the west coast but the slave caravans were streaming up through the desert to the mediterranean coast and down the valley of the nile to the centres of mohammedanism it was a rape of a continent to an extent never paralleled in ancient or modern times in the american trade there was not only the horrors of the slave raid which lined the winding paths of the african jungles with bleached bones but there was also the horrors of what was called the middle passage that is the voyage across the atlantic as sir william dolben said the negroes were chained to each other hand and foot and stowed so close that they were not allowed above a foot and a half for each in breadth thus crammed together like herrings in a barrel they contracted putrid and fatal disorders so that they who came to inspect them in the morning had occasionally to pick dead slaves out of their rows and to unchain their carcasses from the bodies of their wretched fellow-sufferers to whom they had been fastened it was estimated that out of every one hundred lot shipped from africa only about fifty lived to be effective laborers across the sea and among the whites more seamen died in that trade in one year than in the whole remaining trade of england in two the full realization of the horrors of the slave trade was slow in reaching the ears and conscience of the modern world just as to-day the treatment of dark natives in european colonies is brought to publicity with the greatest difficulty the first move against the slave trade in england came in parliament in seventeen seventy six but it was not until thirty-one years later in eighteen o seven that the trade was banned through the arduous labors of clarkson wilberforce sharp and others denmark had already abolished the trade and the united states attempted to do so the following year portugal and spain were induced to abolish the trade between eighteen fifteen and eighteen thirty notwithstanding these laws the contraband trade went on until the beginning of the civil war in america the reasons for this were the enormous profit of the trade and the continued demand of the american slave barons who had no sympathy with the efforts to stop their source of cheap labor supply however philanthropy was not working alone to overthrow negro slavery and the slave trade it was seen first in england and later in other countries that slavery as an industrial system could not be made to work satisfactorily in modern times its cost was too great and one of the causes of this cost was the slave insurrections from the very beginning when the slaves rose on the plantation of diego columbus down to the civil war in america 
actual and potential slave insurrection in the west indies in north and south america kept the slave owners in apprehension and turmoil or called for a police system difficult to maintain in north america revolt finally took the form of organized running away to the north and this with the growing scarcity of suitable land and the moral revolt led to the civil war and the disappearance of the american slave trade there was still however the mohammedan slave trade to deal with and this has been the work of the nineteenth and early twentieth centuries in the last quarter of the nineteenth century ten thousand slaves annually were being distributed on the southern and eastern coast of the mediterranean and at the great slave market in bornu on the east coast of africa in eighteen sixty two nineteen thousand slaves were passed into zanzibar and thence into arabia and persia as late as eighteen eighty three thousand annually were being thus transplanted but now the trade is about stopped to-day the only centres of actual slave trading may be said to be the cocoa plantations of the portuguese islands on the west coast of africa and the congo free state such is the story of the rape of ethiopia a sordid pitiful cruel tale raphael painted luther preached cornier wrote and milton sung and through it all for four hundred years the dark captives wound to the sea amid the bleaching bones of the dead for four hundred years the sharks followed the scurrying ships for four hundred years america was strewn with the living and dying millions of a transplanted race for four hundred years ethiopia stretched forth her hands unto god End of chapter 9chapter ten of the negro by w e b du bois this librivox recording is in the public domain the west indies and latin america that was a wonderful century the fifteenth when men realized that beyond the scowling waste of western waters were dreams come true curious and yet crassly human it is that with all this poetry and romance arose at once the filthiest institution of the modern world and the costliest for on negro slavery in america was built not simply the abortive cotton kingdom but the foundations of that modern imperialism which is based on the despising of backward men according to some accounts alonzo the negro piloted one of the ships of columbus and certainly there was negro blood among his sailors as early as fifteen twenty eight there were nearly ten thousand negroes in the new world we hear of them in all parts in honduras for instance a negro is sent to burn a native village in fifteen fifty five the town council of santiago de chile voted to allow an enfranchised negro possession of land in the town and evidently treated him just as white applicants were treated de Leon, who explored the coast of virginia in the first quarter of the sixteenth century used negro slaves who afterward revolted to build his ships and help in exploration balboa had with him thirty negroes who in fifteen thirteen helped to build the first ships on the pacific coast cortez had three hundred negro porters in fifteen twenty two before 1530 there were enough negroes in mexico to lead to an insurrection where the negroes fought desperately but were overcome and their ringleaders executed later the followers of another negro insurgent bayano were captured and sent back to spain negroes founded the town of santiago del principe in fifteen seventy and in fifteen forty a negro slave of hernandez de alarcon was the only one of the party to carry a message across the country to the zunis of new mexico a negro stephen dorantis discovered new mexico this stephen or estefanico was sent ahead by certain spanish friars to the seven cities of cibola as soon as stephen had left said friars he determined to earn all the reputation and honor for himself and that the boldness and daring of having alone discovered those villages of high stories so much spoken of throughout the country should be attributed to him and carrying along with him the people who followed him he endeavored to cross the wilderness which is between cibola and the country he had gone through and he was so far ahead of the friars that when they arrived at chichiticali 
which is on the edge of the wilderness he was already at cibola which is eighty leagues of wilderness beyond but the indians of the new and strange country took alarm and concluded that stephen must be a spy or guide for some nations who intended to come and conquer them because it seemed to them unreasonable for him to say that the people were white in the country from which he came being black himself and being sent by them slaves imported under the asiento treaties went to all parts of the americas spanish america had by the close of the eighteenth century ten thousand in santo domingo eighty four thousand in cuba fifty thousand in puerto rico sixty thousand in louisiana and florida and sixty thousand in central and south america the history of the negro in spanish america centered in cuba venezuela and central america in the sixteenth century slaves began to arrive in cuba and negroes joined many of the exploring expeditions from there to various parts of america the slave trade greatly increased in the latter part of the eighteenth century and after the revolution in haiti large numbers of french emigrants from that island settled in cuba this and spanish greed increased the harshness of slavery and eventually led to a revolt among the negroes in eighteen forty four governor o'donnell began a cruel persecution of the blacks on account of a plot discovered among them finally in eighteen sixty six the ten years war broke out in which negro and white rebels joined they demanded the abolition of slavery and equal political rights for natives and foreigners whites and blacks the war was cruel and bloody but ended in eighteen seventy eight with the abolition of slavery while a further uprising the following year secured civil rights for negroes spanish economic oppression continued however and the leading chiefs of the ten years war including such leaders as the mulatto antonio maceo with large numbers of negro soldiers took the field again in eighteen ninety five the result was the freeing of cuba by the intervention of the united states negro regiments from the united states played here a leading role a number of leaders in cuba in political industrial and literary lines have been men of negro descent slavery was abolished by guatemala in eighteen twenty four and by mexico in eighteen twenty nine argentina peru bolivia chile and paraguay ceased to recognize it about eighteen twenty five between eighteen forty and eighteen forty five it came to an end in colombia venezuela and ecuador bolivar paez sucre and other south american leaders used negro soldiers in fighting for freedom eighteen fourteen to sixteen and eighty twice at critical times rendered assistance and received bolivar twice as a refugee brazil was the centre of portuguese slavery but slaves were not introduced in large numbers until about seventeen twenty when diamonds were discovered in the territory above rio de janeiro gradually the seaboard from pernambuco to rio janeiro and beyond became filled with negroes and although the slave trade north of the equator was theoretically abolished by portugal in eighteen fifteen and south of the equator in eighteen thirty and by brazil in these regions in eighteen twenty six and eighteen thirty nevertheless between eighteen twenty five and eighteen fifty over a million and a quarter of negroes were introduced not until brazil abolished slavery in eighteen eighty eight did the importation wholly cease brazilian slavery allowed the slave to purchase his freedom and the color line was not strict even in the eighteenth century there were black clergy and bishops indeed the negro clergy seemed to have been on a higher moral level than the whites insurrection was often attempted especially among the mohammedan negroes around bahia in sixteen ninety five a tribe of revolted slaves held out for a long time in seventeen nineteen a widespread conspiracy failed but many of the leaders fled to the forest in eighteen twenty eight a thousand rose in revolt at bahia and again in eighteen thirty from eighteen thirty one to eighteen thirty seven revolt was in the air and in eighteen thirty five came the great revolt of the mohammedans who attempted to enthrone a queen the negroes fought with furious bravery but were finally defeated by eighteen seventy two the number of free negroes had very greatly increased so that the emancipation did not come as a shock while mohammedan negroes still gave trouble and were in some cases sent back to africa yet on the whole emancipation was peaceful and whites negroes and indians are to-day amalgamating into a new race at the present moment there is scarcely a lowly or a highly placed federal or a provincial official at the head of or within any of the great departments of state that is not more or less negro or american indian blood in his veins 
lord bryce says it is hardly too much to say that along the coast from rio to bahia and pernambuco as well as in parts of the interior behind these two cities the black population predominates the brazilian lower class intermarries freely with the black people the brazilian middle class intermarries with mulattoes and quadroons brazil is the one country in the world besides the portuguese colonies on the east and west coast of africa in which a fusion of the european and african races is proceeding unchecked by law or custom the doctrines of human equality and human solidarity have here their perfect work the result is so far satisfactory that there is little or no class friction the white man does not lynch or maltreat the negro indeed i have never heard of a lynching anywhere in south america except occasionally as part of a political convulsion the negro is not accused of insolence and does not seem to develop any more criminality than naturally belongs to any ignorant population with loose notions of morality and property what ultimate effect the intermixture of blood will have on the european element in brazil i will not venture to predict if one may judge from a few remarkable cases it will not necessarily reduce the intellectual standard one of the ablest and most refined brazilians i have known had some colour and other such cases have been mentioned to me assumptions and preconceptions must be eschewed however plausible they may seem a brazilian writer said at the first racist congress the cooperation of the metas in the advance of brazil is notorious and far from inconsiderable they played the chief part during many years in brazil in the campaign for the abolition of slavery i could quote at celebrated names of more than one of these metas who put themselves at the head of the literary movement they fought with firmness and intrepidity in the press and on the platform they faced with courage the gravest perils to which they were exposed in their struggle against the powerful slave owners who had the protection of a conservative government they gave evidence of sentiments of patriotism self-denial and appreciation during the long campaign in paraguay fighting heroically at the boarding of the ships in the naval battle of riachuelo and in the attacks on the brazilian army on numerous occasions in the course of this long south american war it was owing to their support that the republic was erected on the ruins of the empire the dutch brought the first slaves to the north american continent john rolfe relates that the last of august sixteen nineteen there came to virginia a dutch man of war that sold us twenty niggers this was probably one of the ships of the numerous private dutch trading companies which early entered into the developed and the lucrative african slave trade although the dutch thus commenced the continental slave trade they did not actually furnish a very large number of slaves to the english colonies outside the west indies a small trade had by sixteen ninety eight brought a few thousand to new york and still fewer to new jersey the dutch found better scope for slaves in guiana which they settled in sixteen sixteen sugar-cane became the staple crop but the negroes early began to revolt and the dutch brought in east indian coolies the slaves were badly treated and the runaways joined the revolted bush negroes in the interior from seventeen fifteen to seventeen seventy five there was continuous fighting with the bush negroes or insurrections until at last in seventeen forty nine a formal treaty between sixteen hundred negroes and the dutch was made immediately a new group revolted under a mohammedan arabi and they obtained land and liberty in seventeen sixty three the coast negroes revolted they were checked but made terms and settled in the interior the bush negroes fought against both french and english to save guiana to the dutch but guiana was eventually divided between the three the bush negroes still maintained their independence and vigor the french encouraged settlements in the west indies in the seventeenth century but at last finding that french immigrants would not come they began about sixteen forty two to import negroes owing to wars with england slaves were supplied by the dutch and portuguese although the royal senegal company held the coveted asiento from seventeen o one to seventeen thirteen it was in the island of haiti however that french slavery centred pirates from many nations but chiefly french began to frequent the island and in sixteen sixty three the french annexed the eastern part thus dividing the island between france and spain by sixteen eighty there were so many slaves and mulattoes that louis the fourteenth issued his celebrated code noir which was notable in compelling bachelor masters fathers of slave children to marry their concubines 
children followed the condition of the mother as to slavery or freedom they could have no property harsh punishments were provided for but families could not be separated by sale except in the case of grown children emancipation with full civil rights was made possible for any slave twenty years of age or more when louisiana was settled and the alabama coast slaves were introduced there louisiana was transferred to spain in seventeen sixty two against the resistance of both settlers and slaves but spain took possession in seventeen sixty nine and introduced more negroes later in haiti more liberal policy encouraged trade war was over and capital and slaves poured in sugar coffee chocolate indigo dyes and spices were raised there were large numbers of mulattoes many of whom were educated in france and many masters married negro women who had inherited large properties just as in the united states to-day white men are marrying eagerly the landed indian women in the west when white immigration increased in seventeen forty nine however prejudice arose against these mulattoes and severe laws were passed depriving them of civil rights entrance into the professions and the right to hold office severe edicts were enforced as to clothing names and social intercourse finally after seventeen seventy seven mulattoes were forbidden to come to france when the french revolution broke out the haitians managed to send two delegates to paris nevertheless the planters maintained the upper hand and one of the colored delegates Oga, on returning started a small rebellion he and his companions were killed with great brutality this led the french government to grant full civil rights to free negroes immediately planters and free negroes flew to arms against each other and then suddenly august twenty two seventeen ninety one the black slaves of whom there were four hundred and fifty two thousand arose in revolt to help the free negroes for many years runaway slaves had hidden in the mountains under their own chiefs one of the earliest of these chiefs was polydor in seventeen twenty four who was succeeded by Mackendal the great chief of these runaways or maroons at the time of the slave revolt was jean francois who was soon succeeded by Biasou. pierre dominic toussaint known as tansin louverture joined these maroon bands where he was called the doctor of the armies of the king and soon became chief aide to jean francois and Biasou. upon their deaths toussaint rose to the chief command he acquired complete control over the blacks not only in military matters but in politics and social organization the soldiers regarded him as a superior being and the farmers prostrated themselves before him all his generals trembled before him dessalines did not dare to look in his face and all the world trembled before his generals the revolt once started blacks and mulattoes murdered whites without mercy and the whites retaliated commissioners were sent from france who asked simply civil rights for freedmen and not emancipation indeed that was all that toussaint himself had as yet demanded the planters intrigued with the british and this together with the beheading of the king an impious act in the eyes of the negroes induced toussaint to join the spaniards in seventeen ninety three british troops were landed and the french commissioners in desperation declared the slaves emancipated this at once won back toussaint from the spaniards he became supreme in the north while rigaud leader of the mulattoes held the south and the west by seventeen ninety eight the british having lost most of their forces by yellow fever surrendered mont st nicholas to toussaint and departed rigaud finally left for france and toussaint in eighteen hundred was master of haiti he promulgated a constitution under which haiti was to be a self-governing colony all men were equal before the law and trade was practically free toussaint was to be president for life with the power to name his successor napoleon bonaparte master of france had at this time dreams of a great american empire and replied to toussaint's new government by sending twenty-five thousand men under his brother-in-law to subdue the presumptuous negroes as a preliminary step to his occupation and development of the mississippi valley fierce fighting and yellow fever decimated the french but matters went hard with the negroes too and toussaint finally offered to yield he was courteously received with military honors and then as soon as possible treacherously seized bound and sent to france he was imprisoned at fort Joux and died perhaps of poison after studied humiliations april seventh eighteen o three thus perished the greatest of american negroes and one of the great men of all time at the age of fifty-six a french planter said god in his terrestrial globe did not commune with a purer spirit wendell phillips said some doubt the courage of the negro go to haiti and stand on those fifty thousand graves of the best soldiers france ever had and ask them what they think of the negro sword 
i would call him napoleon but napoleon made his way to empire over broken oaths and through a sea of blood this man never broke his word i would call him cromwell but cromwell was only a soldier and the state he founded went down with him into his grave i would call him washington but the great virginian held slaves this man risked his empire rather than permit the slave trade in the humblest village of his dominions you think me a fanatic for you read history not with your eyes but with your prejudices but fifty years hence when truth gets a hearing the muse of history will put phocion for the greek brutus for the roman hampton for the english lafayette for france choose washington as the bright consummate flower of our earlier civilization then dripping her pen in the sunlight will write in the clear blue above them all the name of the soldier the statesman the martyr toussaint louverture the treacherous killing of toussaint did not conquer haiti in eighteen o two and eighteen o three some forty thousand french soldiers died of war and fever a new colored leader dessalines arose and all the eight thousand remaining french surrendered to the blockading british fleet the effect of all this was far-reaching napoleon gave up his dream of american empire and sold louisiana for a song thus all of indian territory all of kansas and nebraska and iowa and wyoming and montana and the dakotas and most of colorado and minnesota and all of washington and oregon states came to us as the indirect work of a despised negro praise if you will the work of a robert livingston or a jefferson but to-day let us not forget our debt to toussaint louverture who was indirectly the means of america's expansion by the louisiana purchase of eighteen o three with the freedom of haiti in eighteen o one came a century of struggle to fit the people for the freedom they had won they were yet slaves crushed by a cruel servitude without education or religious instruction the haitian leaders united upon dessalines to maintain the independence of the republic dessalines like toussaint and his lieutenant christophe was noted in slavery days for his severity toward his fellows and the discipline which he insisted on he had other characteristics of african chieftains there were seasons when he broke through his natural sullenness and showed himself open affable and even generous his vanity was excessive and manifested itself in singular perversities he was a man of great personal bravery and succeeded in maintaining the independence of haiti which had already cost the frenchman fifty thousand lives on january one eighteen o four at the place whence toussaint had been treacherously seized and sent to france the independence of haiti was declared by the military leaders dessalines was made governor-general for life and afterward proclaimed himself emperor this was not an act of grandiloquence and mimicry it is truer to say that in it both dessalines and later christophe were actuated by a clear insight into the social history and peculiarities of their people there was nothing in the constitution which did not have its companion in africa where the organization of society was despotic with elective hereditary chiefs royal families polygamic marriages councils and regencies the population was divided into soldiers and laborers the territory was parcelled out to chiefs and the laborers were bound to the soil and worked under rigorous inspection part of the products were reserved for their support and the rest went to the chiefs the king the general government and the army the army was under stern discipline and military service was compulsory women did much of the agricultural labor under toussaint the administration of this system was committed to dessalines who carried it out with rigor it was afterward followed by christophe the latter even imported four thousand negroes from africa from whom he formed a national guard for patrolling the land these regulations brought back for a time a large part of the former prosperity of the island the severity with which dessalines enforced the law soon began to turn many against him the educated mulattoes especially objected to submission to the savage african mores dessalines started to suppress their revolt but was killed in ambush in october eighteen o six great britain now began to intrigue for protectorate over the island and the spanish end of the island threatened attack these difficulties were overcome but at a cost of great internal strain after the death of dessalines it seemed that haiti was about to dissolve into a number of petty subdivisions at one time christophe was ruling as king in the north pachian as president at port au prince rigaud in the south and a semi-brigand gomen in the extreme southwest very soon however the rivalry narrowed down to pachian and christophe pachian was a man of considerable ability and did much not simply for haiti but for south america 
already as early as seventeen seventy nine before the revolution in haiti the haitian negroes had helped the united states the british had captured savannah in seventeen seventy eight the french fleet appeared on the coast of georgia late that year and was ordered to recruit men in haiti eight hundred young freedmen blacks and mulattoes offered to take part in the expedition and they fought valiantly in the siege and covered themselves with glory it was this legion that made the charge on the british and saved the retreating american army among the men who fought there was christophe when simon bolivar commodore Ari, and many venezuelan families were driven from their country in eighteen fifteen they and their ships took temporary refuge in haiti notwithstanding the embarrassed condition of the republic passion received them and gave them four thousand rifles with ammunition provisions and last and best a printing press he also settled some international quarrels among members of the groups and bolivar expressed himself afterward as being overwhelmed with magnanimous favors passion died in eighteen eighteen and was succeeded by his friend boyer christophe committed suicide the following year and boyer became not simply a ruler of western haiti but also by arrangement with the eastern end of the island gained the mastery there where they were afraid of spanish aggression thus from eighteen twenty two to eighteen forty three boyer a man of much ability ruled the whole of the island and gained the recognition of haitian independence from france and other nations france under charles the tenth demanded an indemnity of thirty million dollars to reimburse the planters for confiscated lands and property this haiti tried to pay but the annual instalment was a tremendous burden to the impoverished country further negotiations were entered into finally in eighteen thirty eight france recognized the independence of the republic and the indemnity was reduced to twelve million dollars even this was a large burden for haiti and the payment of it for years crippled the island the united states and great britain in eighteen twenty five to twenty six recognized the independence of haiti a concordat was arranged with the pope for governing the church in haiti and finally in eighteen sixty the church placed under the french hierarchy thus boyer did unusually well but his necessary concessions to france weakened his influence at home and finally an earthquake which destroyed several towns in eighteen forty two raised the superstitious of the populace against him he resigned in eighteen forty three leaving the treasury well filled but with his withdrawal the spanish portion of the island was lost to haiti the subsequent history of haiti since eighteen forty three has been the struggle of a small divided country to maintain political independence the rich resources of the country called for foreign capital but outside capital meant political influence from abroad which the little nation rightly feared within the old antagonism between the freedman and the slave settled into a color line between the mulatto and the black which for a time meant the difference between educated liberalism and reactionary ignorance this difference has largely disappeared but some vestiges of the color line remain the result has been reaction and savagery under so loke dominique and nord alexis and decided advance under presidents like nissage sage solomon legitime and hippolyte in political life haiti is still in the sixteenth century but in economic life she has succeeded in placing on their own little farms the happiest and most contented peasantry in the world after raising them from a veritable hell of slavery if modern capitalistic greed can be restrained from interference until the best elements of haiti secure permanent political leadership the triumph of the revolution will be complete in other parts of the french american dominion the slaves achieved freedom also by insurrection in guadeloupe they helped the french drive out the british and thus gained emancipation in martinique it took three revolts and a civil war to bring freedom the english slave empire in america centered in the bermudas barbados jamaica and the lesser islands and in the united states barbados developed a savage slave code and the result was attempted slave insurrections in sixteen seventy four sixteen ninety two and seventeen o two these were not successful but a rising in eighteen sixteen destroyed much property under the leadership of a mulatto washington franklin and the repeal of bad laws and eventual enfranchisement of the colored people followed one barbadian mulatto sir conrad reeves has held the position of chief justice in the island and was knighted a negro insurrection in dominica under farcel greatly exercised england in seventeen ninety one and seventeen ninety four and delayed slave trade abolition in eighteen forty four and eighteen forty seven further uprisings took place and these continued from eighteen fifty three to eighteen ninety three
the chief island domain of english slavery was jamaica it was oliver cromwell who in his zeal for god and the slave trade sent an expedition to seize haiti his fleet driven off there took jamaica in sixteen fifty five the english found the mountains already infested with runaway slaves known as maroons and more negroes joined them when the english arrived in sixteen sixty three the freedom of the maroons was acknowledged land was given them and their leader juan de bolas was made a colonel in the militia he was killed however in the following year and from sixteen sixty four to seventeen thirty eight the three thousand or more black maroons fought the british empire in guerrilla warfare soldiers indians and dogs were sent against them and finally in seventeen thirty eight captain cujo and other chiefs made a formal treaty of peace with governor trelawney they were granted twenty five hundred acres and their freedom was recognized the peace lasted until seventeen ninety five when they rebelled again and gave the british a severe drubbing besides murdering planters bloodhounds again were imported the maroons offered to surrender on the express condition that none of their number should be deported from the island as the legislature wished general walpole hesitated but could get peace on no other terms and gave his word the maroons surrendered their arms and immediately the whites seized six hundred of the ring leaders and transported them to the snows of nova scotia the legislature then voted a sword worth twenty five hundred dollars to general walpole which he indignantly refused to accept eventually these exiled maroons found their way to sierra leone west africa in time to save that colony to the british crown the pressing desire for peace with the maroons on the part of the white planters arose from the new sugar culture introduced in sixteen seventy three a greatly increased demand for slaves followed and between seventeen hundred and seventeen eighty six six hundred and ten thousand slaves were imported nevertheless so severely were they driven that there were only three hundred thousand negroes in jamaica in the latter year despite the moravian missions and other efforts late in the eighteenth century unrest among the jamaican slaves and freedmen grew and was increased by the anti-slavery agitation in england and the revolt in haiti there was an insurrection in seventeen ninety six and in eighteen thirty one again the negroes of northwest jamaica impatient because of the slow progress of the emancipation arose in revolt and destroyed nearly three and a half million dollars worth of property well nigh ruining the planters there the next year two hundred and fifty five thousand slaves were set free for which the planters were paid nearly thirty million dollars there ensued a discouraging condition of industry the white officials sent out in these days were arbitrary and corrupt little was done for the mass of the people and there was outrageous overtaxation nevertheless the backwardness of the colony was attributed to the negro governor eyre complained in eighteen sixty five that the young and strong were good for nothing and were filling the jails but a simultaneous report by a missionary told the truth concerning the officials this aroused the colored people and the mulatto george william gordon called a meeting other meetings were afterward held and finally the negro peasantry began a riot in eighteen sixty one in which eighteen people were killed only a few of whom were white the result was that governor eyre tried and executed by court-martial three hundred and fifty-four persons and in addition to this killed without trial eighty-five a total of four hundred and thirty-nine one thousand negro homes were burned to the ground and thousands of negroes flogged or mutilated children had their brains dashed out pregnant women were murdered and gordon was tried by court-martial and hanged in fact the punishment was as the royal commissioner said reckless and positively barbarous this high-handed act aroused england error was not punished but the island was made a crown colony in eighteen sixty six and given representation in the legislature in eighteen eighty six in the island of st vincent indians first sought to enslave the fugitive negroes wrecked there but the negroes took the carib women and then drove the indian men away these black caribs fought with indians english and others for three-quarters of a century until the indians were exterminated the british took possession in seventeen sixty three the black caribs resisted and after hard fighting signed a treaty in seventeen seventy three receiving one-third of the island as their property they afterward helped the french against the british and were finally deported to the island of ruatan off honduras in trinidad and british guiana there have been mutinies and rioting of slaves and a curious mingling of races other parts of south america must be dismissed briefly because of insufficient data Colombia and venezuela with perhaps eight million people have at least one-third of their population of negro and indian descent 
here simon bolivar with his negro mulatto and indian forces began the war that liberated south america central america has a smaller proportion of negroids perhaps one hundred thousand in all bolivia and peru have small amounts of negro blood while argentina and uruguay have very little the negro population in these lands is everywhere in process of rapid amalgamation with whites and indians End of chapter 10. Chapter 11, Part 1 of The Negro by W. E. B. Du Bois. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Negro in the United States. There were half a million slaves in the confines of the United States when the Declaration of Independence declared that all men are created equal that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights that among these are life liberty and the pursuit of happiness the land that thus magniloquently heralded its advent into the family of nations had supposed the institution of human slavery for one hundred and fifty-seven years and was destined to cling to it eighty-seven years longer the greatest experiment in negro slavery as a modern industrial system was made on the mainland of north america and in the confines of the present united states and this experiment was on such a scale and so long continued that it is profitable for study and reflection there were in the united states in its dependencies in nineteen ten nine million eight hundred and twenty eight thousand two hundred and ninety four persons of acknowledged negro descent not including the considerable infiltration of negro blood which is not acknowledged and often not known to-day the number of persons called negroes is probably about ten and a quarter million these persons are almost entirely descendants of african slaves brought to america in the sixteenth seventeenth eighteenth and nineteenth centuries the importation of negroes to the mainland of north america was small until the british got the coveted privilege of the asiento in seventeen thirteen before that northern states like new york had received some slaves from the dutch and new england had early developed a trade by which she imported a number of house servants ships went out to the african coast with rum sold the rum and brought the slaves to the west indies there they exchanged the slaves for sugar and molasses and brought the molasses back to new england to be made into rum for further exploits after the asiento treaty the negro population increased in the eighteenth century from about fifty thousand in seventeen ten to two hundred and twenty thousand in seventeen fifty and to four hundred and sixty two thousand in seventeen seventy when the colonies became independent the foreign slave trade was soon made illegal but illicit trade annexation of territory and natural increase enlarged the negro population from a little over a million at the beginning of the nineteenth century to four and a half millions at the outbreak of the civil war and to about ten and a quarter millions in nineteen fourteen the present so-called negro population of the united states is one a mixture of the various african populations bantu sudanese west coast negroes some dwarfs and some traces of arab barber and semitic blood two a mixture of these strains with the blood of white americans through a system of concubinage of colored women in slavery days together with some legal intermarriage the figures as to mulattoes have been from time to time officially acknowledged to be understatements probably one-third of the negroes of the united states have distinct traces of white blood this blending of the races has led to interesting human types but racial prejudice has hitherto prevented any scientific study of the matter in general the negro population in the united states is brown in color darkening to almost black and shading off in the other direction to yellow and white and is indistinguishable in some cases from the white population much has been written of the black man in america but most of this has been from the point of view of the whites so that we know of the effect of negro slavery on the whites the strife among the whites for and against abolition and the consequent problem of the negro so far as the white population is concerned this chapter however is dealing with the matter more from the point of view of the negro group itself and seeking to show what slavery meant to them how they reacted against it what they did to secure their freedom and what they are doing with their partial freedom to-day 
the slaves landing from sixteen nineteen onward were received by the colonies at first as laborers on the same plane as other laborers for a long time there was in law no distinction between the indented white servant from england and the black servant from africa except in the term of their service even here the distinction was not always observed some of the whites being kept beyond term of their service and negroes now and then securing their freedom gradually the planters realized the advantage of laborers held for life but they were met by certain moral difficulties the opposition to slavery had from the first been largely stilled when it was stated that this was a method of converting the heathen to christianity the corollary was that when a slave was converted he became free up to sixteen sixty or thereabouts it seemed accepted in most colonies and in the english west indies that baptism into a christian church would free a negro slave masters therefore were reluctant in the seventeenth century to have their slaves receive christian instruction massachusetts first apparently legislated on this matter by enacting in sixteen forty one that slavery should be confined to captives in just wars and such strangers as willingly sell themselves or are sold to us meaning by strangers apparently heathen but saying nothing as to the effect of conversion connecticut adopted similar legislation in sixteen fifty and virginia declared in sixteen sixty one that negroes are incapable of making satisfaction for time lost in running away by lengthening their time of services thus implying that they were slaves for life maryland declared in sixteen sixty three that negro slaves should serve durante vita but it was not until sixteen sixty seven that virginia finally plucked up courage to attack the issue squarely and declared by law baptism doth not alter the condition of the person as to his bondage or freedom in order that diverse masters freed from this doubt may more carefully endeavor the propagation of christianity the transplanting of the negro from his african clan life to the west indian plantation was a social revolution marriage became geographical and transient while women and girls were without protection the private home as a self-protective independent unit did not exist that powerful institution the polygamous african home was almost completely destroyed and in its place in america arose sexual promiscuity a weak community life with common dwelling meals and child nurseries the internal slave trade tended further to weaken natural ties a small number of favored house servants and artisans were raised above this had their private homes came in contact with the culture of the master class and assimilated much of american civilization this was however exceptional broadly speaking the greatest social effect of american slavery was to substitute for the polygamous negro home a new polygamy less guarded less effective and less civilized at first sight it would seem that slavery completely destroyed every vestige of spontaneous movement among the negroes this is not strictly true the vast power of the priest in the african state is well known his realm alone the province of religion and medicine remained largely unaffected by the plantation system the negro priest therefore early became an important figure on the plantation and found his function as the interpreter of the supernatural the comforter of the sorrowing and as the one who expressed rudely but picturesquely the longing and disappointment and resentment of a stolen people from such beginnings arose and spread with marvellous rapidity the negro church the first distinctively negro american social institution it was not at first by any means a christian church but a mere adaptation of those rites of fetish which in america is termed obey worship or voodooism association and missionary efforts soon gave these rites a veneer of christianity and gradually after two centuries the church became christian with a simple calvinistic creed but with many of the old customs still clinging to the services it is this historic fact that the negro church of to-day bases itself upon the sole surviving social institution of the african fatherland that accounts for its extraordinary growth and vitality the slave codes at first were really labor codes based on an attempt to re-establish in america the waning feudalism of europe the laborers were mainly black and were held for life above them came the artisans free whites with a few blacks and above them the master class the feudalism called for the plantation system and the plantation system as developed in america and particularly in virginia was at first a feudal domain 
on these plantations the master was practically supreme the slave codes in early days were but moderately harsh allowing punishment by the master but restraining him in extreme cases and providing for care of the slaves and of the aged with the power however solely in the hands of the master class and with the master supreme on his own plantation his power over the slave was practically what he wished it to be in some cases the cruelty was as great as on the worst west indian plantations in other cases the rule was mild and paternal up through this american feudalism the negro began to rise he learned in the eighteenth century the english language he began to be identified with the christian church he mingled his blood to a considerable extent with the master class now servants particularly were favored in some cases receiving education and the number of free negroes gradually increased present-day students are often puzzled at the apparent contradictions of southern slavery one hears on the one hand of the state and gentle patriarchy the white and sleepy plantations with lord and retainers ease and happiness on the other hand one hears of barbarous cruelty and unbridled power and wide oppression of men which is the true picture the answer is simple both are true they are not opposite sides of the same shield they are different shields they are pictures on the one hand of house service in the great country seats and in the towns and on the other hand of the field laborers who raise the great tobacco rice and cotton crops we have thus not only carelessly mixed pictures of what were really different kinds of slavery but of that which represented different degrees in the development of the economic system house service was the older feudal idea of personal retainership developed in virginia and carolina in the seventeenth and eighteenth centuries it had all the advantages and disadvantages of such a system the advantage of the strong personal tie and disadvantage of unyielding caste distinctions with the resultant immoralities at its worst however it was a matter primarily of human relationships out of this older type of slavery in the northern south there developed during the eighteenth and nineteenth centuries in the southern south the type of slavery which corresponds to the modern factory system in its worst conceivable form it represented production of a staple product on a large scale between the owner and labor were interposed the overseer and the drivers the slaves were whipped and driven to a mechanical task system wide territory was needed so that at last absentee landlordship was common it was this latter type of slavery that marked the cotton kingdom and the extension of the area of this system southward and westward marked the aggressive world-conquering visions of the slave barons on the other hand it was the milder and far different virginia house service and the personal retainship of town life in which most white children grew up it was this that impressed their imaginations and which they have so vividly portrayed the negroes however knew the other side for it was under the harsher heartless driving of the fields that fully nine-tenths of them lived there early began to be some internal development and growth of self-consciousness among the negroes for instance in new england towns negro governors were elected this was partly an african custom transplanted and partly an endeavor to put the regulation of the slaves into their own hands negroes voted in those days for instance in north carolina until eighteen thirty five the constitution extended the franchise to every free man and when negroes were disfranchised in eighteen thirty five several hundred colored men were deprived of the vote in fact as albert bushnell hart says in the colonies freed negroes like freed indentured white servants acquired property founded families and came into the political community if they had the energy thrift and fortune to get the necessary property the humanitarian movement of the eighteenth century was active toward negroes because of the part which they played in the revolutionary war negro regiments and companies were raised in connecticut and rhode island and a large number of negroes were members of the continental armies elsewhere individual negroes distinguished themselves it is estimated that five thousand negroes fought in the american armies the mass of the americans considered at the time of the adoption of the constitution that negro slavery was doomed there soon came a series of laws emancipating slaves in the north vermont began in seventeen seventy nine followed by judicial decision in massachusetts in seventeen eighty and gradual emancipation in pennsylvania beginning the same year emancipation was accomplished in new hampshire in seventeen eighty three and in connecticut and rhode island in seventeen eighty four the momentous exclusion of slavery in the northwest territory took place in seventeen eighty seven and gradual emancipation began in new york and new jersey in seventeen ninety nine and eighteen o four 
beneficial and insurance societies began to appear among colored people nearly every town of any size in virginia in the early eighteenth century had negro organizations for caring for the sick and burying the dead as the number of freed negroes increased particularly in the north these financial societies began to be openly formed one of the earliest was the free african society of philadelphia this eventually became the present african methodist church which has to-day half a million members and over eleven million dollars worth of property negroes began to be received into the white church bodies in separate congregations and before eighteen o seven there is the record of the formation of eight such negro churches this brought forth leaders who were usually preachers in these churches richard allen the founder of the african methodist church was one lot carey one of the founders of liberia was another in the south there was john chavis who passed through a regular course of studies at what is now washington and lee university he started a school for young white men in north carolina and had among his pupils a united states senator sons of a chief justice of north carolina a governor of the state and many others he was a full-blooded negro but a southern writer says that all accounts agree that john chavis was a gentleman he was received socially among the best whites and asked to table in the war of eighteen twelve thirty three hundred negroes helped jackson win the battle of new orleans and numbers fought in new york state and in the navy under perry channing and others phyllis wheatley a negro girl wrote poetry and the mulatto benjamin banneker published one of the first american series of almanacs in fine it seemed in the early years of the nineteenth century that slavery in the united states would gradually disappear and that the negro would have in time a man's chance a change came however between eighteen twenty and eighteen thirty and it is directly traceable to the industrial revolution of the nineteenth century between seventeen thirty eight and eighteen thirty there had come a remarkable series of inventions which revolutionized the methods of making cloth this series included the invention of the fly shuttle the carting machine the steam engine and the power loom the world began to look about for a cheaper and larger supply of fibre for weaving it was found in the cotton plant and the southern united states was especially adapted to its culture the invention of the cotton gin removed the last difficulties the south now had a crop which could be attended to by unskilled labor and for which there was practically unlimited demand there was land and rich land in plenty the result was that the cotton crop in the united states increased from eight thousand bales in seventeen ninety to six hundred and fifty thousand bales in eighteen twenty to two million five hundred thousand bales in eighteen fifty and to four million bales in eighteen in this growth one sees the economic foundation of the new slavery in the united states which rose in the second decade of the nineteenth century manifestly the fatal procrastination in dealing with slavery in the eighteenth century received in the nineteenth century its terrible reward the change in the attitude toward slavery was manifest in various ways the south no longer excused slavery but began to defend it as an economic system the enforcement of the slave trade laws became notoriously lax and there was a tendency to make the slaves codes harsher this led to retaliation on the part of the negroes there had not been in the united states before this many attempts at insurrection the slaves were distributed over a wide territory and before they became intelligent enough to cooperate the chance of emancipation was held before them several small insurrections are alluded to in south carolina early in the eighteenth century and one by cato at stono in seventeen forty caused widespread alarm the negro plot in new york in seventeen twelve put the city into hysterics there was no further plotting on any scale until the haitian revolt when gabriel in virginia made an abortive attempt in eighteen twenty two a free negro denmark b c in south carolina failed in a well-laid plot and ten years after that in eighteen thirty one nat turner led his insurrection in virginia and killed fifty-one persons the result of this insurrection was to crystallize tendencies toward harshness which the economic revolution was making advisable a wave of legislation passed over the south prohibiting the slaves from learning to read and write forbidding negroes to preach and interfering with negro religious meetings virginia declared in eighteen thirty one that neither slaves nor free negroes might preach nor could they attend religious first service at night without permission in north carolina slaves and free negroes were forbidden to preach exhort or teach in any prayer meeting or other association for worship where slaves of different families are collected together on penalty of not more than thirty-nine lashes maryland and georgia and other states had similar laws 
the real effective revolt of the negro against slavery was not however by fighting but by running away usually to the north which had been recently freed from slavery from the beginning of the nineteenth century slaves began to escape in considerable numbers four geographical paths were chiefly followed one leading southward was the line of swamps along the coast from norfolk virginia to the northern border of florida this gave rise to the negro element among the indians in florida and led to the two seminole wars of eighteen seventeen and eighteen thirty five these wars were really slave raids to make the indians give up the negro and half-breed slaves domiciled among them the wars cost the united states ten million dollars and two thousand lives the great appalachian range with its abutting mountains was the safest path northward through tennessee and kentucky in the heart of the cumberland mountains using the limestone caverns was the third route and the valley of the mississippi was the western tunnel these runaways and the freedmen of the north soon began to form a group of people who sought to consider the problem of slavery and the destiny of the negro in america they passed through many psychological changes of attitude in the years from seventeen hundred to eighteen fifty at first in the early part of the eighteenth century there was but one thought revolt and revenge the development of the latter half of the century brought an attitude of hope and adjustment and emphasized the differences between the slave and the free negro the first part of the nineteenth century brought two movements among the free negroes an effort at self-development and protection through organization among slaves and recent fugitives of distinct reversion to the older idea of revolt as the new industrial slavery following the rise of the cotton kingdom began to press harder a period of storm and stress ensued in the black world and in eighteen twenty nine came the first full-voiced almost hysterical protest of a negro against slavery and the color line in david walker's appeal which aroused southern legislatures to action the decade eighteen thirty to forty was a severe period of trial not only were the chains of slavery tighter in the south but in the north the free negro was beginning to feel the ostracism and competition of white workingmen native and foreign in philadelphia between eighteen twenty nine and eighteen forty nine six mobs of hoodlums and foreigners murdered and maltreated negroes in the middle west harsh black laws which had been enacted in earlier days were hauled from their hiding places and put into effect no negro was allowed to settle in ohio unless he gave bond within twenty days to the amount of five thousand dollars to guarantee his good behavior and support harboring or concealing fugitives was heavily fined and no negro could give evidence in any case where a white man was party these laws began to be enforced in eighteen twenty nine and for three days riots went on in cincinnati and negroes were shot and killed aroused the negroes sent a deputation to canada where they were offered asylum fully two thousand migrated from ohio later large numbers from other parts of the united states joined them in eighteen thirty to thirty one the first negro conventions were called in philadelphia to consider the desperate condition of the negro population and in eighteen thirty three the convention met again and local societies were formed the first negro paper was issued in new york in eighteen twenty seven while later emancipation in british west indies brought some cheer in the darkness a system of separate negro schools was established and the little band of abolitionists led by garrison and others appeared in spite of all the untoward circumstances therefore the internal development of the free negro in the north went on the negro population increased twenty three per cent between eighteen thirty and eighteen forty philadelphia had in eighteen thirty eight one hundred small beneficial societies while ohio negroes had ten thousand acres of land the slave mutiny on the creole the establishment of the negro odd fellows and the growth of the negro churches all indicated advancement between eighteen thirty and eighteen fifty the concerted cooperation to assist fugitives came to be known as the underground railroad it was an organization not simply of white philanthropists but the cooperation of negroes in the most difficult part of the work made it possible hundreds of negroes visited the slave states to entice the slaves away and the list of underground railroad operators given by seibert contains one hundred and twenty eight names of negroes in canada and in northern united states there was a secret society known as the league of freedom which especially worked to help slaves run away harriet tubman was one of the most energetic of these slave conductors and brought away several thousand slaves william lambert a colored man was reputed between eighteen twenty nine and eighteen sixty two to have aided in the escape of thirty thousand 
the decade eighteen forty to fifty was a period of hope and uplift for the negro group with clear evidences of distinct self-assertion and advance a few well-trained lawyers and physicians appeared and colored men took their place among the abolition orators the catering business in philadelphia and other cities fell largely into their hands and some small merchants arose here and there above all frederick douglass made his first speech in eighteen forty one and thereafter became one of the most prominent figures in the abolition crusade a new series of national conventions began to assemble late in the forties and the delegates were drawn from the artisans and higher servants showing a great increase of efficiency in the rank and file of the freed negroes by eighteen fifty the negroes had increased to three and a half million those in canada were being organized in settlements and were accumulating property the escape of fugitive slaves was systematized and some of the most representative conventions met one particularly in eighteen fifty four grappled frankly with the problem of emigration it looked as though it was going to be impossible for negroes to remain in the united states and be free as early as seventeen eighty eight a negro union of newport rhode island had proposed a general exodus to africa john and paul cuff after petitioning for the right to vote in seventeen eighty started in eighteen fifteen for africa organizing an expedition at their own expense which cost four thousand dollars lot carey organized the african mission society in eighteen thirteen and the first negro college graduate went to liberia in eighteen twenty nine and became superintendent of public schools the colonization of society encouraged this migration and the negroes themselves had organized the canadian exodus the rochester negro convention in eighteen fifty three pronounced against migration but nevertheless emissaries were sent in various directions to see what inducements could be offered one went to the niger valley one to central america and one to haiti the haitian trip was successful and about two thousand black emigrants eventually settled in haiti delaney who went to africa concluded a treaty with eight kings offering inducements to negroes but nothing came of it in eighteen fifty three negroes like purvis and barbados helped in the formation of the american anti-slavery society and for a while colored men cooperated with john brown and probably would have given him considerable help if they had thoroughly known his plans as it was six or seven of his twenty-two followers were negroes End of chapter eleven part one chapter eleven part two of the negro by w e b du bois this librivox recording is in the public domain the negro in the united states meantime the slave power was impelled by the high price of slaves and the exhaustion of cotton land to make increased demands slavery was forced north of mason and dixon's line in eighteen twenty a new slave empire was thousands of slaves was annexed in eighteen fifty and a fugitive slave law was passed which endangered the liberty of every free negro finally a determined attempt was made to force slavery into the northwest in competition with free white labor and less effective but powerful movements arose to annex more slave territory to the south and to reopen the african slave trade it looked like a triumphal march for the slave barons but each step cost more than the last missouri gave rise to the early abolitionist movement mexico and the fugitive slave law aroused deep opposition in the north and kansas developed an attack upon the free labor system not simply of the north but of the civilized world the result was war but the war was not against slavery it was fought to protect free white laborers against the competition of slaves and it was thought possible to do this by segregating slavery the first thing that vexed the northern armies on southern soil during the war was the question of the disposition of the fugitive slaves who immediately began to arrive in increasing numbers butler confiscated them fremont freed them and halleck caught and returned them but their numbers swelled to such large proportions that the mere economic problem of their presence overshadowed everything else especially after the emancipation proclamation lincoln was glad to have them come after once he realized their strength to the confederacy the emancipation proclamation was forced not simply by the necessity of paralyzing industry in the south but also by the necessity of employing negro soldiers 
during the first two years of the war no one wanted negro soldiers it was declared to be a white man's war general hunter tried to raise a regiment in south carolina but the war department disavowed the act in louisiana the negroes were anxious to enlist but were held off in the meantime the war did not go as well as the north had hoped and on the twenty sixth of january eighteen sixty three the secretary of war authorized the governor of massachusetts to raise two regiments of negro troops frederick douglas and others began to work with enthusiasm and in the end one hundred and eighty seven thousand negroes enlisted in the northern armies of whom seventy thousand were killed and wounded the conduct of these troops was exemplary they were indispensable in camp duties and brave on the field where they fought in two hundred and thirteen battles general banks wrote their conduct was heroic no troops could be more determined or more daring the assault on fort wagner led by a thousand black soldiers under the white colonel shaw is one of the greatest deeds of desperate bravery on record on the other hand the treatment of negro soldiers when captured by the confederates was barbarous at fort pillow after the surrender of the federal troops the colored regiment was indiscriminately butchered and some of them were buried alive abraham lincoln said the slightest knowledge of arithmetic will prove to any man that the rebel armies cannot be destroyed with democratic strategy it would sacrifice all the white men of the north to do it there are now in the service of the united states near two hundred thousand able-bodied colored men most of them under arms defending and acquiring union territory abandon all the posts now garrisoned by black men take two hundred thousand men from our side and put them in the battlefield or cornfield against us and we would be compelled to abandon the war in three weeks emancipation thus came as a war measure to break the power of the confederacy preserve the union and gain the sympathy of the civilized world however two hundred and forty-four years of slavery could not be stopped by edict there were legal difficulties the whole slow problem of economic readjustment and the subtle and far-reaching questions of future race relations the peculiar circumstances of emancipation forced the legal and political difficulties to the front and these were so striking that they have since obscured the others in the eyes of students quite unexpectedly and without forethought the nation had emancipated four million slaves once the deed was done the majority of the nation was glad and recognized that this was after all the only result of a fearful four years war which in any degree justified it but how was the result to be secured for all time there were three possibilities one to declare the slave free and leave him at the mercy of his former masters two to establish a careful government guardianship designed to guide the slave from legal to real economic freedom three to give the negro the political power to guard himself as well as he could during this development it is very easy to forget that the united states government tried each one of these in succession and was literally forced to adopt the third because the first had utterly failed and the second was thought too paternal and especially too costly to leave the negroes helpless after a paper edict of emancipation was manifestly impossible it would have meant that the war had been fought in vain coral shirts who traversed the south just after the war said a veritable reign of terror prevailed in many parts of the south the negro found scant justice in the local courts against the white man he could look for protection only to the military forces of the united states still garrisoning the states lately in rebellion and to the freedmen's bureau this freedmen's bureau was proposed by charles sumner if it had been presented to-day instead of fifty years ago it would have been regarded as a proposal far less revolutionary than the state insurance of england and germany half century ago however and in a country which gave the laissez-faire economics their extremist trial the freedmen's bureau struck the whole nation as unthinkable save as a very temporary expedient and to relieve the more pointed forms of distress following war yet the proposals of the bureau were both simple and sensible one to oversee the making and enforcement of wage contracts for freedmen two to appear in the courts as the freedmen's best friend three to furnish the freedmen with a minimal of land and of capital four to establish schools five to furnish such institutions of relief as hospitals outdoor relief stations etc 
how a sensible people could expect really to conduct a slave into freedom with less than this it is hard to see even with such tutelage extending over a period of two or three decades the ultimate end had to be enfranchisement and political and social freedom for those freedmen who attained a certain set standard otherwise the whole training had neither object nor guarantee precisely on this account the former masters opposed the freedmen's bureau with all their influence they did not want the negro trained or really freed and they criticized mercilessly the many mistakes of the new bureau the north at first thought to pay for the main cost of the freedmen's bureau by confiscating the property of former slave owners but finding this not in accordance with law they realized that they were embarking on an enterprise which bade fair to add many millions to the already staggering cost of the war when therefore they saw that the abolition of slavery could not be left to the white south and could not be done by the north without time and money they determined to put the responsibility on the negro himself this was without a doubt a tremendous experiment but with all its manifest mistakes it succeeded to an astonishing degree it made the immediate re-establishment of the old slavery impossible and it was probably the only quick method of doing this it gave the freedmen's sons a chance to begin their education it diverted the energy of the white south slavery to the recovery of political power and in this interval small as it was the negro took his first steps toward economic freedom the difficulties that stared reconstruction politicians in the face were these one they must act quickly two emancipation had increased the political power of the south by one-sixth could this increased political power be put in the hands of those who in defence of slavery had disrupted the union three how was the abolition of slavery to be made effective four what was to be the political position of the freedmen the freedmen's bureau in its short life accomplished a great task carl schurz in eighteen sixty five felt warranted in saying that not half of the labor that has been done in the south this year or will be done there next year would have been or would be done but for the exertions of the freedmen's bureau no other agency except one placed there by the national government could have wielded that moral power whose interposition was so necessary to prevent southern society from falling at once into the chaos of a general collision between its different elements notwithstanding this the bureau was temporary was regarded as a makeshift and soon abandoned meantime partial negro suffrage seemed not only just but almost inevitable lincoln in eighteen sixty four cautiously suggested to louisiana's private consideration whether some of the colored people may not be let in as for instance the very intelligent and especially those who fought gallantly in our ranks they would probably help in some trying time to come to keep the jewel of liberty in the family of freedom indeed the family of freedom in louisiana being somewhat small just then who else was to be entrusted with the jewel later and for different reasons johnson in eighteen sixty five wrote to mississippi if you could extend the elective franchise to all persons of color who can read the constitution of the united states in english and write their name and to all persons of color who own real estate valued at not less than two hundred and fifty dollars and pay taxes thereon you would completely disarm the adversary and set an example to other states will follow this you can do with perfect safety and you thus place the southern states in reference to free persons of color upon the same basis with the free states i hope and trust your convention will do this the negroes themselves began to ask for the suffrage the georgia convention in augusta eighteen sixty six advocated a proposition to give those who could write and read well and possess a certain property qualification the right of suffrage the reply of the south to these suggestions was decisive in tennessee alone was any action attempted that even suggested possible negro suffrage in the future and that failed in all other states the black codes adopted were certainly not reassuring to the friends of freedom to be sure it was not a time to look for calm cool thoughtful action on the part of the white south their economic condition was pitiable their fear of negro freedom genuine yet it was reasonable to expect from them something less than repression and utter reaction toward slavery to some extent this expectation was fulfilled the abolition of slavery was recognized on the statute book and the civil rights of owning property and appearing as a witness in cases in which he was a party were generally granted the negro 
yet with these in many cases went harsh and unbearable regulations which largely neutralized the concessions and certainly gave ground for an assumption that once free the south would virtually re-enslave the negro the colored people themselves naturally feared this protesting as in mississippi against the reactionary policy prevailing and expressing the fear that the legislature will pass such prescriptive laws as will drive the freedmen from the state or practically re-enslave them the codes spoke for themselves as burgess says almost every act word or gesture of the negro not consonant with good taste and good manners as well as good morals was made a crime or misdemeanor for which he could first be fined by the magistrates and then be consigned to a condition of almost slavery for an indefinite time if he could not pay the bill all things considered it seems probable that if the south had been permitted to have its way in eighteen sixty five the harshness of negro slavery would have been mitigated so as to make slave trading difficult so as to make it possible for a negro to hold property and appear in some cases in court but that in most other respects the blacks would have remained in slavery what could prevent this a freedman's bureau established for ten twenty or forty years with a careful distribution of land and capital and a system of education for the children might have prevented such an extension of slavery but the country would not listen to such a comprehensive plan a restricted grant of the suffrage voluntarily made by the states would have been a reassuring proof of a desire to treat the freedmen fairly and would have balanced in part at least the increased political power of the south there was no such disposition evident in louisiana for instance under the proposed reconstruction not one negro was allowed to vote though at the very time the wealthy intelligent free colored people of the state paid taxes on property assessed at fifteen million dollars and many of them were well known for their patriotic zeal and love for the union thus the arguments for universal negro suffrage from the start were strong and are still strong and no one would question their strength were it not for the assumption that the experiment failed frederick douglass said to president johnson your noble and humane predecessor placed in our hands the sword to assist in saving the nation and we do hope that you his able successor will favorably regard the placing in our hands the ballot with which to save ourselves carl schurz wrote it is idle to say that it will be time to speak of negro suffrage when the whole colored race will be educated for the ballot may be necessary to him to secure his education the granting of full negro suffrage meant one of the two alternatives to the south one the uplift of the negro for sheer self-preservation this is what shirts and the saner north expected as one southern school superintendent said the elevation of this class is a matter of prime importance since a ballot in the hands of a black citizen is quite as potent as in the hands of a white one or two negro suffrage meant a determined concentration of southern effort by actual force to deprive the negro of the ballot or nullify its use this last is what really happened but even in this case so much energy was taken in keeping the negro from voting that the plan for keeping him in virtual slavery and denying him education partially failed it took ten years to nullify negro suffrage in part and twenty years to escape the fear of federal intervention in these twenty years a vast number of negroes had arisen so far as to escape slavery forever dead peonage could be fastened on part of the rural south and was but even here the new negro landholder appeared thus despite everything the fifteenth amendment and that alone struck the death knell of slavery the steps toward the fifteenth amendment were taken slowly first negroes were allowed to take part in reconstructing the state governments this was inevitable if loyal governments were to be obtained next the restored state governments were directed to enfranchise all citizens black or white or have their representation in congress cut down proportionately finally the united states said the last word of simple justice the states may regulate the suffrage but no state may deprive a person of the right to vote simply because he is a negro or has been a slave for such reasons the negro was enfranchised what was the result low language has been spared to describe these results as the worst imaginable this is not true there were bad results and bad results arising from negro suffrage but those results were not so bad as usually painted nor was negro suffrage the prime cause of many of them let us not forget that the white south believed it to be of vital interest to its 
welfare that the experiment of negro suffrage should fail ignominiously and that almost to a man the whites were willing to ensure this failure either by active force or passive acquiescence that besides this there were as it might be expected men black and white northern and southern only too eager to take advantage of such a situation for feathering their own nests much evil must result in such case but to charge the evil to negro suffrage is unfair it may be charged to anger poverty venality and ignorance but the anger and poverty were the almost inevitable aftermath of war the venality was much greater among whites than negroes both north and south and while ignorance was the curse of negroes the fault was not theirs and they took the initiative to correct it the chief charges against the negro governments are extravagance theft and incompetency of officials there is no serious charge that these governments threaten civilization or the foundations of social order the charge is that they threaten property and that they were inefficient these charges are in part undoubtedly true but they are often exaggerated the south had been terribly impoverished and saddled with new social burdens in other words states with smaller resources were asked not only to do a work of restoration but a larger social work the property holders were aghast they not only demurred but predicting ruin and revolution they appealed to secret societies to intimidation force and murder they refused to believe that these novices in government and their friends were aught but scamps and fools under the circumstances occurring directly after the war the wisest statesmen would have been compelled to resort to increased taxation and would have in turn been execrated as extravagant dishonest and incompetent it is easy therefore to see what flaming and incredible stories of reconstruction governments could gain wide currency and belief in fact the extravagance although great was not universal and much of it was due to the extravagant spirit pervading the whole country in a day of inflated currency and speculation that the negroes led by the astute thieves became at first tools and received some small share of the spoils is true but two considerations must be added much of the legislation which resulted in fraud was represented to the negroes as good legislation and thus their votes were secured by deliberate misrepresentation take for instance the land frauds of south carolina a wise negro leader of that state advocating the state purchase of farm land said one of the greatest of slavery bulwarks was the infernal plantation system one man owning his thousand another his twenty another fifty thousand acres of land this is the only way by which we will break up that system and i maintain that our freedom will be of no effect if we allow it to continue what is the main cause of the prosperity of the north it is because every man has his own farm and is free and independent let the lands of the south be similarly divided from such arguments the negroes were induced to aid a scheme to buy land and distribute it yet a large part of eight hundred thousand dollars appropriated was wasted and went to the white landholders pockets the most inexcusable cheating of the negroes took place through the freedmen's bank this bank was incorporated by congress in eighteen sixty five and had in its list of incorporators some of the greatest names in america including peter cooper william cullen bryant and john jay yet the bank was allowed to fail in eighteen seventy four owing the freedmen their first savings of over three millions of dollars they have never been reimbursed many negroes were undoubtedly venal but more were ignorant and deceived the question is did they show any signs of a disposition to learn to do better things the theory of democratic government is not that the will of the people is always right but rather that normal human beings of average intelligence will if given a chance learn the right and best course by bitter experience this is precisely what the negro voters showed indubitable signs of doing first they strove for schools to abolish ignorance and second a large and growing number of them revolted against the extravagance and stealing that marred the beginning of reconstruction and joined the, with the best elements to institute reform the greatest stigma on the white south is not that it opposed negro suffrage and resented theft and incompetence but that when it saw the reform movements growing and even in some cases triumphing and a larger and larger number of black voters learning to vote for honesty and ability it still preferred to a reign of terror to a campaign of education and disfranchised negroes instead of punishing rascals no one has expressed this more convincingly than a negro who was himself a member of the reconstruction legislature of south carolina and who spoke at the convention which disfranchised him against one of the onslaughts of tillman 
we were eight years in power we had built schoolhouses established charitable institutions built and maintained the penitentiary system provided for the education of the deaf and dumb rebuilt the jails and courthouses rebuilt the bridges and re-established the ferries in short we had reconstructed the state and placed it upon the road to prosperity and at the same time by our acts of financial reform transmitted to the hampton government an indebtedness not greater by more than two and a half million dollars than was the bonded debt of the state in eighteen sixty eight before the republican negroes and their white allies came into power so too in louisiana in eighteen seventy two and in mississippi later the better element of the republicans triumphed at the polls and joining with the democrats instituted reforms repudiated the worst extravagance and started toward better things unfortunately there was one thing that the white south feared more than negro dishonesty ignorance and incompetency and that was negro honesty knowledge and efficiency in the midst of all these difficulties the negro governments in the south accomplished much of positive good we may recognize three things which negro rule gave to the south one democratic government two free public schools three new social legislation in general the words of judge albion w tour g a white carpet-bagger are true when he says of the negro governments they obeyed the constitution of the united states and annulled the bonds of states counties and cities which had been issued to carry on the war of rebellion and maintain armies in the field against the union they instituted a public school system in a realm where public schools had been unknown they opened the ballot-box and the jury-box to thousands of white men who had been debarred from them by a lack of earthly possessions they introduced home rule into the south they abolished the whipping post the branding iron the stocks and other barbarous forms of punishment which had up to that time prevailed they reduced capital felonies from about twenty to two or three in an age of extravagance they were extravagant in the sums appropriated for public works in all of that time no man's rights of persons were invaded under the forms of law every democrat's life home fireside and business were safe no man obstructed any white man's way to the ballot-box interfered with his freedom of speech or boycotted him on account of his political faith a thorough study of the legislation accompanying these constitutions and its changes since shows the comparatively small amount of change in law and government which the overthrow of negro rule brought about there were sharp and often hurtful economies introduced marking the return of property to power there was a sweeping change of officials but the main body of reconstruction legislation stood the reconstruction democracy brought forth new leaders and definitely overthrew the old southern aristocracy among these new men were negroes of worth and ability john or lynch when speaker of the mississippi house of representatives was given a public testimonial by republicans and democrats and the leading white paper said his bearing in office has been so proper and his rulings in such marked contrast to the partisan conduct of the ignoble whites of his party who have aspired to be leaders of the blacks that the conservatives cheerfully joined in the testimonial of the colored treasurer of south carolina the white governor chamberlain said i have never heard one word or seen one act of mr cardoza's which did not confirm my confidence in his personal integrity and his political honor and zeal for the honest administration of the state government on every occasion and under all circumstances he has been against fraud and robbery and in favor of good measures and good men jonathan c gibbs a colored man and the first state superintendent of instruction in florida was a graduate of dartmouth he established the system and brought it to success dying in harness in eighteen seventy four such men and there were others ought not to be forgotten or confounded with other types of colored and white reconstruction leaders there is no doubt that the thirst of the black man for knowledge a thirst which has been too persistent and durable to be mere curiosity or whim gave birth to the public school system of the south it was the question upon which black voters and legislators insisted more than anything else and while it is possible to find some vestiges of free schools in some of the southern states before the war yet a universal well-established system dates from the day that the black man got political power finally in legislation covering property the wider functions of the state the punishment of crime and the like it is sufficient to say that the laws on these points established by reconstruction legislatures were not only different from and even revolutionary to the laws in the older south but they were so wise and so well suited to the needs of the new south that in spite of a retrogressive movement following the overthrow of the negro governments the mass of this legislation with elaborations and development still stands as the statute books of the south 
the triumph of reaction in the south inaugurated a new era in which we may distinguish three phases the renewed attempt to reduce the negroes to serfdom the rise of the negro metayer and the economic disfranchisement of the southern working class the attempt to replace individual slavery had been frustrated by the freedmen's bureau and the fifteenth amendment this disfranchisement of eighteen seventy six was followed by the widespread rise of crime peonage stringent laws on vagrancy guardianship and labor contracts were reenacted and large discretion given judge and jury in cases of petty crime as a result negroes were systematically arrested on the slightest pretext and the labor of convicts leased to private parties this convict lease system was almost universal in the south until about eighteen ninety when its outrageous abuses and cruelties aroused the whole country it still survives over wide areas and it is not only responsible for the impression that the negro is a natural criminal but also for the inability of the southern courts to perform their no more functions after so long a prostitution to ends for removed from justice in more normal economic lines the employers began with the labor contract system before the war they owned labor land and subsistence after the war they still held the land and subsistence the laborer was hired and the subsistence advanced to him while the crop was growing the fall of the freedmen's bureau hindered the transmutation of this system into a modern wage system and allowed the laborers to be cheated by high interest charges on the subsistence advanced and actual cheating often in book accounts the black laborers became deeply dissatisfied under this system and began to migrate from the country to the cities where there was an increasing demand for labor the employing farmers complained bitterly of the scarcity of labor and of negro laziness and secured the enactment of harsher vagrancy and labor contract laws and statutes against the enticement of laborers so severe were these laws that it was often impossible for a laborer to stop work without committing a felony nevertheless competition compelled the landholders to offer more inducements to the farm hand the result was the rise of the black share tenant the laborer securing better wages saved a little capital and began to hire land in parcels of forty to eighty acres furnishing his own tools and seed and practically raising his own subsistence in this way the whole face of the labor contract in the south was in the decade eighteen eighty to ninety in process of change from a nominal wage contract to a system of tenantry the great plantations were apparently broken up into forty and eighty acre farms with black farmers to many it seemed that emancipation was accomplished and the black folk were especially filled with joy and hope it soon was evident however that the change was only partial the landlord still held the land in large parcels he rented this in small farms to tenants but retained direct control in theory the laborer was furnishing capital but in the majority of cases he was borrowing at least a part of this capital from some merchant the retail merchant in this way entered on the scene as middleman between landlord and laborer he guaranteed the landowner his rent and relieved him of details by taking over the furnishings of supplies to the laborer he tempted the laborer by a larger stock of more attractive goods made a direct contract with him and took a mortgage on the growing crop thus he soon became the middleman to whom the profit of the transaction largely flowed and he began to get rich if the new system benefited the merchant and the landlord it also brought some benefits to the black laborers numbers of these were still held in peonage and the mass were laborers working for scant board and clothes but above these began to rise a large number of independent tenants and farm owners in eighteen ninety therefore the south was faced by this question are we willing to allow the negro to advance as a free worker peasant farmer Mateo, and small capitalists with only such handicaps as naturally impede the poor and ignorant or is it necessary to erect further artificial barriers to restrain the advance of the negroes the answer was clear and unmistakable the advance of the freedom had been too rapid and the south feared it every effort must be made to keep the negro in his place as a servile caste to this end the south strove to make the disfranchisement of the negroes effective and final up to this time disfranchisement was illegal and based on intimidation the new laws passed between eighteen ninety and nineteen ten sought on their face to base the right to vote on property and education in such a way as to exclude poor and illiterate negroes and admit all whites in fact they could be administered so as to exclude nearly all negroes to this was added a series of laws designed publicly to humiliate and stigmatize negro blood as for example separate railway cars separate seats in street cars and the like these things were added to the separation in schools and churches and the denial of redress to 
seduced colored women which had long been the custom in the south all these new enactments meant not simply separation but subordination caste humiliation and flagrant injustice to all this was added a series of labor laws making the exploitation of negro labor more secure all this legislation had to be accomplished in the face of the labor movement throughout the world and particularly in the south where it was beginning to enter among the white workers this was accomplished easily however by an appeal to race prejudice no method of inflaming the darkest passions of men was unused the lynching mob was given its glut of blood and egged on by purposely exaggerated and often wholly invented tales of crime on the part of perhaps the most peaceful and sweet-tempered race the world has ever known under the flame of this outward noise went the more subtle and dangerous work the election laws passed in the states where three-fourths of the negroes live were so ingeniously framed that a black university graduate could be prevented from voting and the most ignorant white hoodlum could be admitted to the polls labor laws were so arranged that imprisonment for debt was possible and leaving an employer could be made a penitentiary offence negro schools were cut off with small appropriations or wholly neglected and a determined effort was made with wide success to see that no negro had any voice either in the making or the administration of local state or national law the acquiescence of the white labor vote of the south was further insured by throwing white and black laborers so far as possible into rival competing groups and making each feel that the one was the cause of the other's troubles the neutrality of the white people of the north was secured through their fear for the safety of large investments in the south and through the fatalistic attitude common both in america and europe toward the possibility of real advance on the part of the darker nations the reaction of the negro americans upon this wholesale and open attempt to reduce them to serfdom has been interesting naturally they began to organize and protest and in some cases to appeal to the courts then to their astonishment there arose a colored leader mr booker t washington who advised them to yield to disfranchisement and cast and wait for greater economic strength and general efficiency before demanding full rights as american citizens the white south naturally agreed with mr washington and the white north thought that they saw here a chance for peace in the racial conflict and safety for their southern investments for a time the colored people hesitated they respected mr washington for shrewdness and recognized the wisdom of his homely insistence on thrift and hard work but gradually they came to see more and more clearly that stripped of political power and emasculated by caste they could never gain sufficient economic strength to take their place as modern men they also realized that any law in their protests would be taken advantage of by negro haters to push their caste program they began therefore with renewed persistence to fight for their fundamental rights as american citizens the struggle tended at first to bitter personal dissension within the group but wiser counsels and the advice of white friends eventually prevailed and raised it to the broad level of a fight for the fundamental principles of democracy the launching of the niagara movement by twenty-nine daring colored men in nineteen o five followed by the formation of the national association for the advancement of colored people in nineteen ten marked an epoch in the advance of the negro this latter organization with its monthly organ the crisis is now waging a nationwide fight for justice to negroes other organizations and a number of strong negro weekly papers are aiding in this fight what has been the result of this struggle of half a century in eighteen sixty three there were about five million persons of negro descent in the united states of these four million and more were just being released from slavery these slaves could be bought and sold could move from place to place only with permission were forbidden to learn to read or write and legally could never hold property or marry ninety per cent were totally illiterate and only one adult in six was a nominal christian fifty years later in nineteen thirteen there were in the united states ten and a quarter million persons of negro descent an increase of one hundred and five per cent legal slavery had been abolished leaving however vestiges in debt slavery peonage and the convict lease system the mass of the freedmen and their sons have one earned a living as free and partially free laborers two shared the responsibility of government three developed the internal organization of their race four aspired to spiritual self-expression the negro was freed as a penniless landless naked ignorant laborer there were a few free negroes who owned property in the south and the larger number who owned property in the north 
but ninety nine per cent of the race in the south were penniless field hands and servants today there are two and a half million laborers the majority of whom are efficient wage earners above these are more than a million servants and tenant farmers skilled and semi-skilled workers make another million and at the top of the economic column are six hundred thousand owners and managers of farms and businesses cash tenants officials and professional men this makes a total of five million one hundred and ninety two thousand five hundred and thirty five colored breadwinners in nineteen ten more specifically these breadwinners include two hundred and eighteen thousand nine hundred and seventy two farm owners and three hundred and nineteen thousand three hundred and forty six cash farm tenants and managers there were in all sixty two thousand seven hundred and fifty five miners two hundred and eighty eight thousand one hundred and forty one in the building and hand trades twenty eight thousand five hundred and fifteen workers in clay glass and stone forty one thousand seven hundred and thirty nine iron and steel workers one hundred and thirty four thousand one hundred and two employees on railways sixty two thousand eight hundred and twenty two draymen cab drivers and liverymen one hundred and thirty three thousand two hundred and forty five in wholesale and retail trade thirty two thousand one hundred and seventy in the public service and sixty nine thousand four hundred and seventy one in professional service including twenty nine thousand seven hundred and fifty teachers seventeen thousand four hundred and ninety five clergymen and four thousand five hundred and forty six physicians dentists trained nurses etc finally we must not forget two million seven hundred and seventy five thousand negro homes with their housewives and one million six hundred and twenty thousand children in school fifty years ago the overwhelming mass of these people were not only penniless but were themselves assessed as real estate by eighteen seventy five the negroes probably had gotten hold of something between two million and four million acres of land through their bounties as soldiers and the low price of land after the war by eighteen eighty this was increased to about six million acres in eighteen ninety to about eight million acres in nineteen hundred to over twelve thousand acres in nineteen ten this land had increased to nearly twenty million acres a realm as large as ireland the one hundred and twenty thousand seven hundred and thirty eight farms owned by negroes in eighteen ninety increased to two hundred and eighteen thousand nine hundred and seventy two in nineteen ten or eighty one per cent the value of these farms increased from one hundred and seventy nine million seven hundred ninety six thousand six hundred and thirty nine dollars in nineteen hundred to four hundred and forty million nine hundred and ninety two thousand four hundred and thirty nine dollars in nineteen ten the negroes owned in nineteen ten about five hundred thousand homes out of a total of two million one hundred and seventy five thousand their total property in nineteen hundred was estimated at three hundred million dollars by the american economic association on the same basis of calculation it would be worth today not less than eight hundred million dollars despite the disfranchisement of three-fourths of his voting population the negro today is a recognized part of the american government he holds seven thousand five hundred offices in the executive service of the nation besides furnishing four regiments in the army and a large number of sailors in the state and municipal service he holds nearly twenty thousand other offices and he furnishes five hundred thousand of the votes which rule the union in these same years the negro has relearned the lost art of organization slavery was the almost absolute denial of initiative and responsibility to-day negroes have nearly forty thousand churches with edifices worth at least seventy-five million dollars and controlling nearly four million members they raise themselves seven million five hundred thousand dollars a year for these churches there are two hundred private schools and colleges managed and almost entirely supported by negroes and these and other public and private negro schools have received in forty years forty five million dollars of negro money in taxes and donations five millions a year are raised by negro secret and beneficial societies which hold at least six million dollars in real estate negroes support wholly or in part over one hundred old folks homes and orphanages thirty hospitals and five hundred cemeteries the organized commercial life is extending rapidly and includes over twenty two thousand small retail businesses and forty banks above and beyond this material growth has gone the spiritual uplift of a great human race from contempt and amusement they have passed to the pity perplexity and fear on the part of their neighbors while within their own souls they have arisen from apathy and timid complaint to open protest and more and more manly self-assertion where nine-tenths of them could not read or write in eighteen sixty to-day over two-thirds can they have three hundred papers and periodicals and their voice and expression are compelling attention already in poetry literature music and painting the work of americans of negro descent has gained notable recognition 
instead of being led and defended by others as in the past american negroes are gaining their own leaders their own voices their own ideals self-realization is thus coming slowly but surely to another of the world's great races and they are to-day girding themselves to fight in the van of progress not simply for their own rights as men but for the ideals of the greater world in which they live the emancipation of women universal peace democratic government the socialization of wealth and human brotherhood end of chapter eleven chapter twelve of the negro by w e b du bois this librivox recording is in the public domain the negro problems it is impossible to separate the population of the world accurately by race since that is no scientific criterion by which to divide races if we divide the world however roughly into african negroes and negroids european whites and asiatic and american brown and yellow peoples we have approximately one hundred and fifty million negroes five hundred million whites and nine hundred million yellow and brown peoples of the one hundred and fifty million negroes one hundred and twenty one million live in africa twenty seven million in the new world and two million in asia what is to be the future relation of the negro race to the rest of the world the visitor from altruria might see here no peculiar problem he would expect the negro race to develop along the lines of other human races in africa his economic and political development would restore and eventually outrun the ancient glories of egypt ethiopia and yoruba overseas the west indies would become a new and nobler africa built in the very pathway of the new highway of commerce between east and west the real sea route to india while in the united states a large part of its citizenship showing for perhaps centuries their dark descent but nevertheless equal sharers of and contributors to the civilization of the west would be the descendants of the wretched victims of the seventeenth eighteenth and nineteenth century slave trade this natural assumption of a stranger finds however lodging in the minds of few present-day thinkers on the contrary such an outcome is usually dismissed summarily most persons have accepted that tacit but clear modern philosophy which assigns to the white race alone and the hegemony of the world and assumes that other races and particularly the negro race will either be content to serve the interests of the whites or die out before their all-conquering march this philosophy is the child of the african slave trade and of the expansion of europe during the nineteenth century the negro slave trade was the first step in modern world commerce followed by the modern theory of colonial expansion slaves as an article of commerce were shipped as long as the traffic paid when the americas had enough black laborers for their immediate demand the moral action of the eighteenth century had a chance to make its faint voice heard the moral repugnance was powerfully reinforced by the revolt of the slaves in the west indies and south america and by the fact that north america early began to regard itself as the seat of advanced ideas in politics religion and humanity finally european capital began to find better investments than slave shipping and flew to them these better investments were the fruit of the new industrial revolution of the nineteenth century with its factory system they were also in part the result of the cheapened price of gold and silver brought about by slavery and the slave trade to the new world commodities other than gold and commodities capable of manufacture and exploitation in europe out of materials furnished by america became enhanced in value the bottom fell out of the commercial slave trade and its suppression became possible the middle of the nineteenth century saw the beginning of the rise of the modern working class by means of political power the laborers slowly but surely began to demand a larger share in the profiting industry in the united states their demand bade fair to be halted by the competition of slave labor 
the labor vote therefore first confined slavery to limits in which it could not live and when the slave power sought to exceed these territorial limits it was suddenly and unintentionally abolished as the emancipation of millions of dark workers took place in the west indies north and south america and parts of africa at this time it was natural to assume that the uplift of this working class lay along the same paths with that of european and american whites this was the first suggested solution of the negro problem consequently these negroes received partial enfranchisement the beginning of education and some of the elementary rights of wage earners and property holders while the independence of liberia and haiti was recognized however long before they were strong enough to assert the rights thus granted or to gather intelligence enough for proper group leadership the new colonialism of the later nineteenth and twentieth centuries began to dawn the new colonial theory transferred the reign of commercial privilege and extraordinary profit from the exploitation of the european working class to the exploitation of backward races under the political domination of europe for the purpose of carrying out this idea the european and white american working class was practically invited to share in this new exploitation and particularly were flattered by popular appeals to their inherent superiority to dagos chinks japs and niggers this tendency was strengthened by the fact that the new colonial expansion centered in africa thus in eighteen seventy five something less than one-tenth of africa was under nominal european control but the franco-prussian war and the exploration of the congo led to new and fateful things germany desired economic expansion and being shut out from america by the monroe doctrine turned to africa france humiliated in war dreamed of an african empire from the atlantic to the red sea italy became ambitious for tripoli and abyssinia great britain began to take new interest in her african realm but found herself largely checkmated by the jealousy of all europe portugal sought to make good her ancient claim to the larger part of the whole southern peninsula it was leopold of belgium who started to make the exploration and civilization of africa an international movement this project failed and the congo free state became in time simply a belgian colony while the project was under discussion the international scramble for africa began as a result the berlin conference and the subsequent wars and treaties gave great britain control of two million one hundred and one thousand four hundred and eleven square miles of african territory in addition to egypt and the egyptian sudan with one million six hundred thousand square miles this includes south africa bakua naland and rhodesia east africa uganda and zanzibar nigeria and british west africa the french hold four million one hundred and six thousand nine hundred and fifty square miles including nearly all north africa except tripoli west of the niger valley and libyan desert and touching the atlantic at four points to this is added the island of madagascar the germans have nine hundred and ten thousand one hundred and fifty square miles principally in southeast and southwest africa and the cameron the portuguese retain seven hundred and eighty seven thousand five hundred square miles in southeast and southwest africa the belgians have nine hundred thousand square miles while liberia forty three thousand square miles and abyssinia three hundred and fifty thousand square miles are independent the italians have about six hundred thousand square miles and the spanish less than one hundred thousand square miles this partition of africa brought revision of the ideas of negro uplift why was it necessary the european investors argued to push a continent of black workers along the paths of social uplift by education trades unionism property holding and the electoral franchise when the workers desired no change and the rate of european profit would suffer there quickly arose then the second suggestion for settling the negro problem it called for the virtual enslavement of the natives in certain industries as rubber and ivory collecting in the belgian congo cocoa raising in portuguese angola and diamond mining in south africa this new slavery or forced labor was stoutly defended as a necessary foundation for implanting modern industry in a barbarous land but its likeness to slavery was too clear and it has been modified but not wholly abolished 
the third attempted solution of the negro sought the result of the second by less direct methods negroes in africa the west indies and america were to be forced to work by land monopoly taxation and little or no education in this way a docile industrial class working for low wages and not intelligent enough to unite in labor unions was to be developed the peonage systems in parts of the united states and the labor systems of many of the african colonies of great britain and germany illustrate this phase of solution it is also illustrated in many of the west indian islands where we have a predominant negro population and this population freed from slavery and partially enfranchised land and capital however have for the most part been so managed and monopolized that the black peasantry have been reduced to straits to earn a living in one of the richest parts of the world the problem is now going to be intensified when the world's commerce begins to sweep through the panama canal all these solutions and methods however run directly counter to modern philanthropy and have to be carried on with a certain concealment and half hypocrisy which is not only distasteful in itself but always liable to be discovered and exposed by some liberal or religious movement of the masses of men and suddenly overthrown these solutions are therefore gradually merging into a fourth solution which is to-day very popular this solution says negroes differ from whites in their inherent genius and stage of development their development must not therefore be sought along european lines but along their own native lines consequently the effort is made to-day in british nigeria and in the french congo and sudan in uganda and rhodesia to leave so far as possible the outward structure of native life intact the king or chief reigns the popular assemblies meet and act the native courts adjudicate and native social and family life and religion prevail all this however is subject to the veto and command of a european magistracy supported by a native army with european officers the advantage of this method is that on its face it carries no clue to its real working indeed it can always point to certain undoubted advantages the abolition of the slave trade the suppression of war and feud the encouragement of peaceful industry on the other hand back of practically all these experiments stands the economic motive the determination to use the organization the land and the people not for their own benefit but for the benefit of white europe for this reason education is seldom encouraged modern religious ideas are carefully limited sound political development is sternly frowned upon and industry is degraded and changed to the demands of european markets the most ruthless class of white mercantile exploiters is allowed large liberty if not a free hand and protected by a concerted attempt to deify white men as such in the eyes of the native and in their own imagination white missionary societies are spending perhaps as much as five million dollars a year in africa and accomplishing much good but at the same time white merchants are sending at least twenty million dollars worth of european liquor into africa each year and the debauchery of the almost unrestricted rum traffic goes far to neutralize missionary effort under this last-mentioned solution of the negro problems we may put the attempts at the segregation of negroes and mulattoes in the united states and to some extent in the west indies ostensibly this is separation of the races in society civil rights etc in practice it is the subordination of colored people of all grades under white tutelage and their separation as far as possible from contact with civilization in dwelling place in education and in public life on the other hand the economic significance of the negro to-day is tremendous black africa to-day exports annually nearly two hundred million dollars worth of goods and its economic development has scarcely begun the black west indies export nearly one hundred million dollars worth of goods to this must be added the labor value of negroes in south africa egypt the west indies north central and south america where the result is blended in the common output of many races the economic foundation of the negro problem can easily be seen to be a matter of many hundreds of millions to-day and ready to rise to the billions to-morrow such figures and facts give some slight idea of the economic meaning of the negro to-day as a worker and industrial factor tropical africa and its peoples are being brought more irrevocably every year into the vortex of the economic influences that sway the western world what do negroes themselves think of these their problems and the attitude of the world toward them 
first and most significant they are thinking there is as yet no great single centralizing of thought or unification of opinion but there are centres which are growing larger and larger and touching edges the most significant centres of this new thinking are perhaps naturally outside africa and in america in the united states and in the west indies this is followed by south africa and west africa and then more vaguely by south america with faint beginnings in east central africa nigeria and the sudan the pan-african movement when it comes will not however be merely a narrow racial propaganda already the more far-seeing negroes sense the coming unities a unity of the working classes everywhere a unity of the colored races a new unity of men the proposed economic solution of the negro problem in africa and america has turned the thoughts of negroes toward a realization of the fact that the modern white laborer of europe and america has the key to the serfdom of black folk in his support of militarism and colonial expansion he is beginning to say to these working men that so long as black laborers are slaves white laborers cannot be free already there are signs in south africa and the united states of the beginning of understanding between the two classes in a conscious sense of unity among colored races there is to-day only a growing interest there is slowly arising not only a curiously strong brotherhood of negro blood throughout the world but the common cause of the darker races against the intolerable assumptions and insults of europeans has already found expression most men in this world are colored a belief in humanity means a belief in colored men the future world will in all reasonable probability be what colored men make it in order for this colored world to come into its heritage must the earth again be drenched in the blood of fighting snarling human beasts or will reason and good will prevail that such may be true the character of the negro race is the best and greatest hope for in its normal condition it is at once the strongest and gentlest of the races of men semper novi quid ex africa end of chapter twelve end of the negro by w e b du bois